Um, so here we are, and, and by the way, I'm not standing behind the lectern, I'm standing next to it, because when I stand behind it, I feel you won't be able to see me, given how short I am, so this seems like it's better. So for a bit of background, right, we're here, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and of course, this is a, for those of you who do not know, and also for the many of you who are online, um, this is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is the nation's preeminent source of expert evidence based and objective advice on science, on engineering, on health. Um, the National Academies provides independent objective advice to inform policy um, uh, uh, with objective scientific findings. Um, we want to spark progress and innovation and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. And that indeed is important work. And I think it's um, it's great that we're in this building that sort of represents that too. And this building, of course, um, this building sits in Washington DC and I do wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Does this, can I advance these? Is that working? No, not yet. Zoe, can you advance for me? Um, so National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nikochtank and Piscatewe people, past and present. The Nikochtank, um, as it turns out, uh, that name was westernized to um, Acostan, Acostan, which is really the, the background or the, the um, source for the, the name for the river that is uh, joining the Potomac just here. Um, and so we do want to honor with gratitude the land itself, the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations, and the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and nations and the land. Um, I was reflecting on this land acknowledgement last night, and I thought to myself, you know, here we are, you know, we, we're talking about ocean drilling today. We're talking about drilling. We're talking about extraction. Right, and there are a lot of conversations going on about extraction, um, and you know about um, colonial science. And it did make me reflect on an interview um, that I once read uh, with Earth scientist um, Sherry Devore. Uh, she's now at Arizona State University, and she, um, in this interview, and this is um, while she was at Stanford University, she talks about her science being informed by a narrative of restorative balance. I really like that term. Um, and much of what she says in this interview really resonates with me. And I wanna read one answer that she gave to a question. And I wanna read it almost, um, almost verbatim. I'll add just a few ideas there too, um, to kind of inform us and, and motivate us to think um, really holistically about this land that we're on, the lands, uh, the ocean bottom that we're thinking about drilling. Um, so here it goes. For Earth scientists that are curious about how we confront colonization and research, I welcome you to take a step back and understand that we are not entitled to information or space. If you are participating in field research, most likely you are entering unceded or occupied land that belongs to an indigenous community. Or maybe it's a piece of the ocean that an indigenous community really deeply cares about, cares for, right? As scientists and researchers, it is not our right to be in certain spaces or to collect data. The public domain and commons movement, even well-intentioned, has to be careful to not infringe on the rights of indigenous communities. That said, I want to remind everyone that no matter what role you have or what experiences you come from, you bring something important to the table. You all bring something very important to this discussion, whether or not you're physically seated at a table here or whether or not you are online. And Zoe or Eric, how many people do we have online? Am I seeing the number 107 participants? That's phenomenal. The work we're doing here is important and clearly there are a lot of people who want to understand more. Okay, with that, um, you know, we're gonna have some spirited conversations here today. I know there are a lot of opinions, a lot of emotions, a lot of thoughts, a lot of passion that you all are bringing and that's wonderful. We want all of that. Um, but I do want to review our expectations for how we're going to engage with each other, right? Our expectations of conduct. 
Um, and this is especially relevant because the National Academies really is, is pretty formal about this. Um, so here at the Academies, uh, we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, and inclusive environment where all can participate fully in a harassment-free and discrimination-free atmosphere. And so we do look to each and every one of you to help us maintain this professional cordial environment. Um, and if you are interested in the Academy's policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, bullying, the link is up there. You can just Google it. It is a, a pretty solid policy. So I do encourage you to think about that. Okay, and with that, um, I want to start by introducing our committee and our statement of task. Um, let's see here. And what I would like to do is call out the name of the committee member. And if you are here, please um, stand or raise your hand to make sure everybody realizes what the name, puts the name and the face together, okay? Um, all right, and I want to start alphabetically with, uh, with Lihini Aluwehair, and she she is online, is that correct? Is that what I'm remembering? I think so. Excellent. And she uh, is from the Scripps Institute for, for Oceanography. Mona Bale is here from the um, University of Georgia and Georgia Sea Grant. Thank you, Mona, for being here. Mark Bain, um, Boston College. Online. Excellent. Brad DeYoung um, from the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, also online. Carlos Garcia Quijano, um, and he is uh, from the University of Rhode Island, also online. Uh, Peter Gerges, um, and he is, um, let's see, what's whole oceanographic institution, not participating today, I believe. Leila Hamden, I think I saw, I saw you earlier. There you are. Um, University of Southern Mississippi, Marsha Isaacson, thank you, Marsha, um, with the University of Texas, Austin, uh, Jason Link, he is online, and he is with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service, Allison Miller, there you are, Allison, hi, um, with the Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, Brad Moran, hi, Brad, welcome, uh, Brad, of course, is with um, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Rick Murray. Hi, hi, Rick. Uh, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institution. Stephen Palumbi. Yeah, online. Yeah. Online. Welcome, Steve. Um, and uh, Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. Josie Quintrell. She online? Not here. Okay. Uh, well, she is with the Integrated Ocean Observing System Association. Um, Shimi Ri. Uh, Shimi is um, with the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Kristen St. John, thank you for being here. James Madison University. Uh, Samuel Sturdivant, um, he is um, with Duke University. Uh, Ajit Subramania, there you are, um, with the Lamont Do Doherty Earth Observatory. Maya Tolstoy, um, I think she's online, uh, University of Washington. Shannon Valley, also online, couldn't make it today, excellent. Uh, well, she is um, a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Um, and then uh, Jim Zekos, who, there you are, Jim, uh, with um, um, University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you for being here. Uh, and then last but not least, but very importantly, my co-chair, co Jim Yoder, um, who is right now hailing from the University of Rhode Island. Um, and Jim, if there's any words you want to share quick, all good. We will keep on moving. Thank you, Jim. All right. Um, to our statement of task, um, we really are tasked with, and Zoe, if you can just advance the slide to the next one. Uh, one back. One too many, Zoe. There you go. We are really tasked with thinking very, very broadly about the ocean sciences enterprise. And the, um, as a committee, we've had this conversation multiple times now. I am really challenging us. Every individual on our committee is challenged to think of the ocean sciences broadly, right? We all bring very specific disciplinary understanding and deep knowledge and passion for what we do. 
But I am challenging us all to not just think through that, not just think about that little piece of the pie, but each of us really to think about the broader um, ocean science enterprise. Of course, we will be looking at the broader ocean science enterprise through that disciplinary lens. That's totally okay. But each one of us is charged with thinking of the whole picture, not just advocating for our piece of it. That's a really important step because it's the only way in which we can arrive at a consensus document that really is prioritized rather than arriving at a document that's a laundry list, right? We don't want to arrive at a document that's a laundry list. And so um, that's a big task and, and one that I think meetings like this can really help with because they broaden our scope um, of what we know is important. We do have an interim report that NSF asked us for. And on the next slide here, you'll see um, the, our task, our statement of task associated with the interim report. Um, assess progress on addressing high, high priority science questions that require scientific ocean drilling. Identify new, if any, equally compelling science questions that would also require scientific ocean drilling. And then secondly, of all of the unanswered scientific questions we have, which can be addressed through the use of existing scientific drilling assets and which questions will require new infrastructure or new sampling investments. And these are really the two questions that we are here today to answer. Um, but really we're going to start out our day. Our day is really going to be made up of three parts. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Three parts. One, we are going to spend a little bit of time to talk about the ocean drilling program legacy. And this is a really important part to sort of assess where we've been. Then part two is going to be all about imagining the future of the ocean drilling program and thinking about science priorities, drawing on work that has already been done, and then breaking out into groups to think really more about um, this question in the context of or the, the work that was already done. And then part three will be about imagining the future of the ocean drilling program in terms of its infrastructure needs, right? So there too, we're going to have some breakout group discussions. All right. Um, okay, a final note. Um, oh, uh, logistics. Uh, uh, I probably skipped this and should have not skipped this because this was really important. In case of an emergency exits, and there is a slide I think that sort of shows us one more back, my dear. There we go. We are in the room that's at the top left-hand corner of this particular slide. And um, if you go outside into the hallway, the nearest exit is immediately um, down the hall. So that's something to remember. If you are interested in going to the bathrooms, I found some down the steps and take a left and keep on going through this beautiful building and you'll get yourself to some restrooms. Um, and the next slide here tells you a little bit more about the upstairs breakout rooms too. Okay, and then a final note, and this will take us to the very last slide of the slides that I will be discussing. Final note is that we will be using Slido to take questions and, and comments, and we, we would like to use Slido for both the uh, in-person participants here as well as the online participants. Um, so those of you who have questions who are in the room here with me, please use Slido anyways, because it really kind of equalizes the opportunity for both in-person and online participants to participate in the same way. And so if you want to do this on your phone, you can scan this QR code to get there. Um, if you haven't used Slido before, it's actually pretty user-friendly. Um, and you can do things like add a question, or you can reply or comment to a question or upvote a question. And so that way, if there's a question on the board that many, many people, that resonates with many, many of you, um, this is one way to make sure that we really do get to pick that question and ask our panelists when the time comes. Um, and the other cool thing about Slido is then we have these questions and they, they will be archived, right? We, we know what your questions are or comments are, and we can make sure that the committee has a look at these after the fact too. So um, that is another reason why we would like to use Slido. All right. Um, so with that, I think I want to dive right into the talks. We're just a few minutes over, um, but uh, not because I spoke more. I did practice just like uh, I asked all of our participants and speakers to practice, but we did start a few minutes late here. 
Okay, so we're going to dive right into our first set of talks, um, and we will hear from about the Ocean Drilling Program legacy from Mitch Malone. Uh, he's a uh, hails from Texas A and M, and of course, a study sponsor, um, the Division Director of Ocean Sciences, Jim McManus, will, is here, and so he will speak after Mitch. And with that, here you go. Mitch. Good morning, everybody. I'll be giving you an overview of, of IODP, and, and I was asked specifically to cover platforms, um, uh, the partner contribution, and then the scientific findings of just this phase of the program, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Can you advance one, one hit so I can, and uh, so I broke that up into this outline, uh, talking about the platforms, expedition, and some basic stats. I, I have a couple slides on the Joides resolution, since it is the U.S. platform. Um, and it is retiring uh, from scientific ocean drilling. A couple of quick slides on governance and the budget model that's been operating in um, this phase of the program, which my colleagues over at this table know quite well. <laughs> and then uh, for the scientific findings, I'm, I'm calling this science impact. And I'll explain that later when I, when I get to that phase. Okay, uh, advance one. Uh, so here are the three platforms uh, that have been active in this phase of the program and the previous one, the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. Uh, the Joides Resolution, the U.S. platform, is a riserless drilling vessel that was converted to scientific ocean drilling in, in 1985. Uh, the CHICU uh, became operational for scientific ocean drilling in 2007, and it's different uh, because it's designed, it is a riser vessel, so this is configured very similar to an oil and gas exploration vessel, uh, which allows it to have well control and allows it to drill much more deeply than the Joides Resolution can. And then our, our colleagues from Europe have been doing mission-specific platforms, which are exactly what, like the name says, it is executing science um, that, that the two other platforms cannot do. And they do that by uh, uh, leasing uh, geotechnical or multi-purpose vessels, lift boats, and they've done a couple of, of, of expeditions off standard oceanographic vessels using a seabed rock drill and then uh, giant piston coring. The table below uh, shows you the, the, the number of expeditions, just the stats of what's been accomplished and what's planned in the next year and a half. Um, and you can see a stark difference there, and that's probably because of the, it's, it's, some of this is by the design of the, of the platforms. The, the Joides resolution is, is, is globally ranging and has tackled the most expeditions. Uh, the the, the CHICU and MSP in this phase of the program has probably done less um, than anticipated. And that's primarily been driven by by funding issues. Um, the 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 Chiki is an amazing vessel, but it's very expensive to operate, and and that's that's provided some constraints. And it's it's only operated around Japan because of some of those issues. Uh, mission specific platforms again are, are funding is a, a challenge, but the the model that they have to execute has some challenges. They're competing with the rest of industry for access to platforms, and it's at commercial rates. Um, and so that's why you see some of the differences there. Uh, okay, let's move on to the, the next one. Uh, this, this is just a table that shows, so shows this, um, uh, what's been done in a, in a similar format. Um, although these, these vessels do more than just coring, uh, there, there is downhole logging, um, uh, downhole measurements, as well as, as installation of borehole observatories. Um, um, the coring is, is the main tool that provides the access to the science party short and long term and for and for everybody else long term and you can just see the recovery the difference is the sites or the lo, uh, in the location holes or multiple holes drilling at the same location and then the recovery um, and what's been brought back for long-term uh, uh, science okay next one please uh, and this is just a map showing the the distribution of this phase of the program so this is since 2014 um, at uh, the end of 2013, uh, but most of the expeditions were 2014 and, the, and beyond. Uh, the red circles are the Joides resolution. The green triangles off of Japan are what has what's happened in this phase of the program by the CHICU. Um, and the blue squares are the mission-specific platforms. There's some you can't see very well off of Japan um, that uh, were recently done. That was the giant piston coring uh, expedition. Uh, Chicxulub's impact in the Yucatan. Uh, Atlantis Massif in the central part of the uh, uh, of of the Atlantic and uh, Corinth Gulf. Uh, everything shown in yellow is what's planned by the the three the three operators um, in in the next next year and a half. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the geographic distribution later. Um, uh, next slide. 
a uh, couple couple slides on the Joides resolution and why it's been the workhorse. Um, this this sec this is um, this this is a relatively small drilling vessel. It's it was built in 1978, so it's second or third generation drilling vessel. Uh, relative to modern vessels, it's small. the The good thing about that is it means it costs less to operate. Now it's not it's not inexpensive, but it it, it does allow it to be globally ranging. Uh, it it can pick up and, and move off site very quickly. And it is a coring machine. I mean, that's what it's ended up being. It and it it does continuous wireline coring, bringing back long cores, nine and a half meters, with the custom designed coring tools that were developed within the program and refined within the program. Um, the rapid pipe tripping, meaning getting to and from the seafloor, and then the the wireline winch on there that is extremely fast uh, means you are bringing more science on board for for the time you're at sea. Um, and in, in particular, this is on the order of talking some folks in, in the industry, this is on the order of three to four times faster coring rate than like a standard geotechnical vessel. The, the water depth range is, is broad from 75 meters to about six kilometers. That six kilometers uh, water depth is the limit primarily because of the drill string we choose to use to give it the maximum flexibility. But you, stu you do start reading, uh, meeting stress um, uh, limitations on that drill pipe once you get about six and a half kilometers hanging from the, 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 the derrick. Um, although it is not a deep drilling vessel like the Chiku, it does have deep penetration capability. Your big challenge is keeping the hole open while you try to do that. But uh, here's two examples, one in, in mostly hard rock and one in sediments where you know, the, the JR has been able to get two kilometers below the seafloor. Um, not only is this vessel um, designed for, for what we want out of scientific ocean drilling, uh, because of its longevity, the combination of the crew who, once they rotate it on, tend to stay, and our technical staff, um, you get a tremendous amount of experience providing the necessary support for science parties to achieve maximum effectiveness. And I, I, I you know, I, that's one of those things I don't think you can overstate, and is going to be a challenge in the in the future as that 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 mem that expertise is 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 likely lost and has to be regained. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows two slides quickly to show that the J, the capabilities of the JR have been used by the science community. The, the plot on the on the left is hole count on the y-axis and water depth in meters below sea level, binned in 25 meet, 250 meter intervals. And you can see the entire depth range capability of the JR is used, and over 40% of the holes are in that deep water range of, of greater than three kilometers. Um, and penetration, that's uh, meters below sea level, bend at 50 meters. Uh, for all the IODPers here and online, all the mudline cores, the missed mudline cores, the aborted cores have been removed. So we don't bias that. Um, that. So this is more like what you would see for people actually do, taking course for science rather than a, a, an operational challenge. And you can see that it's, uh, the, the distribution is heavy toward the shallower side because as you go deeper with a riserless vessel, uh, you increase risk. It requires time and, and sometimes additional cost to put the infrastructure in the seafloor to be able to, to accomplish that. But again, the entire range of the capability of the JR has been used. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of slides on governance, just to talk about how things have operated, to put things in context for everybody. Although this is called a program, it is not a program in the sense that the previous version of, of IODP was that actually had a, a, a central management office that was controlling the multiple platforms. Uh, this evolved into more of a federated structure, which you see in the graphic here uh, with the funding agencies at the top. Each facility is managed by a, a, a facility board, which is a, a composed of representatives from the science community, the funding agency, and then one for the, for the operator. And so that, that has a focus on just the, that group, each one of those groups has just a focus on that platform, which I think has been effective from the US uh, management of the JR. Um, partnership and participation on the JR is through a, a, a what's always been called the JR Consortium. And that's where the non-US partners uh, with memorandums with the, the National Science Foundation gain access to the to JR. ECORD is the European Consortium. ANZEC is the Australia, uh, New Zealand Consortium. And and that has that comes about with financial contribution, but it's also uh, with birth exchange with the two other platform operators, which is which has had some challenges because of the issue of the number of expeditions that have been been executed. Uh, then this uh, this one just shows a quick a quick slot on on proposal 
uh, how the proposals are handled. Unsolicited proposals from the community are submitted and go through a simplified streamlined structure with a panel that evaluates science, the geophysical data required uh, to execute the, the expedition and, 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 and technical input on, on, cap on what can be done. Uh, after it passes muster with the, 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 that panel, they send it to external review. And then it, if it passes muster on all that, then it goes to the facility board and it takes a step through uh, a technical panel that looks at environmental protection and, and safety related to drilling. Because there is no uh, overarching central management agency in this phase of the program, a, a forum, a, a panel was set up that allowed the community uh, to provide input and look at things in a more holistic way across all three platforms. Um, and and that, that panel has been uh, charged as the custodian of, our, of the science plan and um, is a mechanism for, for joint discussions to happen about the, the program and, and, and the future. Uh, and one a brief talk about the budget model. So um, in this phase of the program, um, uh, this, this is kind of what it looks like. It started off with uh, about uh, uh, annual, con annual cash flow coming in at 64.5 million. It's decreased to something around 60 million. Uh, the U.S. annual funding has been fixed through most of it at 48 million per year. Uh, I believe it's gone to 51 this year. Is that right? Yeah. And then uh, international partner funding at maximum was 16.5 million. That was in the first three-ish years of the program, uh, this phase of the program. And then as Brazil, uh, the two there were two partners that dropped out. Brazil reduced and then dropped out, and then South Korea, and it's dropped to 12.5. Why that's been uh, a a, a challenge is, as you can see, uh, the JR annual budget started off in in that in that realm at 64.5, but the ability uh, just just with cost increases uh, um, that that presents a bit of a challenge. We are at 71 million um, this year and with the JR, and and you can see that presents a serious cash flow problem, and that. Um, so we wouldn't be operating if there wasn't a solution to that, and that came about in the next two bullets here. Um, um, there were one-time partner contributions toward the beginning of the, this phase of the program. There was a mechanism put into the proposal structure called com complementary project proposals, which effectively allowed a partner, if an expedition was in their waters and was a high priority, they could pay extra money to NSF to get additional staff on board, initial scientists on board. And that happened four times, and that brought in $24 million to the program. Mm -hmm. And then in this phase of the program, NSF set up a different relationship with uh, um, the award to Texas A&M University uh, that, uh, that promoted us looking for cost efficiencies everywhere we could get. And we were very fortunate in the first many years of the program that inflation was, was low and fuel costs were low, sometimes even lower than we predicted in our budget. And so that generated a cost efficiencies and NSF could direct that money into future years. So that's how the money has, has balanced. And as Jamie has been telling, people in our and panels, um, you know, that that's running out. And, and we were lucky it's lasted all the way through this phase of the program. Okay, on to science impact. Um, this, this, that's interesting, that's a blue background. Um, anyway, that may be a Mac to PC thing. I don't, I don't know, anyway, the, the, that threw me for a loop. Sorry about that. Uh, so the, the science impact, um, so, that was a bit of a daunting question when I got that two weeks ago. Um, it, it doesn't exist uh, in this phase of the program. And it was fact at the last IODP forum meeting in April, it was a topic of conversation that the community needs to start looking about putting that together. Um, that would be a very good thing to do. Um, the US science support program at, at Lamont took, took that on and formed a working group. And so they're looking at doing that. It's gonna take approximately a year and a half to do that. So. Um, Anybody here who's been in the program a while being asked to put together all the significant scientific findings for this phase of the program as an individual <laughs> in two weeks knows the daunting task. The people that know me well, I was freaking out a little bit. Um, and, and so um, I thought about this and put it in, in context of what you see in these bullets here. The first one to realize for those who are not part of IODP um, is that there's a significant lag from the time the expedition goes until scientists have a chance to take those samples back to their labs and do research, and it starts churning out into the into journals, into science, into into science communication for everybody else to see, and and that's typically on the order of four to five years. That photo to the right is um, the expedition three nine seven uh, uh, science party or part of them. 
um, at Bremen Corps Repository doing a sample party post expedition. And that actually should say June, not, not February. Uh, I, I had a brain freeze thing and put the wrong thing in there. All those trash bags are not trash. Those are 55,000 plus samples that were collected out of six kilometers of core collected on their expedition. This expedition is just now getting started at pulling pulling together the work that they need to do to, to put things into, into the journals. It's gonna take them four to five years. I've seen records from this amazing depth transect off the Iberian margin that has beautiful high resolution uh, signals in the last 6 million years. I guarantee you there's ki killer scientific findings that are gonna come off of this, but that's four to five years down the line. So I've, I've taken the point of view of doing these, these three steps you see here in the next slides. And that is looking at publication statistics. We are an NSF facility, uh, having attended many workshops. I know all NSF facilities use this approach to look at the quantitative impact of their facility. And that's just looking at the numbers of publications and citations and, and the like. We publish that. We do, we do a compilation every year and publish that on our website. And another one will come out in September probably. The other question is, are, are, are the expeditions actually going to be, have, have they been done and will they be done um, in, uh, as, as we end toward the end of the program to meet the different um, um, science plan themes? This is a, a task that the, um, can you go back one, please? Um, uh, this is a task that the uh, ideal IODP forum looks at periodically. And so luckily they just did that with the help of the science party. And uh, I've stolen a couple of slides uh, from Hank Brinkhoff um, to, to who, who, who's the chair of that, that board to, to uh, show you that. And then I went through the task of calling through high impact publications to, to produce a list um, of what I think are the high impact publications um, are, are, are bullets for, to show you guys. But it, it, I think anybody who's been involved in this knows the breadth of the program's uh, uh, science is too broad for any one person to have any kind of ability to do a critical assessment. So this is just me going through and pulling these out. I had a, a little help, but um, a couple. But so if you're in a field that's far afield from what I do, you will see the naivety <laughs> as I approach trying to pull a bullet out of these. So apologies in advance if you think uh, what I pulled out is not appropriate. Uh, so just look at publication statistics. A panel on the left is the current phase of the program. Um, it's uh, that Y axis goes to 90. And this is just publications per expedition um, uh, and the y, the x axis is chronological um, uh, from the early expeditions to the more recent ones. You see that tail off as you get toward more recent expeditions. They just haven't had time to, to turn anything out into the literature. And to give you a comparison or to see where things are going, you can look at the integrated ocean drilling program, which is on the right panel. The y axis goes to 200 and you can see a lot more publications and you can see the variation. The dark blue in this are, are the Chikyu expeditions and they've uh, our publication both a group piled too many in one of those. Uh, they aren't quite as linked. And then uh, um, the red ones are the mission specific platforms and all the rest are other JR expeditions. If you go to the next slide, it's looking at citations uh, per expedition. Again, this is, there's a lag from this one relative to when the publications come out. Uh, you can see in the uh, over 15,000 uh, for this phase of the program already. You can see some that have kind of kind of really stand out, uh, including uh, the the IBMs and 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 um, uh, South China Sea in the beginning, the Red Chicxulub one, uh, which uh, Sean was one of the co-chiefs on, and then you can see the comparison to the integrated phase, which is uh, goes the y-axis goes to twelve thousand five hundred, uh, and the and you you can you can see that variation you see per expedition is pretty typical. Okay, next one, and this is just. Let's look at the total number of publications in the highest impact journals. Uh, this is the top 30 going from the highest impact to lowest impact. That's what's in the parentheses. The, the two colors uh, are here are, slight, are slightly different. Uh, this is looking at the entire history of scientific ocean drilling. So the dark, the darker blue or purple is 1969 to 2002. So the deep sea drilling project and the ocean drilling program and the green uh, is the um, the last two IODPs. Uh, so well over 6,000 uh, publication in the high impact journals. Uh, moving on to the, the science plan. Uh, the, what you see there are the five major themes in the current science plan. Each plan, each theme has some high priority challenges. There are 14 in total. Um, if you spend some time reading through this, this 
this uh, science plan, which is a 10 year science plan. Um, I, I think you can look at that and, and see, you know, it's clear that this is, uh, there's, there's quite a bit that's aspirational in, in this, uh, we can certainly make progress, but some of this won't, will not be accomplished in one, one 10 year plan. And I, I think you see that the change in tact that Anthony will be talking about later uh, with the scientific framework uh, for, for the future. So next slide, please. Okay, this is just a number of expeditions plotted against the, the 14 different challenge numbers. Uh, and you can see that there are multiple expeditions that are addressing each major challenge. Um, and so down the road, once all these expeditions start producing uh, uh, a science that we're gonna have a significant uh, a chunk of this addressed and on the way to, to uh, solving questions and problems, but also generating new questions and problems that need to be solved. And this is looking at publications in a broader sense. So these are uh, going from left to right um, program publications. These are the, the proceedings volume that are part of each uh, uh, expedition publishing some data reports, journal articles, and then abstracts presentations. So that, that gives you the stuff that's too early to go out into journals and then thesis and dissertations. Um, just this, it's just more the same thing. So uh, to to move on to uh, scientific findings, I wanted to spend a minute to go back to this map because it shows us um, what where to expect some scientific findings and where it's too early. Um, and this is mostly mostly from the JR perspective because it went um, um, it, through a track and a and a path that allowed um, both the science community to put proposals in ahead of it but it also allowed the program with multiple expeditions in the same region tackling regional problems. And so the expedition started in the Western Pacific, moved into the Northern and Southern Indian Ocean and back into the Western Pacific. And so a suite of expeditions are, 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 are recording different signals from the, the Asian monsoons. Um, there are uh, various uh, aspects of subduction initiation, which was an open question um, that have been addressed. And then there are interesting uh, connections between expeditions, the Western Pacific warm pool, Indonesian through flow, and the path of halt, halt, heat and salt transport across the Indian Ocean through the Agulhas leakage in Southern Africa in, into the Atlantic that have been able to, to be addressed. And so basically everything in the, that I'm gonna be talking about now is from the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. Um, uh, there was a Southern Ocean campaign that most of that was tackled in 2019. So it's a little too early. And these guys were slowed down a little bit by COVID. So we're starting to see some of those trickling out, but it's another year or so before you see most of it out. And then everything in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean uh, that we've been operating over the last few years is, is premature. Although there are several expeditions in, in there that are already looking at um, straight off the expedition publications that they're working on. Um, there's one that's in Press for Nature Geoscience off the Norwegian margin. Um, uh, looking at hydrothermal venting and, and impact on, on global warming, in particular, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. Uh, there's one for around uh, the Santorini volcanic complex and the Aegean Sea, looking at explosive volcanism and geohazards. And there's a, um, um, one that we just completed uh, in the Central Atlantic, recovering an amazing 1,000 meters of ultramafic altered rocks that are either lower crustal mantle that is unprecedented uh, so far in scientific ocean drilling, and they're working on a paper. Uh, so, okay, here, go, here goes my, my stab in one week at coming up with uh, the most significant findings so far in this phase of IODP. Um, it, you know, the, just a caveat that, you know, picking the high profile publications does not give you the meat of, of what's being produced and are you really advancing the science plan, but it gives you the flavor that this kind of science is coming uh, from those. And so the, the, you know, the monsoon track of expeditions, there's been some interesting data, interesting science that's coming out of this, in particular ones looking at the Pleistocene record of rainfall precipitation from the monsoons and using it to validate um, predictions by models for increased CO2, uh, uh, refinements of the origin and timing of the onset of the monsoon, uh, cooling in Antarctica and how that's impacted regional precipitation patterns in uh, Australia and in the Southeast Asia in the Miocene. Uh, uh, alluding to this, the series of, of expeditions, uh, we're seeing uh, you know, indications that uh, salt buildup in the Indian Ocean uh, during glacials is driving uh, um, circulation through the Agulhas leakage into the Atlantic and, and, and having an impact on deglacial circulation. 
interesting data coming out, looking at trying to tease out the processional signal in the early, early Pleistocene. Um, next one. Uh, from the Southern Ocean expeditions, you're seeing some, some information coming out showing uh, uh, in a northward shift of, of melting of icebergs and sea ice is impacting uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation reorganization during glacials. A uh, really cool paper looking at dust and productivity variation, looking at how low productivity glacial sea ice is impacting CO2 drawdown. Um, and then uh, the one of the conundrums of why uh, there is such large sea level amplitude in the early middle Miocene, uh, and that's being answered by the, uh, the, the there being a larger Western Antarctic ice sheet during that period than is at present. Um, I mentioned the Chicxulub uh, expedition, uh, trying to pick high, the high profile ones out of that is really, really, really challenging to do. Here's two in the climate and oceans, I, the, this, this amazing paper looking at uh, a huge thick sequence of breccia and, and, and uh, rock uh, that provides a high resolution uh, uh, record of the immediate uh, days and year timeframe aftermath of the Chicxulub impact. Uh, a really cool paper by Chris et al. that looked at recovery of uh, marine ecosystems right at the crater, which was much more rapid than expected. Uh, going back further in time, um, there's uh, uh, a paper that came out looking at massive volcanism and large igneous provinces and how that triggered an oceanic anoxic event in the mid Cretaceous, which is associated with the oceanic um, anoxic event too. Next one, please. And biosphere, again, here's one that's not in my, my field. Um, at, but there's some, uh, I, I, you know, these are papers I hadn't had a chance to read. These are really, so some really cool stuff. Uh, there was a nice uh, new survey of global marine, uh, a global diversity of looking at 40 sites uh, with depths to 700 meters below the seafloor using the exact same methods. Um, a, a really nice paper on, on survival strategies of a low biomass, but globally, but a diverse population in, in crustal rocks below the seafloor. Um, the, the, the expedition that the chick you did that was designed to test um, uh, the limit of life um, in a high geothermal uh, 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 setting uh, off of Japan had some very interesting variations in, in microbial abundance and, and activity of temperatures ab above 30 degrees. And then these crazy uh, high, high activity methanogens and sulfate reducers uh, at, at really deep uh, at high temperature. And then uh, another paper that's been uh, with the uh, drilling on uh, Brothers Volcano off of off of, of of New Zealand, looking at community variation and structure uh, with the change in geology and hydrothermal uh, regimes that exist in that in that volcano, submarine volcano. Okay, now we're really getting away from what I do. Uh, Earth connections. <clears throat> uh, so the the series of expeditions looking at subduction initiation, both in in the Izu Bonin Mariana region, looking at the both the 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 back arc and the fore arc data, both of them are pointing toward um, Izu Bonin subduction initiating as a spontaneous rather than an induced model, which were the two end member models that had uh, um, that needed to be tested. And then uh, here was one where I'm not a tectonicist, so this one was much more complex, looking at the Tonda, Tonga Kermadec uh, subduction zone um, and drilling off of Zealandia, off of New, New Zealand, uh, which you had a complex uh, response of uplift and depression that, that may have elements of both induced and, and spontaneous model. A breakup of the South China Sea, uh, not being at the end member that was anticipated pre-expedition. And then, and then finally, uh, alteration of seawater impacting global cycles. Am I out of time? Okay, uh, last slide, please. Um, and this is looking at earth in, earth in motion, uh, really cool data on, on landslides off of, of, of Antarctica that were set by pre-deposition of, of the margin uh, related to climate change and then induced by uh, glacial, uh, glacial static adjust, readjustment. Certainly that has implications with rising CO2 levels and, and ice retreat. Uh, the Chicxulub, one of the main hypotheses of the Chicxulub uh, um, uh, expedition was to test the origin of the peak rings. Um, and that was a, a, a clear, clear answer to that one. Um, and then, a series of expeditions looking at uh, the uh, major earthquakes uh, generating zones, Sumatra and Hikarangi and, and, and off, of, off of Japan, looking at different aspects of what is driving those, those major earthquakes and the slow slip 
uh, uh, earthquake regime that's off of Hingaragi and, and Nankai. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, several questions, and we've got about 10 minutes or so left. And uh, the first one has to do with, um, it's from uh, uh, Verena Hewer. And the question is, uh, talks about the, the technical staff in JR is so great. And then how can we keep that priceless resource of know-how over the next decade? So th th there's a two two prong answer to that, and and it's it's going to be very difficult, especially if the time frame to a new new vessel is fifteen to, to twenty years. I mean, I I think that if it's actually that long, I think that's going to be an impossible challenge. I mean, we're talking different generations of of people, probably, right? Um, in in the short term, uh, one of the one of the things that we're we will be submitting a proposal to NSF for the wind down phase of IODP, which will be five years after the last expedition. And it'll also fund activity at the repository. And we are going to be uh, um, uh, uh, moving all the implementations from the vessel and installing it at, at the, the Gulf Coast repository. And, and we'll have some staff that we can retain to help provide those services to the community. And so that's that's one way, but it, it's, it'll, it depends on what happens after that next five years. Okay. Then uh, next question is, uh, you mentioned four CPPs over the past decade. And uh, so the question is, do you think four per decade is a reasonable pacing that could be planned with any confidence? Well, I think that we didn't see any repeated means it might have been one one off efforts from those those partners. But uh, yeah. it, it it did. It was important in the end um, with the cash flow challenges that this, this phase had. Um, then the next one is um, from Allison Miller, which is why have so few drilling expeditions taking place in the US EEZ? Yeah, so there, there haven't been that, that many proposed. Um, we did have one in the Gulf of Mexico um, that we had to pull because of regulatory challenges, but that was drilling gas hydrates and it put us in a non-science framework to put it in a, um, uh, the, the, basically the regulatory farm for drilling oil and gas. And uh, the JR is an older vessel and it couldn't be retrofitted for that. Um, the rest of the EEZ, um, um, you know, could have could have been drilled if there were proposals. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um. Then another question from Allison is, how much scientific drilling could be accomplished if you had equipment that could be moved from research vessel to research vessel? I guess that's in the context of perhaps future MSPs. Uh, how much of the science on JR could be done on other vessels? And how much can only JR do? So, a simple question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we, there's a whole breakout session on that, right? <laughs> and, and, and maybe it's, I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to provide an adequate answer to that in, you know, in the yeah. little bit of time here, and that might be better to to address that in the breakout session. Uh, it says, um, next one is, um, well, just, there's a point someone makes is that uh, see the special issue of oceanography that has a lot of the information that, uh, to back up your-, your uh, Yeah, and that, your was, that was published in 2019. And yeah. if, if you look at it, it had a couple of the elements, but the, the subduction initiation, a nice summary was in there of that. Um, there was a little bit of monsoon in there, but that was mostly monsoon that was in the predecessor program. So it captured the very early element of, of this phase of the program. Um, but most of that is pre this phase. So the, the historical part. Okay. Uh, then there's a question about the Arctic, which is, um, uh, can we talk about the cancellation of 377 and 403? <laughs> Not sure you're the right person to talk about that. That's four, so cancellation was 404. Uh, I guess four, it's, uh, 404. Uh, for number that, 377 and number 403. 377. I, I mean, really there's people answer. in the room that know more about that than I do, yeah. including somebody on the committee. <laughs> but it, it, it got canceled for political reasons. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, it, it stopped that. Uh, 404 is the one that got canceled that was on the JR schedule. And, and that had to do with the end of JR operations and then having to demobilize the vessel in the this this during this award and so that that last expedition uh, had to be removed and be replaced by demobilizing the vessel and that was something that was a discussion item at the facility board that if that happened then that expedition would have to come off okay and then there's a question from uh, Steve Palumbi 
which is how much of the ocean drilling conclusions can be applied to current ocean conditions and models, and how much mostly applies to past conditions in the Miocene, uh, Pliocene, and Pleistocene. So I guess it's modern, it's how much applies to the modern ocean, I think is what Steve's after. Yeah, and I'm not the right person to ask that question to, I don't think. <laughs> There are plenty in this room who can tear that one up pretty pretty quickly. And I'm sure that's gonna come out at some point. I can't see any more. Nope. Is that it? Okay, well, I think that's all the questions so far. And um, I think you set up the, uh, the meeting nicely and I'm sure there'll be a lot of opportunities to deal with some of the ones that uh, came up at more depth. Okay, so thank you. So Jim, you're on next. That's pretty well. Yeah. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Zoe. Zoe, you're in the, there you are. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here this morning. My name is Jim McManus, and I'm the division director of the Division of Ocean Sciences, which resides within the Director of Geosciences at the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm also joined by my colleagues, Dr. Jamie Allen, Dr. Kevin Johnson, and Dr. Shelby Walker, um, who will be, we will be, collectively we will be here in and out of the room over the next couple of days. And our task is to listen. Um, you'll have to endure about 10 minutes of me talking. First and foremost, I wanna thank the committee and all who are participating in this workshop. Um, this is a big task. The decadal survey is something uh, we don't take lightly at the National Science Foundation. It provides information for how we think about the future, not just the next 10 years, but beyond the next 10 years. Um, as you all know, strategic planning sort of has ripple effects extending out past the, the the timing, if you will, of just the strategic plan. Um, not that the decadal survey is a strategic plan, but it is a document that informs our thinking over the next decade. So part of what I wanna do this morning, so I noticed the title, the title is the briefing from the July ODP town hall. And I want to reflect a little bit on that meeting, but largely in the context of the task of of this group in the workshop. There's lots of elements of the of that briefing that I will not discuss. It's available online if you'd like to, to, uh, to view it, but I'm going to be trying to point us towards thinking about the decadal survey and the context of the discussion over the next two days. Zoe, next slide. Uh, would you hit walk us through this. Thanks. That's good. Um, the current cooperative agreement with Texas A&M for JR operations will end following 2024. Uh, we're not retiring the JR. Uh, quite simply, the JR is not NSF's vessel, um, and we are not in a position to make that decision. The Division of Ocean Sciences wants to support scientific subsea floor sampling and needs that enterprise to be sustainable. Uh, Mitch outlined some of the challenges in his talk, and uh, I won't repeat those, but we've had serious challenges pretty much over the last 20 years. The current model for IODP, which has been in place more or less for that 20 years, is simply not a resilient model as it depends on timely contributions outside of the National Science Foundation. We need a base model that allows for predictable and regular operations that will benefit from larger cooperation from outside of the, the federal funding and support, but will not be reliant 
on external contributions for the program's execution. I want to express to the international community that we want to continue long-standing partnerships through a new financially sustainable model. We want scientific ocean drilling to be an international enterprise that is balanced financially and maintains some level of financial predictability. Science communities, sorry, that was loud. <laughs> I can be that way, I've been told. Um, Science communities drive what research and infrastructure NSF funds within its budget. Near future proposals, workshops, like what's happening here, community input for scientific ocean drilling activities, employing a portfolio of sampling approaches will help make the case for sustained and long-term investment in the enterprise. Next slide, please, Zoe. NSF recognizes the importance of ocean drilling enabled science in co contributing to understanding the broader Earth system. We need to consider how to meet new and emerging scientific priorities, recognizing fiscal constraints over the next 10 to 25 years. And that's referencing the, the, the ripple, if you will, of, of our activities here the next two days. In planning for the next generation of scientific ocean drilling, we need to identify science priorities under the framework of the broad oceanographic community and the nation's needs. The planning will require investment and continued dialogue. Next slide, please, Zoe. As we look forward over both the near and long terms, there are a number of activities that we will continue to support or will begin. NSF has and will continue to invest in research using legacy samples and data from ocean drilling cores. And Mitch referenced the, the, the lag time, if you will, that, that is sort of on the order of half to a full decade uh, for science that comes out of collection of those samples. NSF. The short, sorry, the shorter term, uh, we will consider and continue to plan for mission-specific platform seabed drilling deep piston coring expedition to meet scientific priorities. And we are currently working on an operating model for how to support those activities. And I did mention that at the, the July meeting. We're also developing an approach for how we support the longer term vision for sub seafloor sampling platform or platforms i.e. defining what our infrastructure might look like in the future. Zoe, oh, you're on it. <laughs> um, why did we ask for a decadal survey? To answer that question, I wanna first point you to our mission, that NSF promotes the progress of science by investing in research to expand knowledge in science, engineering, and education. NSF, also invest in actions that increase the capacity of the US to conduct and exploit such research. Part of how we go about our decision-making process is through community input. One way we accomplish that is through our peer review process, a process that many of you have heard me say I'm most proud of here in the US. But we also need regular input through a variety of other mechanisms like what is happening here this week. These combined inputs have provided a number of focus areas within the broader geosciences and include topics like climate change, climate intervention, geologic or climate hazards, new technologies, and the need for new research infrastructure. What we want from a new decadal survey is for our science to remain nimble and consider issues of timeliness, urgency, societal benefit, technological advances that can create new opportunities to address our most pressing needs. This is a big ask, but is how we will focus on the critical role of the ocean in the broader Earth system. Under the broad umbrella of what we are looking for from you, we need to continuously address the question, what research infrastructure is needed to advance the high priority ocean science research questions over the coming decade and beyond? What we need from you here is to identify the most urgent priorities that need to be accomplished over the next 10 to 25 years with an eye toward a portfolio of approaches to addressing those 
um, those priorities that can meet those objectives. That is all I have to say this morning. Um, the goal here is to really think about uh, priorities. As Tuba said, um, I, I don't know if Tuba was, was parroting me from the first meeting, but uh, a long list of priorities is actually not a list of priorities. And so the decadal, I have asked that the decadal survey committee not produce a long list of priorities because that won't be as useful a guiding document as something that really clearly articulates what the nation's scientific enterprise needs for the ne next, decade, next decade. With that, I will stop and take any questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, we have a qu question uh, right off the bat from uh, Rick Murray. Um, <laughs> it's okay, Rick. <laughs> Former, a former <laughs> it was stated that NSF wants international support. In NSF's eyes, is such international support required in a future program? If a sustainable program can be structured, must it have international participation in terms of dollars? I think you mentioned a base program that would probably. Yeah, let me. Um... Let me attempt to fill that out as clearly as I can. We need a program that as we work through our, our annual budgeting process is not going to be beholden to priorities that are outside of the National Science Foundation. We can only, re we can only within limits, control what, what we have, if essentially the resources that we have. A base program means we want to be able to continue scientific operations at a base level that we're, we feel good about, meaning we feel we can support and accommodate um, partners to come into that program or to work with us in some other way to be add-ons. The current model is not structured that way. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I have a question. Um, I don't. Know, I don't know what IODP cubed is, but is that something that NSF is potentially going to participate in, or does participate in, or what, what's the story on that? So, what I will say about IODP cubed is um, we are currently planning on having meetings at the end of the month with our international partners to explore what how we might interact. I don't want to address specifically IODP cube, but where we are with our international partners is continuing the dialogue. Some international partners to varying levels, multiple international partners have, have talked to us. And we're trying to figure out how we can both make a, make a transparent and financially feasible relationship with, with our international colleagues. That's a little nebulous, Jim, I know, but that, that's probably the best answer I can give you. In, in process is what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, Tuba has a question. Um, she says, I think I heard you say that you are working on a pathway to make available access to potential sampling platforms. Did I understand that correctly? Can you tell us more about the timeline for this work? I'm trying not to answer with, no, I can't, but, <laughs> but it, we work inside the federal government. So there are plans that we are working on. Um, we are hoping, I am hoping to be able to say that, that the first step in those plans and how we um, start to accommodate uh, a new program will come out that, that sort of announcement, we are still working on the details of what we would like to see, but I'm hopeful that that announcement is relatively imminent, but I can't say any more than that. Okay. I probably said too much, but I don't think you could get much out of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, question from Leon Clark. Does NSF envisage, envisage a future base subsea floor sampling program that will have 
12 or 10 months of seagoing operations or something on a smaller scale? It's too early to mention the, the operating length, the operating season, if you will, of, of any particular program. Um, what I mentioned very much in a cursory manner is we're thinking about what the platform support will look like going forward. And, and that's, it's a, it's not quite a blank slate, but it's a pretty blank slate at this point. The more detailed answer to that question is, it's just like every other facility we operate. We will have to operate within, within the budget constraints we have at that particular time. Um, and sometimes that means we have shorter at sea um, programs and sometimes it means we can go a little longer and so that honestly that's that's the most accurate answer i can give to that is we are constrained by our operations are constrained budgetarily and that makes sense um and we will just have to see where we are in the future okay uh, there's a question from jim zakos if urgent priorities require just don't. If urgent re priorities require resuming JR style drilling with three to five years, is NSF willing to support that? For example, by funding leasing of another ship and outfitting, possibly with more streamlined operations. Uh, Trying to think of the exact words of that question, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I, but um, but. I think the answer is, let me answer it without knowing the exact words. Um, NSF is interested in finding ways, so we have budgetary resources, finding ways to continue doing sampling operations on the platforms that are available to us. I, there is no, there's nothing more to say other than than that. The, I mentioned mis, mission specific platforms. Um, think of mission specific platforms as a pretty wide open definition. <laughs> That's what that means. Um, we are working on how we would do that. Okay. So now there's uh, two questions related to the uh, 2050 scientific framework. Um, one of them's from Steve Daunt, the other one's anonymous, but the anonymous is not hate mail, so that's that's good. Um, so anyway, what what is the status of at NSF of the 2050 science framework created by the um, drilling community in recent years? Uh, so the way I put this, the the 2050 framework um, is a document that we recognize as something that identifies the the priorities of the drilling community writ large over the next 25 years. And so what I'm asking today is tell us what the most urgent priorities are over the next decade. So I, I think that's the answer to the question. Um. There was a second question, I think, or was that, no, that combined? No, that was, that was wrapped into both of them. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. I and think, that's a pretty uh, good segue to yeah, the next talk, <laughs> yeah. I think. So, so thank you very let's much, thank Jim. Jim, for being here. Yeah. I want to say one more time, thank you all. Um, my colleagues and I will be here to bear, I, I have to jump in and out for a variety of, of meetings, and I will be online uh, tomorrow, but but we're here listening and we're happy to hear from you uh, along the way. So thank you again. Um, I know that that folks had to travel and that folks online and, and in the room are taking times out of their, their days and their weeks. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. All right, with that, we are right on time. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Um, so next, 
talk will be by Anthony Coppers, who could not be here in person today, but I believe he is online. And he will be reviewing, good segue, he will be reviewing the 2050 Science Framework for Scientific Ocean Drilling for us. Uh, Anthony, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you for being here. Yes, absolutely. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Anthony Coppers. I'm an Associate Vice President for Research and a Professor of Marine Geology at Oregon State University. Before I get started, I want to first thank the committee and its co-chairs for inviting me to speak to you. On behalf of the overall scientific ocean drilling community, it's an honor to do so as this community is made of a long-standing, multi-generational, multinational, highly collaborative and highly transdisciplinary group of world-class scientists and students who together have explored the earth, as we all know, addressed the most critical science questions of high societal relevance, tested hundreds of science hypotheses across dozens of science disciplines and subdisciplines, and we've borne new fields of scientific inquiry and who together have created a wealth of earth science information that otherwise would be impossible to get our hands on. So next slide, please. So my work with scientific ocean drilling started in 95. Over those 28 years, my students and I have been deeply involved with sailing on the JR and doing research with core stored in its IODP repositories. Uh, here on the slide are listed two example papers by my students, one highly cited in EPSL and one just published in Science, showcasing the relevance of scientific ocean drilling findings that actually go beyond our own science disciplines. I also served in various leadership positions in IODP since 2010, which culminated in the honor to actually serve as a co-lead editor for the 2050 Science Framework. And on behalf of the massive national and international scientific ocean drilling community. In this presentation, I will discuss the why and what of the framework, how the science in this framework is of the broadest scope, and what will be difficult, if not impossible to do, if we lose the capabilities of the Jodis resolution in 2024. I also will list four immediate steps that should be taken in fiscal year 24 to keep scientific ocean drilling continuing and strong and starting to deliver on the key scientific goals that are laid out in the 2050 science framework. Next slide, please. Exploring Earth by Scientific Ocean Drilling. That is the framework's title, but why did we create it? So let's dig into that question to get us started. Next slide, please. The overarching goal of the 2050 science framework is to guide future subsea floor research that will reveal the key linkages, processes, feedbacks, and tipping points in the complex, complex Earth system. In short, it will increase our understanding of Earth as an interconnected system, and it will reveal the many complex interactions between the solid Earth, the oceans, life, climate, and society. To that end, there's so much still to do, so much more to research, so many dr new drill sites to occupy around the world. For example, it's critical to collect a wide range of pale climate records to test contemporary global climate models that provide competing forecasts and that lay out different future scenarios for sea level rise, ocean circulation, ocean acidification, ocean oxygenation, coral reef health, and the expanding aridity patterns across continents, just to name a few. Just look at the news of the past few weeks where scientists and people all around the world are trying to figure out what the extreme warm ocean water temperatures with anomalies up to eight degrees C, right, in the North Atlantic may mean. Everybody's wondering if and when the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation may stop and create an entirely new climate state on Earth. Scientific ocean drilling will be critical in providing lessons from changing global ocean circulations in the geological past. The 2050 science framework is set up to address these kinds of truly critical and timely questions. So before I go on, I think it's crucial to understand what this framework is not. Simply put, it's not a science plan, and it's also not an implementation plan written for a specific drilling platform, such as the Joris Resolution in the United States, the GQ in Japan, or the mission-specific platforms in Europe. Instead, it provides this superstructure on top of which new programs and new facilities are built, such as a brand new, such as the brand new IUDP Cube program by Europe and Japan, the almost ready new drill ship in China, or a future new riceless drilling vessel in the United States. 
The framework is purposely broad and is built around interconnections, international, multidisciplinary collaborations, and is aspirational with new science goals that have clear societal impact. The framework was built by and for the next generation of scientists, and it is a long ranging one because it goes through 2050. So, and we did that so that we can include science endeavors that require consistent, even decadal attention to get it actually done. There are science questions that aren't that big. To put it differently, the 2050 science framework contains a lot of new science not yet done with scientific ocean drilling or in any other science field. Next slide, please. The framework at its basis has seven strategic objectives that represent broad areas of scientific inquiry. As you can see in the pinwheel diagram here on the right, these objectives cover many topics in the earth, ocean, life, geophysical, biology, and polar sciences, and more. They are designed to allow us to investigate the interconnections in the dynamic earth system, with its climate and the environment, and with all life on it. And that's visualized in the center of the pinwheel with the three interlocking jigsaw puzzle pieces. The new research on those interconnections then will influence our inquiry into understanding of natural hazards, global cycles and rates, and the, and the health and habitability of our oceans and planets. And those are depicted in the three encircling arrows. Later in my presentation, I will map out those strategic objectives against the broader science themes in the ocean sciences and beyond. But I think it's easy to grasp from those seven objectives that the 2050 science framework is both broad and widely encompassing. Next slide, please. The framework also includes five flagship initiatives, which are designed as long-term drilling endeavors that aim to inform issues of particular interest to society, typically combining goals from multiple strategic objectives. These new flagship initiatives inherently require a coordinated multi-expedition approach, which is best done with skilled coordinating program officers in place, like for example, the Jodis Resolutions Science Support Office, sorry, op Science Operations Office and the US Science Support Office in La Monde. I would like to point out here that the flagship initiatives one, three and five are directly re relevant to today's societal challenges and of high importance to several natural security risks, say like sea level rise, rise and geohazards. Next slide, please. I already have shown that um, the scope right, of the science framework is really purposely very broad and reaching far beyond the, science, the ocean sciences. Here, I want to dig into how the framework objectives and initiatives are matching up with the science priorities in the first decadal survey of the ocean sciences that was published in 2012. So next slide, please. This, this slide will need some explanation and sorry for putting such a dense matrix in front of you all. So let me take you through this step by step. First in the brown background color, I'm listing the eight research areas from the first decadal survey of the ocean sciences in 2012. These research areas were considered by the decadal survey committee for each large facility in the US. For example, the Academic Research Vessel, the Ocean Observatory Initiative, OOI, Deep Submergence, and IODP. It was determined by this committee whether that facility was important, indicated by the capital I, or critical, indicated by the capital C, in addressing those research areas. If the facility was not critical or not important to that research area, the cell is blank. The scoring they came up with is listed here on the row next to the, the circle with the one in it in the upper left. According to that decadal survey report, IDP was important in two research areas and critical in three out of the eight. Second, on the second row, right, with that black uh, circle with a two in it, I have updated the scoring based on the last 10 years of IDP operations and science. Here I added a first scoring category for first work, capital F, if scientific ocean drilling community has started to work in that research area newly. And you can see I've updated and particularly the work around ocean and climate variability to critical. And we have started to really start working in biodiversity and marine ecosystems as well. So first, to extend this analysis to the 2050 science framework, I needed to substantially expand the table 
given that the framework provides such a broad science superstructure. I, do, I therefore added seven new categories on the right-hand side of the table in the gray background color. These include habitability and microbiology, ocean health, global biogeochemical cycles, energy, matter, and marine resources, tipping points, technology and workforce development, and data scientists monitoring and artificial intelligence. Then from row three downward, right, the, the black circle with the three in it, I have added all the 2050 science framework items, the seven strategic objectives, the five flagship initiatives, and the four enabling elements that are also part of this superstructure. And then I filled out right this matrix by putting either an I, a C, or an F relative to, to this matrix. Uh, I'm not going to go through that one row by row, but one what I want you to leave you with here is the clear impression that the 2050 science framework is hugely expanding what IDP did from 2013 through 2023. And that it contains goals providing new important and critical input to all of those research areas. These areas clearly cover the ocean sciences, which reach far beyond that science realm. Next slide, please. So I'm going to change uh, back here a little bit. Scientific ocean drilling, unlike industrial or commercial drilling, prioritizes recovery of complete sedimentary and rock records through continuous coring, and that way can make a revolution basically in our understanding of the earth. In fact, the oil and gas industry are best equipped for drilling down and not, and they're not that interested in or good in coring actually and retrieving those nine and a half meter cores that the GRR does. So in the next couple of slides, I will investigate with you what will be lost in terms of science without a geodesic solution and when we may get to work with commercial drilling vessels instead. So next slide, please. Most commercial vessels have a drill string limit of about three kilometer, which is less than half when compared to the JR, which has uh, about 6.5 kilometer on board. We also heard earlier from Mitch Malone that these commercial vessels can core at a much lesser speed, three to four times slower than a JR. Um, having said that, there are a few commercial drilling vessels out there that do have more drill string on board. But if we look to the e or the European Mission Pacific Platform Operator, they actually recommend that scientists only plan for up to three kilometers of drill pipe. These special commercial vessels that have a lot of drill pipe on it are very expensive to rent or lease, and often are oversubscribed because there's so few of them, making those unaffordable, logistically complex, and just unlikely alternate solutions to the JR. Here on this slide, I show two maps on the left. The top one shows where in the world the JR and the CQ and MSP can operate today, which is basically everywhere. The bottom one shows where we can operate after the Joe's Resolutions retired in 2024, and when we would potentially start to drill with those commercial vessels that have only three kilometer of drill string on board. In short, any place in the world's oceans where water depths are greater than three kilometer are now blacked out and potentially cannot be used to address the 2050 science framework goals. Installing borehole obs observatories can be done with commercial vessels. We, we know that. But the corks, which are special borehole installations developed with scientific ocean drilling, as I said, are very specialized and uniquely outfitted for working with the JR. The upper right map shows how few holes have been occupied with corks for earthquake, crystal crystal fluid flow or microbiology research. And given that it is so hard to install them with other vessels, it seems, in, at least in my viewpoint, it's very unlikely that many more will get added without a JR. The severely hampering progress on the proposed extensive earthquake monitoring networks in the 2050 science framework or any origin of life geomicrobiology research goals. For modern day hard rock basement drilling, the current IDP standard is to at least core 200 meter into the basement and, and below so that we can pass the seawater all the top section and get into fresher rocks. Most commercial drillers have experience in drilling sedimentary packages where oil and gas reside, but not so much with drilling into 
basaltic basement. The lower right map shows only a couple of dozen holes that have been drilled into basement for at least 200 meters over the whole run of IEDP and the other programs. Um, and that hard rock core collection is, again, unlikely to be expanded on, uh, giving, um, giving those limitations. Rock bottom drills are very interesting, but they also are not of a particular help here because they typically don't go deeper than 150 meters penetration into the sub C4. Next slide, please. Here I show another key example. We all know that we may be living through a sixth mass extinction on Earth and the first one caused by humans. Therefore, it's critically important to establish the baseline state of our ocean's health and examine potential responses by the Earth system to, com to compare major uh, perturbations such as the paleogene eocene thermal maximum, also called PETM, that occurred around 56 million years ago when CO2 was rapidly released into the atmosphere. Again, scientific ocean drilling is uniquely positioned to answer those questions. If we can reach deep into those sedimentary sections and we can recover those sections in a continuous and intact manner. As you can see on the left, only a few sites have good PETM sections thus far, but most of them collected near the three kilometer water de depth limit of commercial vessels. On the right, I'm reproducing two diagrams that Mitch Malone showed earlier. Based on current operational statistics, more than 40% of the JR's work has been in waters deeper than three kilometer. And for nine, more than 900 holes, they penetrated more than 250 meters into the subsea floor of those more than 300 deeper than 500 and of those 46 deeper than a kilometer. Those latest statistics show that many expeditions require a lot more drill pipe. I can draw the conclusion here, or at least one conclusion, that a lot of the science in the 2050 science framework requires more of those deeper targets. So let's look at three key examples from past expeditions that require those high fidelity signs that are relevant to the 2050 science framework. So next slide, please. Over the last decade, many fundamental advantages have been made in deep bio biosphere studies. Most of that work was done with quarks installed by the JR for sampling of fluids for geochemistry and microbiology and carrying out monitoring over several years. Um, in those quarks, they are using in situ mass spectrometers and enrichment experiments and colonization experiments, for example, as pictured here on the right. The cork itself is shown here as the background, background image for people that know, don't know what a cork is. IDP data has, has shown that the deep sedimentary biosphere has as many cells as the entire water column, that oxygen can penetrate into the basaltic basement. And that's a deep biosphere extends down to at least two and a half kilometers beneath the seafloor and into the basaltic basement. Finding the limit of life, one, one of the themes in the uh, science framework, that seems unlikely if we need to go beyond that three kilometer total drill pipe limit. Understanding the habitability of our, hab habitability of our planet in extreme environments also will be slowed down as that depends often on work done with those highly specialized quarks. Next slide, please. Expedition 383 around Antarctica and in Iceberg Alley has been very profound to understanding ice and ocean dynamics within a changing climate. They set out to better understand how polar ice sheets responded to changes in insulation and atmospheric CO2 in the past and how ice sheet evolution influenced global sea level. They did so by investigating the mid Pliocene warm period and the late Pliocene glacial expansion of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And actually, that is the record that goes beyond the 800,000 year ice core record that we have in hand. However, to get to those continuous climate records, they needed to do two things. First, they needed to use APT and half APT coring tools developed and optimized by scientific ocean drilling and AJR over the last couple of decades to get undisturbed core sections that are necessary for this high resolution climate studies. And second, they needed to carry out a transect of core sites from shallow water on the sub-Antarctic front to deep water more than three kilometers deep um, in the Dove and Peary basins. 
They succeeded with the JR on both fronts by getting between 260 and 250 meters of long sections that are continuous and high quality and basically providing high fidelity climate records using 3.7 kilometers of drill string in some cases. Um, these shallow to deep water transects are key in the climate objectives in the 2050 science framework, and those are likely much harder to be attained without a future JR. Next slide, please. Another, ex another expedition, 362, drilled the input materials of the North Sumatran subduction zone, where the uh, magnitude 9 plus earthquake and tsunami originated that devastated coastal communities around the Indian Ocean in 2004, around the Christmas break. The expedition was designed to ground through the material properties, causing this unexpected shallow seismogenic slip that, that was not really well explained by any current models at the time. Again, they succeeded with the JR by drilling two sites on the Indian Oceanic Plate and by coring and logging to a maximum, maximum depth of 1.5 kilometers below the seafloor and in more than four kilometer water depth. And they needed for that almost 5.6 kilometer of drill string per hole. These kind of studies have not yet been done, but are badly needed for understanding, for example, the Cascadia subduction zone right here in our US EEC waters. Again, without the Joris resolution, this may be harder to pull off in the near future. Next slide, please. So let's review a few numbers that make scientific ocean drilling stand down. Next slide. Personally, I do not know of any large facility in the United States that has published so widely and has had such a great impact. Over the last five decades, scientific ocean drilling has produced more than 13,000 peer reviewed publications. Of those, more than 6,000 appeared in the top 30 journals with a larger than three impact factor and more than 800 papers came out in high impact journals such as Nature and Science, with an impact factor larger than 10. More than half of those uh, Nature and Science papers, 491 to be precise, were actually published over the last decade alone. Since 2003, more than 600 US research institutions from 50 states were involved in scientific ocean drilling through expeditions or workshops and meetings showing it's not only being used by the prim primary oceanographic research institutions. Over the same period of time, 26 countries were involved across the program, showing the incredible international and collaborative character of this science field. Finally, during the summer of 2022, more than 2,200 scientists, students and teachers and more signed a petition in support of continued future riceless drilling in the US, showing that the community is massive and actively engaged in scientific ocean drilling. Next slide, please. Scientific ocean drilling is a program by the people and for the people. We are actively engaging with each other in the US and internationally. And for example, US SODA, uh, an alliance of 15 large research institutions in the US has, been, um, has a strong interest in scientific ocean drilling and have been informing the NSF leadership on behalf of the community with four letters to inform them about the need and future of the program. In addition, 50 provost, five presidents, chancellors, deans from the US and international institutions sent letters to the NSF indicated how critical scientific ocean drilling is for the faculty and students. The community also comes together in large numbers to key community workshops, meetings, and town halls. More than 650 scientists worldwide were involved in shaping the 2050 science framework. Last month, more than 400 showed up and joined the NSF town hall, where NSF leadership laid out the decision making and planning. And more than 45 writers helped in writing the 2050 science framework, of which more than half are early career scientists. And then the, the last impressive fact, the work of scientific ocean drilling resulted in the creation of two entirely new subdisciplines of paleo-oceanography and paleoclimatology. Next slide, please. This is a map showing the results of that US SODA petition and give you a really great picture from where scientific ocean drilling scientists and students are hailing, basically all around the world from many, many countries. Next slide, please. 
Although the need for a direct replacement for the JR is urgent and the most critical, we need to ask ourselves how to bridge the time between 2024 when the JR is retired and when a new ship can be brought online. Next slide, please. I therefore, I therefore offer these four high priority immediate goals, which during the panel discussion later this morning, I will flesh out a bit more. It all, it's almost self-evident, but a new US riceless, riceless vessel that can carry up to seven kilometers of drill pipe and can operate around the world in all the oceans and seas up to six kilometers water depth. This is what is required to seriously start addressing the great science encapsulated in the framework. It necessitates that as soon as possible, a university-based program is established to help guide us and carry out conceptual design for such a new drilling vessel and more. And in the transition time, and until such a new drilling vessel is built and operational, there are three immediate steps that, in my eyes, can be taken. First, we need to keep the community alive and kicking through continuation of both the U.S. Science Support Program and USEC, that's the U.S. Science Advisory, Advisory Committee. Second, we need to put into place a U.S. MSP-style office to help scientists with a really daunting logistics, procurement, international operations, et cetera, to actually carry out scientific ocean drilling in the interim. And first, we need to resurrect the ODP solicitation of program that was reti retired around the beginning of the second IDP program in 2012, in order to provide scientists with a mechanism to submit a larger variety of scientific, scientific ocean drilling related proposals to the NSF. Next slide, please. So in summary, it is impossible to open an Earth and Ocean Sciences textbook or even an IPCC report and not find references to IEDP-derived discoveries, from the discovery of plate tectonics to climate change. Paleo-oceanographic and paleoclimate data are so fundamental to our understanding of sea level rise, oceanic and atmospheric circulation, and climate change that scientists writing the 2021 IPCC report decided to include insights from these records through the report, rather than restricting the IEDP climate data to just one chapter. There are many other critical societal challenges for natural hazards, sorry, for that scientific ocean drilling can help us address in the future. A great example is the planning for natural hazards like earthquakes and tsunamis to protect lives in communities in Cascadia, for example, by providing evidence on fault zone behavior at plate boundaries that drive these devastating phenomena. There's still lots of work to be done in these and many other areas, all coherently and robustly documented in the 2050 science framework, which in my viewpoint will stand as an enduring scaffolding around which we can organize future scientific ocean drilling in the US and collaboratively throughout the world with our international partners. So next slide, please. So I will leave you with four take home messages. First, scientific ocean drilling is a unique science field, including many disciplines and subdisciplines, and with advanced capabilities that are now lost due to the JR retirement. A new state of the art next version of this incredible facility is needed to seriously address the 2050 science framework. In a sense, the Joris resolution is like the old Hubble telescope. It's an excellent facility generating many thousands of great pictures of the universe, but now Sir James Webb Space Telescope, and it provides strongly improved capabilities resulting in high fidelity imagery that is revolutionizing the science field of astronomy. What we need foremost is the equivalent of the Webb Telescope in the ocean sciences. We need a replacement of the JR that significantly improved in its drilling and coring capabilities. Second, the 2050 science framework is extremely broad and filling in across the broader ocean science themes and far beyond, as I've shown earlier in that matrix. And third, without a JR, I showed that scientific ocean drilling will be fundamentally different and a large percentage of the science cannot be done or at least not easily done that's encapsulated in the framework. However, there are also are parts of the 2050 cent framework that can be carried out by seeking alternative solutions. And this community is standing ready to engage and map out how that could or should work. 
while in parallel working together with the National Science Foundation towards designing a new riceless drilling vessel. And fourth, scientific ocean drilling provides a very strong return on investment, as has been shown by the strong publication records and the fact that this program serves, serves such a huge national and international community. Investment in scientific ocean drilling today will not only yield benefits in the short term, but it clearly will deliver returns in the years and decades to come. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to any of your questions. Yeah, thank you for that great talk. And uh, it was exactly on time. <laughs> so thank you for that as well, <laughs> to the second. <laughs> uh, we have a number of questions. Um, the first one's really an NSF question, so I'll wait on that one. But um, uh, Jim Zakos has a question. Is it possible to identify high priority issues requiring science scientific drilling that could be classified as urgent? In other words, questions we would like to know the answers to sooner rather than later. I, I think that's that's definitely true. So the science framework, right, has this long outlook all the way to 2050. And as I said earlier, some of them in particular, the flagship initiatives have that long time frame in mind. And so, um, they will be achieved over that longer run. There's also a lot of science in this framework that can be started to be done immediately, but also needs to get done immediately. Um, first comes to mind, ground shooting climate modeling that's happening now. We, as I had this example, right, about ocean water temperatures changing so drastically today, or like this week, right? Um, and we, and basically you can read online that scientists are basically pulling their hairs out. They don't understand what they're seeing. So we need to really uh, make those models better. And one way of doing that, which is important, is provide ground routing with scientific ocean drilling data from the recent geological past or even deeper into geological past, maybe all the way back to 50 million years, where there were time periods when the Earth was potentially in a similar state. Um, so those kind of things, I think, are required to start immediately and would would be actually counterproductive if we have to wait five or 10 years to actually start on those initiatives. The other one is around geohazards. As I said, it's seen as a national security issue by the National Science Foundation and by Congress. And um, as somebody asked, right, we're not really in the US EEC that much. And that's true. We haven't really uh, substantially or consistently drilled in the Cascadia and around the Cascadia subduction zone. So a lot of work needs to get done there to truly understand, you know, how does that subduction zone work? It doesn't work like the one in Japan. It doesn't work like the one in Alaska. It doesn't work like the one around Silenia. It's quite different. It's more quiet than the other ones, but we have no idea why and what that actually means. So there's another national security reason there to really start working on that science question immediately. Okay. Um... I can probably... I was told to uh, uh, ask the questions in the uh, based on the number of votes they get. So uh, the next one then is by Mona Bell. Uh, Mitch and you shared the extensive academic scientific impact of research aboard JR. Could you briefly reflect on the broader societal impacts, education, outreach, workforce development, and if what can we continue to accomplish without JR? Yes, so that, that's a very important question. Um, and I think Mitch will say that uh, on my behalf, if, if he was standing here, uh, working on broader impact and outreach has been a challenge within um, the US with scientific ocean drilling, um, in particular, given the budget that was provided by the NSF that doesn't really have a substantial amount of, of budget associated with it. So in that sense, you know, from a programmatic point of view, this program has not been um, diligently and consistently working and translating all those great scientific papers and outcomes into societal information that can be digested by communities around us in the US and around the world. So that's a caveat, you know, um, but that's important to understand. So a lot of the uh, the impact that's happening is happening through social media. And um, 
in the panel discussion, actually, I will provide an example of something that just appeared widely uh, across social media around, you know, drilling into the Earth's mantle. So a very fundamental Earth question, you know, how is the Earth structured? And for us to really drill deep into the Earth's mantle for 1.5 kilometer is a tremendous success of this program, but also has a tremendous uh, interest and impact on uh, the communities around us. Um, similar things can be said around climate change and earthquake um, research, but often again, that translational part still needs to get done and needs to get improved on. And I think if you read the science framework, there is one enabling element around outreach and engagement and education that we put in there on purpose because we recognize that this is clearly an area where scientific ocean drilling in the US should improve upon to really make that next step to translate our findings into something that society can digest. I forgot the second part of the question. Uh, let's see, uh, can, what can we continue to accomplish in the area of education, outreach and workforce development without the JR? That's harder. That's harder to answer. It depends on the solutions that we can bring right forward. Um, and it, I think it's um, if we, and that is if we want to keep collecting new core sites, right, in the immediate period. If we cannot do that, or we are limited in that sense, the only thing that we can do, of course, is work with the existing cores that we have in our repositories. And in the beginning of my presentation, right, I gave this one example of the science paper that one of my students just published in science. Um, and that actually was done with course collected 30 years ago with, with a predecessor program uh, in, U, in the United States, also with the JR. And so those cores are highly valuable and can answer science questions that we have today. And so we went back right into the core course, so we collected those samples and were really able to come back with a substantial new finding that has a much wider right interest than just uh, you know, the, the science discipline that I am in, in the basically deep mental and um, dynamics. Um, so I think that's that's the only other uh, avenue we have, is basically continuing to do great science and then translating the findings to society, as I just said in my earlier uh, answer. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip one because it's really from Brad DeYoung, just because it's really a topic for tomorrow. It's has to do with uh, infrastructure, new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Uh, so continuing with the science type questions, it said, you, this is from Tuba, you talked about the importance of scientific ocean drilling to improve our climate models. Are there examples of current forecasting models or other tools that are used in decision making that have been improved thanks to IODP work? Well, I mean, here I make the disclaimer that I'm definitely not a climate scientist and there are many in the rooms that, that can answer that question much better than I can. But I did mention the IPCC report where IDP data and records and findings, right, um, are part of the thinking and the forecasting that has been done there. Um, in the first IPCC reports, not so much, but scientists realized that actually the pale climate record is key in understanding future models. So in the, in the next IPCC report, IPCC reports more and more of those records got included and in the last IPCC report, it actually had a substantial impact. But on the specific question, how they exactly are incorporated in climate models, I cannot give you the answer because that's beyond my expertise. Okay. Um, there, there was sort of a, a related question from Jason Link and had to do with uh, the same, same basic question, but um, uh, uh, how, how does scientific ocean drilling research specifically feed into current models pertaining to sea level rise. And I assume it's very similar, I guess, in the concept of the last. Yeah, one. and so so that I'm also following the chat and, and one of the specialists in the room said, yes, those those pale climate records are, you know, included in those models. So um, so I think the I think the answer goes the same way. I think the, the climate models, right, are important input into sea level rise. Um, models, but you can also think um, about the questions in where, you know, we sea level rise is not just only a global issue, it's also a regional or even local issue, depending on local geological phenomena. So if you read the science framework, there's a lot around how um, 
opening of gateways, uh, rising of mountain belts, um, increase in volcanism at mid-ocean spreading centers are influencing actually sea level rise that way. So the more like the, the longer term geological background drivers in sea level rise. So some of those information from IUDP and scientific ocean drilling is being used in sea level rise predictions. If we want to really have more regional and local predictions, um, and of course, many uh, climate records coming out of scientific ocean drilling have been used for sea level rise um, uh, predictions. Uh, one that's actually not from this current program, but there's a lot of drilling around the New Jersey shelf um, has been very important early on in sea level rise uh, signs and predictions. Okay, thank you. But there's another one that's... Um related to infrastructure, I'll go ahead and ask it because it's a little bit indirect, so it's kind of interesting. It basically has to do with if you if the JR goes back into the in, in industrial fleet, will that free up space or time on this vessels that might provide a future capability for IODP? That's, that's a very good question. I mean, um, working with commercial vessels, certainly if they are, you know, in the gas and oil industry, um, the time, you know, the logistics of that, and the scheduling of those expeditions is strongly correlated with the market. If the market around the world, I mean, the financial market around the world is doing well, and the oil and gas industry is doing well, um, you will see, you know, they have more cash and they really start to do more research around the world and actually start to um, schedule those vessels themselves. And so it's really hard that in those, you know, high times of the economy to get in onto the schedule. Um, Another way that we have experience is that you might be on the schedule, but if there is industry coming along and have more money to put towards a vessel, they can kick you off or down the schedule. And actually, if you are thinking of going out in December, now you have to go next year. So there's a lot of logistical and scheduling issues with that. Um, I think the, if the JR, right, going back to commercial, I think it has maybe, you know, between uh, four to six expeditions per year in it, depending on the length of each expedition. The normal expedition length of the JR is typically two months. And during the last IDP um, program, we, we typically done between four and five. Um, I don't, so I don't think it's significant. I think that's the short answer. Okay. Um, a question from uh, Leila Hamden. And it has to do with uh, the EE, US EEZ and um, if a future in a future framework for for IODP research um, would would this be prioritized based on or what would what would be the role of gaps in other words missing limited data pro, uh, regions would that would that be a priority do you think or should it be a priority for future uh, missions yeah and that's a very good question too. And I, I wanted to actually go back a little bit to one of the maps, right, that I showed. And don't have to backwards on my slides, but the maps that I showed with drilling locations, right? If you look at the map and you include all the DSTP, ODP, and IDP sites around the world, you would see you get a map with a lot of dots on it. But you have to understand what's behind those dots, right? During DSDP, it was all exploration of the world's oceans and the technology of coring in particular, it was not really that well developed. So most of the DCP records were spotty, but it's very, very important because we were exploring the oceans and a lot of good research came out of that from an exploratory point of view. During ODP, techniques started to improve and we started to more towards hypothesis testing, but still the techniques were not that great yet. And still we didn't have many continuous cores like we really need to address the 2050 science framework. Only during the last, say, 20 years during IDP, OT techniques um, started to really improve. And we're starting to get those kind of uh, expedition results that I showed you, like the one around Antarctica or Sumatra, where we really have beautiful continuous records that really inform our science. So having said that, what that means is there really aren't that many spots that we have occupied over the last 50 years that are of that high quality. The 2050 science framework requires it high quality or high fidelity records to really address the next generation of science hypothesis and questions. So there are many, many gaps that we need to go out and fill in. Some of them are in locations where DSTP already drilled. Some of them are 
where there's no drilling done before yet. But yes, it's very important to do that. And it's also important to do it, say, in transects or in grids, like I just showed you, right, with that uh, Antarctic expedition that was done along a transect. Doing the transect is important because it provides a, diff a different insight in any interpretation of the records that they recover. DSDP, as I said, was exploratory. They were basically you know, punching holes in the ocean and see what they would get. So it was not very systematic. So again, lots of gaps to fill with high fidelity, continuous coring, transects and grids needs to get done to really advance our science. Okay, thank you. I, I think we're out of time. There are a few more questions. We'll try to um, get those answered somehow. And uh, thank you very much, Anthony. It was very informative. And um, I know you'll be back in the panel in, in a half an hour, but we have a break now. The uh, panel will be, we, uh, the panel members are uh, Anthony Coppers, Adrian Lamb, Patrick Fulton, and um, Kathy uh, Morsaglia. And if you would all, uh, there's chairs up there in front of you. So if you'd all be back at 1130 and, and if the panel's sitting down, we can get, get started right on time. Um, otherwise there's a break. And I think there's refreshments uh, that way, right? <laughs> yeah. That way. And thank you again, Anthony, and we're all really appreciated. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear us clap. That's going well. But what I see is the current functional reality of U.S. drilling, and I offer four immediate steps to ensure that the U.S. can maintain its leadership position in scientific ocean drilling. Uh, I also shortly mentioned those earlier in my presentation. So next slide. We all may have seen the great outcome of IDP Expedition 399 earlier this spring, achieving the remarkable and often unimaginable goal of drilling 1.5 kilometer into the Earth's upper mantle. Some say that one would always stop on the top of their game, but I would argue otherwise. This extraordinary success was the clear and single outcome of decades of technology and skill development by the ship owner and their drillers, by the Joseph Solutions Science Operator at Texas A&M and their skilled drilling and locking operation supervisors and technical staff, and their advanced technology development of drill bits and coring strategies, but also by the scientists who know better who now better understand where to best drill for the most sought after science results, often based on decades of previous scientific ocean drilling results. So only after decades of persistent pursuit, we have reached this most critical science goal. This example, however, shows that it's the worst possible timing to retire the JR when it is in such a great condition and is actually functioning at the top of its game. So next slide, please. Given the large gaps in our science capabilities and opportunities now that JJR is retiring in 2024, it is in my mind of the highest priority to put into place as soon as possible in fiscal year 24, a university-based program office to guide and carry out conceptual design for new and improved global ranging riseless vessel in the United States and, what, and whatever follows afterwards in this lengthy process. We cannot afford to lose any more time of this overarching priority. The science will be impossible or severely limited, was discussed earlier today, and I think you will see more examples later in this panel and over the next two days. The community in scientific ocean drilling is massive and highly collaborative and highly transdisciplinary. I already showed that earlier this morning. Keeping it alive and kicking is the second priority in my mind. Therefore, I suggest that USAP, the US Science Support Office, and USEC, the US Advisory Committee, remain in place and the function will be expanded in scope. I will give a few examples of what is needed. First, triple the Schlanger Fellowships each year. These highly coveted and competitive fellowships are mostly for PhD students and postdocs and result in rather impressive results. This month alone, one paper was published in Science, and one in nature by two Slanger Fellows from the 2022 cohort. Second, USEP and USEC should organize at least once per year a large 100 to 150 person community workshop to help chart out the future of scientific ocean drilling programs and to chart out future science needs relative to the 2050 science framework. USTEP in particular is also leading many outreach initiatives for IDP and they should be expanded, expanded over the next years as well. 
my previous presentations and the Q&A, I basically fell short on that answer because I was focusing on the JR operator and not on USAP, which is actually providing most of the outreach efforts in the US and has gained a lot of steam over the last two decades. And third, expand USAC membership to better reflect the community by increasing involvement of early career scientists and transition them into next generation scientific ocean drilling leaders. Finally, USAP and USAC will be critical in my mind in re-establishing international partnerships and any engagement efforts around scientific ocean drilling and the 2050 science framework. Ninth, next slide, please. The third priority, next slide, please. Yeah. The third priority would be to put into place again in fiscal year 24, a new US MSP style offers to help scientists with logistics, procurement of larger commercial vessels and icebreakers if needed, and programmatic international collaborations and operations. We're starting to touch on this. It's very complex um, scenario. It's very important to have such an office in place early on. The fourth priority is to resurrect again in fiscal year 24, the now retired ODP solicitation and program at NSF OCE. This will meet several goals. First, scientific ocean drilling will not unduly compete with other OCE core research. Second, this program would consider proposals for site survey expeditions, proposals using commercial platforms, proposals working with international programs such as IODP Cubed or the new China drilling program, proposals to work with existing cores and data, et cetera. Finally, in my mind, it will signal the priority of NSF in creating opportunities for early career scientists to keep their continued interest in and success through scientific ocean drilling real and actionable. And I will give it to the next panelist now. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, the next one will be uh, Adrian Lamb. Okay. All right, so with respect to how the U.S. can maintain leadership in the drilling community, one thing we can do is increase involvement of our early career researchers. So this includes folks five to seven years post-PhD, but also includes PhD students, and really including them on the co-lead or PI level on drilling proposals. And this could be drilling proposals on something like a land-to-shore mission, ICDP, MSPs, and other platforms, especially utilizing the U.S.-based ships, such as the UNOS fleets. Uh, next slide. Okay, oh, I can do it. So, ooh, right. Yeah, there we go. With respect to how we perceive the future of the drilling program in the context of recent reports, such as the Ocean Climate Action Plan, I do want to point out that a lot of the goals within these different documents completely or in part overlap with our strategic objectives laid out in the 2050 science framework. Many of the objectives in these other documents cannot be met in whole or in part without scientific ocean drilling. And I've got two examples here. The first is the last Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences report. One of the priority science questions is, what are the rates, mechanisms, impacts, and geographic variability of sea level change? From the 2050 Science Framework Strategic, strategic Objective 3, we want to examine variations in ice sheets, ocean and atmosphere dynamics, and sea level. So to answer the DSOS priority question about rates, mechanisms, and sea level change, we need to go into the geologic past and understand how sea level has changed in the past to better understand how it will continue changing today. From the White House Ocean Climate Action Plan, they state that climate adaptive marine protected areas need to be identified. In the 2050 science framework, our strategic objective one states that defining the conditions for and the role of life in the marine realm, something we want to do. Combining, defining the conditions for and life in the marine realm and identifying areas of biodiversity hotspots in the global ocean and the geologic past across analogous warm periods and similar climate states to those projected for the future links in with identifying today um, these regions that need to be protected or may need to be protected under increased anthropogenic warming. Okay, as far as NSF tip initiative, so there's a lot of economic and societal issues that are related to natural hazards, climate change, and changing biodiversity trends as well on the warming earth. And these are all core to further understand it within the 2050 science framework. Our strategic objectives in part are built around those. 
Those link with TIP's mission to address pressing societal and economic challenges. So as Anthony had already stated, we are at the top of our game regarding drilling and the ability to take on new challenges and new opportunities, recovering sediments and rocks from the deep sea floor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so this is a really great opportunity to train the next generation of our STEM workforce, um, connecting our early career researchers with industry, learning those techniques on the ship, also potential job prospects through being a part of a really large collaborative and international teams while they're on these ships, learning the technology and working alongside the techs. Okay, with respect to the current functional reality of the US drilling program and our relationship to international components of the program, I'm gonna speak for myself and from my view as an early career researcher in a new PI, um, having graduate students. International partnerships from our point of view are very strong. My graduate students and I are all involved with our international collaborators on major projects. Um, even within their theses and dissertations that they're working on, our international collaborators are key to their success. So the time is really now to increase partnerships among our international partners at all levels. Um, there's a really pressing need today to obtain more sedimentary archives from around the world ocean that are more complete, that go deeper in time, to continue inferring how climate change of the past affected marine ecosystems, earth systems dynamics, and how in turn these changes in the earth system will affect us today, again, under increased atmospheric CO2. One last point I wanna make is it may be useful to encourage our early career researchers to go abroad and really forge collaborations um, and build collaborations and relationships with our international partners. And these collaborations and hopefully the networks that they create will carry forward over the decades without riserless drilling. So this would require strong financial support for our early career researchers, and we need strong infrastructure to support the next generation of ocean drilling scientists. So again, echoing what Anthony said, keeping with USIP and USAC and increasing participation of our early career researchers and increasing and expanding opportunities for them to go abroad, learn the drilling systems in these other countries, and network um, with our peers and their peers and colleagues. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adrian. That was a great last point too you made. Uh, next person is uh, Patrick Fulton. Okay. Oh, that's mine. You want to go instead, Kathy, or? Oh, I, I can. Sure. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Kathy, if you're, you're already up. Start. Yeah. Start. Okay. <laughs> so, I uh, can you? Am I projecting enough? Sorry. <clears throat> so, I'm Kathy Marsalia. I'm a professor at the Department of Geological Sciences, California State University, Northridge. Our university only has bachelor's and master's programs, and I'd like to argue we're still a research institution. We're not an R1, but we are a research institution. I currently co-chair the IODP science evaluation panel. I'm the science chair and we'll end, we'll end the, the program through the end of the program. So I'd like to focus on two questions and I've outlined them there. They're written there. I'm not going to reread through them. Essentially, I believe that having a Joides resolution-like platform is the critical element for a leadership position in scientific ocean drilling. And I base it on the proposal pressure that, that through the years, and I'll be showing this in the next slides, that requires deep subsea floor coring in deeper water. And remember that petroleum companies and petroleum ships are used to drilling, but there's a difference between drilling and coring. And we do it best, I think, on, in our current IODP uh, program. Second, what is the current status? Uh, essentially of our interactions with our partners and through um, drilling proposals, uh, writing drilling proposals together, science evaluation panel membership where we work in teams and ship and sailing as shipboard scientists, we actually have a very um, excellent uh, interaction and I'll be emphasizing uh, that as well. So uh, Larry um, and uh, others have, have put forth the, and introduced the science evaluation panel. And I'd like to, down in the lower left corner, there's a highlighted area that actually says who we are. We're 50 
scientist uh, members that come from all of the member uh, countries. And ECORD is 15 countries, and we rotate. So when a proposal comes into the SEP, um, we look at those, uh, many of them pre-proposals, we look at them and we, we want to, to, to cultivate the best ideas on science. And so um, we take those pre-proposals, we nurture them, we provide information, we try to get them to the, what they need to get to the point of becoming a mature uh, drilling proposal. And I put the, uh, the um, science evaluation, the, the uh, cri evaluation criteria up there, I won't read through them, but every time a proposal comes through, it's evaluated by those criteria. And it's usually several rounds that eventually get it to the point, if you go in the lower right, um, you can see the time, those arrows are essentially submission times, and it takes multiple years often for a proposal to make it to a point where it eventually gets forwarded to a facility board. The, and that review is not only of, by the SEP, but also by outside uh, review panel. Once it, I, I've put a map up of the proposals currently at the JRFB, and I want to emphasize in previous discussions, we've had why aren't we drilling more around the U.S.? There are proposals there. Our ship path hasn't been in that direction, okay? And so there are uh, several proposals to date. There are 27 uh, proposals at the JRFB to be scheduled. I didn't put a map with the CIB or the EFB, the, the MSP or CHICU proposals, because there are so few. There are only seven uh, left that haven't been scheduled. Um, so I think that's important. And if you then go and look at the proposals that are currently being evaluated at the science eva evaluation uh, panel, you'll see that look at the number um, of of JR proposals, there's 21. And in both the ones at the facility board and also the ones being evaluated, notice how global they are, okay? They, they're they at all extremes. And a lot of them, again, are associated with U US uh, priorities. So we have also, it's important again to note that, that there are proponents on all of these proposals, multiple proponents. And we also have um, a, a number of them representing a multitude of countries. And so that's what that pro active proponent distribution shows that we have a, a great number of them are from the U.S., but we also have to work and play well with others. So again, the Joides resolution or, like platform is essential, and it's shown by the fact that uh, current proposal pressure is um, dominated by not only those at the facility board, but also those in process. And those have dwindled because drilling has um, um, ceased or will cease for the JR. So we, we see diminished uh, input from, from those proposals. Um, and the proponents and the drilling are globally distributed. And those interactions through science evaluation panel, shipboard experiences, and um, um, and et cetera, and proposals um, form important uh, bonds, I think, between and make us an international community. And I'll just end with um, a slide I showed as the background. It's I call it, we call it um, for those that sailed on um, Expedition Three Five Five One. It's the core wallpaper. So it's a wallpaper of core, and um, that expedition was was only made possible because of deep water drilling. And I'll say ultra deep, we drilled in uh, 7 4.7 kilometers water depth. We drilled 1.6 kilometers below the seafloor and we recovered an amazing 1.2 kilometers of core. That to me is a major accomplishment. Um, and that core on the right starts at about 40, over 40 million years and on the left to today, um, essentially sediment relatively recently deposited, that history is one of arc or subduction inception, the early sub arc, and then essentially that maturation of the arc, and then ultimately arc rifting, and then abandonment, essentially. So that history, the life and uh, the birth, life, and death of a magmatic arc. And it's a submarine system. So the only records we have of this are in submarine, cores taken from submarine 
um, uh, basins at the time. Um, one of the things, too, I'll emphasize here is that I've got a couple of papers that I started, uh, you know, one student, a bachelor's thesis, that's Ryan Waldman, um, whose thesis then blossomed because he interacted with other uh, shipboard scientists from Japan and, and European countries into a GSA bulletin paper. He's now a PhD student. Um, and then Johnson et al. was another in a collaborative um, um, thesis product that was, was added to in terms of the petrology. And then a third one. So even though I'm at a, again, a, a research-oriented uh, situation where we're piecing together things rather than having a PhD student um, do, the, do, the, uh, do the project as a, as a whole. So anyway, I, I had to toot my horn a little bit, but thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll continue with uh, uh, Patrick Fulton. Great, thank you. Um, so I really think that the U.S. needs and can benefit from scientific ocean drilling now more than ever, particularly in relationship to climate and hazards, which are societally relevant. And I'm going to talk about the hazards part, which was identified in the previous decadal survey as one of eight priority science questions. Um, and I think with technology advances, particularly within the past 15 years, the experience of ocean drilling, all of us here in the engineering associated with it, and the societal need um, for these topics, that we're positioned to actually make some big advances. But we need a drill chip and a facility to actually do it. Um, I think that scientific ocean drilling is aligned with the broader ocean science community objectives. For instance, SC4D, a community-driven kind of uh, science initiative to understand the limits and possibilities of predicting subduction zone geohazards, broad community of utilizing existing uh, ocean science infrastructure, seafloor uh, instruments and other things. Um, and I don't know if I have a mouse here, but it's hard to see the label in the bottom there, but those things in the bottom there, um, you know, um, there's uh, fiber optic cables and other things. Down there, it says new cores and new subsea floor observatories. It's integral, scientific ocean drilling is integral to the science that wants to be done to kind of address these big things. And I think it's because this broader community understands oh, that ocean drilling is more than just collection of shallow sediment cores. It's a lot of things that can really help address uniquely a lot of these hazard questions, particularly related to earthquakes and tsunami. Deep cores in fault zones, we can have shown that if you look at the fault itself and you can look geochemically or mineralogically, you can sometimes see evidence that that fault got toasted. It got heated up by hundreds of degrees uh, there in the past. When we see that, that, how does that happen? From frictional heating from large, fast, slip across there. When we see that that is direct evidence that flat, that fault has the potential and has a history of large tsunamogenic slip. This observation here in, in Japan is kind of revolutionary in terms of having direct knowledge about how that uh, fault can have tsunamogenic hazard, um, helps hazard assessment considerably. Also, after big earthquakes like the Japan 2011 earthquake slipped a huge amount in the shallow part, did it slip all the, the way? Did it relieve all its stress? Or is it still loaded to have another one pretty soon? We were able, You can use logging, and you can take an image of the, the, the borehole walls, and you can see how it's deforming from trying to collapse. And that gives us a direct measure of the stress at that point in time. Um, and here, we were able to do that and inf infer that the shallow fault zone had zero shear stress on it one year after the earthquake. Incredibly important in terms of seismic hazard. We can also use observatories to see how the fault zone is changing and how it's starting to slip. I'll show you some other things later on today about some of the things that we've done with temperature stuff, but um, I really wanna talk about seafloor geodesy. And this is another community within the ocean sciences that has really kind of evolved and doing a lot of stuff that we are closely aligned with. Interesting in terms of, of hazard, we've noticed that many of the big, large magnitude eight and nine earthquakes have precursory slip before them. Unfortunately, we've noticed this after the fact. 
here you could see that there are some earthquakes that proceed and kind of migrate towards the eventual epicenter of these big, large earthquakes. This is from Brodsky and Lay, Science 2014. This understanding has been seen in other things in Antarctica and big ice sheets where they also see this precursor except where they can put instruments out above it. But most of this stuff is out in the ocean where we don't have observations. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in trying to figure out whether the fault is moving through seafloor geodesy. Also knowing where is it locked? Is the shallow portion locked? Uh, where is it ha experiencing shallow slow slip, relieving some of that stress or maybe stressing other points? There's a lot of ways, as you know, GPS doesn't work underwater, so you have to use different techniques. One of the most sensitive and essentially temporally highest resolution methods to do this is with borehole observatories. Essentially put straws down into the sediments. And instead of measuring the water column and see maybe how the water column changed, you're actually measuring this, how the rocks get squished. I think of SpongeBob and you squish them and his eyes pop, pop out. Well, the pore pressure increases if you have slip moving towards your observatory, it increases. If the slip is moving away from it, the pore pressure decreases with it. And because we have a seafloor reference, it's really easy to remove the oceanographic noise, which is really difficult on the other uh, techniques. So here's an example from the Nankai Trough, two observatories here. Uh, I don't have a thing, but two observatories, one closer to the toe, another one. You could see after you remove the oceanographic noise, one of them goes down, the other one goes up. That's telling us it's moving towards one, away from the other one. This other one, you see it goes down, and that one is going up, and then it goes down. The slip is going towards that red one, and then it passed it. We can see this stuff um, in really high temporal resolution, and down at the bottom is ocean bottom seismometers in that same location, and what they are hearing in terms of little rumbles and things like that. We can see this thing when we can't see it with ocean bottom sensors right above it. We can't see this stuff at all from, from land-based stuff. And in the other case, we see it, you know, several hours in the observatories compared to the ocean bottom seismometers. From this, we can resolve uh, essentially how much slip and where it was going on the order of a centimeter of slip on these fault patches. Incredibly important uh, and useful information uh, here. So how do we maintain strength? Hopefully I've convinced you that this is important, relevant stuff. Um, there is a deep academic and public interest in this type of science. Um, but to train and retain the next generation of doing this kind of uniquely uh, specialized work, um, my students need a commitment to see that there is a future in this. They need a commitment to show that, you know, five, 10 years, 15 years, that, that what they're doing they're able to do it. And so I think that there is a process to do that. And I think that the best way to show that is start the process of acquiring a new ship now so that they know that everyone is committed, we're moving forward, there is a future here. And in that, involve the community, involve the scientists, engineers, and the students to inform the process based on our expertise, experience, and science need. We are going to lose a lot of expertise in this realm. It's I think the point now is just trying to mitigate that loss. Um, and by including students and others in this, we can start that knowledge transfer and excitement uh, now. Other things that Anthony um, mentioned were um, are also on here too. One is also, um, it was addressed earlier, but we need a commitment to support U.S. scientists on non-U.S. led drilling programs, IODP cubed, other efforts. And then um, also mentioned is, even though all the things I showed you are largely not possible with a ship for hire type of thing, an MSP mission specific platform, we need a drill ship to be able to do this stuff. But even if we're gonna try to do limited science with an MSP style thing, it's exceedingly difficult and extremely limited in capabilities, but we need a support office to do it. I also do things on, on land drilling projects, and it's not just that you can hire a ship or a drill rig and do something. It requires all the drilling planning, all the requirements of all the special components for coring and other things that are not standard. So um, 
the insurance itself is in the legal aspects as an issue all by itself. So we need an office. Otherwise, I think it will be impossible. But um, but I'm positive. I think we'll we'll get there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, we've got some questions. I'm not sure we captured all of them because it, they may have disappeared on my screen at least. But anyway, here's a couple of them. Um, one of them is more of well, it says, how will the um, decadal survey address how IODP has fueled major discoveries about terrestrial systems? And that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know how we'll, we'll know that, but uh, certainly if if uh, the panel has some suggestions how we can find that out, it's sort of an interesting topic for us. I'd like to I'd like to at least speak to that because sure. um, one of the places that we've drilled recently, and I was a shore-based sci scientist, <laughs> was off of Hikarangi, the Hikarangi margin. And the onshore portion of that margin was thoroughly characterized as a result of the NSF um, margins program. And so we, that allowed us to look at the sediment that had been deposited offshore and, and try to, fi we figured out, we think where it comes from onshore to allow the routing system. So that connection, has been made at least in one of the, the drilling areas that I've worked on, and also in South Island, New Zealand, 317, and elsewhere. There are a lot of places where any place where there's clastics to try to connect the dots between onshore geology and offshore geology and sedimentation has been made, I think, uh, uh, very nicely in many uh, ODP, IODP uh, expeditions. Thank you. <clears throat> I can maybe add to an example on drilling, you know, offshore to inform what's happening on land. So we can think about the dust records that have to do with wind and heredity on, on continents. The sediment cores in the oceans are one of the best archives to actually study those and have access to it. The same with understanding monsoon and their activity. Again, it's not easy to study those on land. The records in the oceans are more continuous and, and more helpful. Um, and another one that was like uh, Mitch mentioned that was the Indonesian true flow expedition that uh, went you know from uh, the seas around Indonesia all the way to the to the west of Australia and, and to the south there. And basically they were able to really put their fingers on when um, dry dry um, dry periods were really there in Australia, right and more wet periods and really try to map out, how uh, the aridity on a continent like Australia actually uh, develops over longer time frames. So there's a clear connection between what we do in the oceans and how it informs terrestrial systems. And in the framework, right, we kept we captured that aspect by what we call land to sea. Right, one of the enabling elements is to really focus on that that we both get records in the oceans and on land and combine them so that we can truly inform terrestrial systems. Okay, thanks. Another question is, um, it has to do with the existing core archive and answering, um, well, just things are jumping around here, and answering important questions for the scientific ocean drilling community. And I, I, I guess there's a report on that, but also any comments from the panel about how important is that archive and data for the questions that are, for example, laid out in the IODP 2050? Yeah, I think I can speak a little bit to this. So. There's this working group called Plyo Myovar. It's looking at the records from the Pliocene and also now going back into the Miocene. So they're pretty much looking at like 23 million years ago to about 5.33 million years ago. And there's a major warming event in the middle Miocene of that period um, that we think is analogous to future climate uh, warming scenarios. So we all intensively study that period called the middle Miocene. But the group's next focus is the early Miocene. There's not a lot of published data from that time period. Perhaps it's because it wasn't, you know, the middle Miocene was our big um, focus. But we have a lot of archived early Miocene age sediments in these core repositories. So even with new and emerging questions and new and emerging periods of time that we want to go and investigate, I think there's a lot of material in the core repositories right now that we can use to begin answering those questions about these different time periods that maybe we didn't discover or maybe we didn't investigate enough about. And that's not to say that all of our science objectives can be met by the stuff that's in the core repositories. We still need new data 
especially geographically, so spatial data and time data, because there are different regions of the world ocean right now that are still very under drilled and that we need to know more about. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Maybe one, one aspect here too is that okay. some of the science questions, you know, you cannot answer with what we have in our core repositories. I'm thinking in particular about geomicrobiology. These samples are, you know, not being retained, right? They're not being frozen to minus 80 in our repository. So, um, to answer new questions in that science field, um, you really need to get out with dedicated scientists that know how to take the samples on board, bring them to their own labs to actually advance that science field. Can I, can yeah, I add one thing sure. real quick? <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have been in a core repository, but the, when you go back through time, um, oftentimes when you go to sample, you have to scrape minerals and in some cases, scrape mold, slime, whatever. There's been studies done of it um, off the off the cores, and a lot of the times, also those cores may have been heavily sampled prior to that. So what you you don't have a lot left, especially of like critical intervals. Those are hot hot tamales. Everybody wants to have one. Sorry, I'm from the Southwest, so our, uh, California, where things are hot, they grow chilies in my area. But also, um, it's important to make connections. So, for example, that core that I showed you, that last study, it's actually connecting core data that I collected as a PhD student still, um, my effective postdoc back in the Izuban and Forearc. We're connecting up and trying to connect it to that rear arc scenario for that rifting history. It's the only place that we can do that comparison. And remember that that core is only five centimeters wide. You're, you're, some places, whole parts of the ocean have a record that is only five centimeters wide. That's amazing. It's a straw. I mean, it is essentially a straw. Um, and the number of holes that have been drilled is so minimal compared to the number of holes that have been drilled in my in Ventura County, where I come, where I live, um, in in the oil industry, so it's it's just it's 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 where we're we're essentially going where no people have gone before in many er many areas. I I feel kind of passionate about that, so I'll be quiet. So a question from uh, Shelby Walker about the um, the the um, uh, how how does ocean drilling in the future? translate results. Um, how, how could a future program support transitional efforts? Meaning, I, I, I assume for the general public and uh, policymakers is what the uh, gist of this is. Sure, so I think, um, you know, another thing for the future is to put more investment into broader impacts um, and, and, and public information about this stuff. Uh, I know that there have been lots of efforts to try to communicate these things, particularly related to hazards, to um, to century policymakers and people that are making assessments, going out there and looking at the hazards um, themselves and trying to make um, decisions. Going to places like Cascadia and talking to the community and presenting our work there, uh, so that uh, even though the general public might not care about the specifics of those things, I think that they trust uh, government or whatever, or have better uh, trust that, that scientists are working on the problem. And um, even when they come to that, it's exciting to them. And if they, can, if they learn nothing more than essentially what to do during an earthquake and what to do in a tsunami and to go rise to higher ground, I think that that's a lot in itself. But I think that we can do more to try to um, communicate this with with stakeholders. And I'll add to that point too. Um, so I really think, and this goes off both of the question that was asked by Shelby, but also in the Zoom chat by, I think Carlos posted a comment in here about um, science students needing to see perceived commitment investment to decide to continue a science career. So I think there's also this pressing need to continue expanding e education and outreach within scientific ocean drilling on everything we do, we've had really strong an ENO office in the past and today. Um, so again, expanding that, but also the professors that use this data in their classrooms or teach using scientific ocean data, perhaps getting even those of us who are in the classrooms involved more with teaching our students about scientific ocean drilling. 
So one example from this past semester is I ran this little seminar. It was called Science Communications for Scientific Ocean Drilling. And I had five leaders within the ocean science community come and speak to the students. Um, one that wasn't though, about science communication with respect to scientific ocean drilling. And each of them summarized a leg or previous expedition. And they summarized that in general langu language uh, for the general public. I'm the co-founder and um, co-president of a nonprofit called Time Scavengers. So I leveraged that resource too, to put their blogs on the website. One was just released on Twitter today. Um, but to also work with other people, like there's these folks at Flyover Country. It's an app that you can download and it'll show you your, you can download your flight path, path or path or input that, and it'll show you important geologic features. So we're inputting that data into Flyover Country so that folks that do international flights or they're on cruises can actually see in the ocean where these different scientific ocean drilling sites are, and they can read about them and what we've done. So it's a, it was a very simple thing that I did. Um, I did this with upper level undergrads and graduate students. It was low time investment, but it really felt like high payoff for myself and the students. And I think for the folks involved. So simple little things like that, where we can get our students invested in science communication, um, but also the importance of scientific ocean drilling, I think would be incredibly important to again, help train them and bring them into this community and make them feel like they're invested in this as well. So maybe I can ask you something too. I think when Shelby asked about the translational efforts around the climate, right? The one thing that really happened over the last years is the IPCC panels, you know, proactively reaching out to pale climate scientists on the panel or maybe, you know, related to it. And those actually pulling all the records from scientific ocean drilling and helping, right, in the writing of that report and actually making that translational step from the fundamental research that's done with IODP into that IPCC report. I think uh, Patrick was mentioning, right, the other initiative, the around the subduction zone uh, hazards. I've got the acronym from it now. Um, but I think that's another group, right? That to get, you know, that's, that's where translation will happen too because of their vision and how they want to pull together data from multiple sources, including scientific ocean drilling. That's another mechanism in which fundamental research outcomes from scientific ocean drilling gets translated into a hazard kind of um, products, including maybe policy or, or otherwise. Okay, um, let's see. Tuba had a question about uh, the, the source of the data that you showed, Patrick. Uh, was that JR or um, uh, what, what's the, what are the capabilities of the JR to um, do the kind of ops to, to get the kind of observations that you showed off Japan? Sure, certainly. So um, in 2018, in Expedition 375, we uh, installed two observatories in the Hikarangi subduction zone. We just went back after five years of data and collected that in, in March. Uh, of this year, we'll present some of it at AGU uh, related to slow slip events. Um, but how I read your question a little bit, um, I didn't mention this, I said it, you can't do a lot of this stuff with MSPs. Um, for some reason, a lot of these faults and mega thrust things are correspond with deep ocean trenches, of course. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is in deep water, deeper water than you could do with, a, um, you, know, two, you know, two and a half, three kilometers. We've done things with the, the Chiku at even greater um, depths, but we've done things in Costa Rica and in and, 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 and other places, New Zealand and, and other places with observatories with the JR. Um, uh, two and a half, three kilometers uh, with New Zealand. But the other bit with, especially with the C4 Geodesy part of the observatories, those things need to be installed somewhere around 300 meters below the seafloor. So even if you had a rock drill or something like that, you're not going to be, or if you just plunged it like a lawn dart into the seafloor, you're not going to get uh, deep enough to really get the signal that you need. Okay. Uh, this question um, has to do with uh, U.S. scientists going on non-U.S. drilling vessels and um, how they can be supported. And is an open data policy a requirement for NSF support of U.S. scientists to go on non-U.S. drilling vessels? And will U.S. Uh, support if there is no open data policy? And maybe that's an NSF question, but is it okay? Anybody on the panel know that one? Well, well I think the, uh, the first part, the open data policy is a requirement. That's clearly the case. I think NSF has been clearly uh, championing that, that um, open data policy. 
It's also, by the way, in the 2050 science framework as one of the principal uh, design features of a future program. Um, if the US will support, if there uh, is no open data policy, that's an NSF question. My gut feeling is no, but they should answer that question. <laughs> Jamie, is the answer no? <laughs> Kevin just gave the answer. Oh, Kevin, okay. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> no. All right, no. Okay. <laughs> Quite simply, no. We've had that come up and uh, we've had the uh, decline proposals uh, and decline offers, I guess, for people to be involved in, in programs that refused to have open data uh, availability. So, no. So another question that may be for NSF, maybe for the panel, but it's uh, how should NSF and the community address legacy cores as a non-renewable resource? It's, it's essential to ensure equitable and science-driven access with better coordination and balancing of current and future needs. And uh, I don't know if the panel wants to handle that one. Well, I, I've seen a lot, a lot of core in the repositories and I've been to Bremen sampling as well as, um, and the old DSDP cores back in the old days, they were also transferred and um, I think it's important that we not mine away our legacy uh, for whatever the flavor of the month is, uh, because you have to leave something. You don't, you don't even know what the future questions will be or analysis techniques will be. I mean, to me, the archive should remain the archive half, but that's my own personal preference. Um, however, or at least a quarter of it, <laughs> Something, there's got to be something. There can't be a gap. I mean, I had a gap underneath my house when I did the stratigraphy and geology 101 of my house because of the coal had been mined and I left it and I got a bad grade on my project because I left out part of the stratigraphy. I was like, well, it's not there. Um, but I think that, I think it's important. Um, those legacy car cores, are things to go back and look at that we won't get again. We're not gonna go, very rarely do we go back in the same area and drill. And you can count, I think, on your hand, unless it's at like, what, 504B, where you keep going and going and going. But, but it's really important to have those because, because they are so rare. The coring is so rare across the globe. Okay, I guess the question really is then who, how, where in the IODT, IODP program is the responsibility for trying to ensure this? And, and, uh, or is this an NSF? Well, well, no, there's, there's already, there's, there's something in place already. It's called the, uh, of course, each of the repositories are run by, you know, a curator that those are professionals that know how to, you know, run a, a core repository. And then on top of that, there's the curatorial advisory board that actually oversees um, questions, right? If there's, you know, if, if people come in with, a way to big request for samples, right? Curators will typically signal them and the curatorial advisory boards will take that in consideration and look at those things. So there is equitable use of the course in particular, of course, that are in high demand. So there is, um, there is policy and guidelines and there's an organizational uh, structure in place for decades now that has been functioning quite well. Um, and so I think that's definitely something that needs to be continued um, uh, for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to? Okay. I think it's really important that the this group understand that the deep sea drilling program, ocean drilling program, and JR Cord IODP cores are the property of the U.S. government collected either by contract or under cooperative agreement with stipulation in the cooperative agreement that they are that they, they, they are owned by the U.S. government. According to the American Competes Act of 2011, NSF is required, legally required, to preserve and archive that core as a U.S.-owned collection, period. Okay. Um, there's a question here. We may get into this more tomorrow, but it has to do with hard rock drilling and uh, without the JR. And um, uh, are there other 
Besides the small seabed drills, tiny and shallow holes, are there other commercial options for hard rock drilling that any, anyone on the panel is aware of? Oh, well, I think, I think in principle, most, most commercial vessels could potentially drill, you know, rotor, rotor in drilling. Um, but what I, the, the point I made earlier is, you know, that's typically not what they specialized in. So drilling actually into a hard rock is not a very easy thing to do within the oceans. I mean, if you do it on land with a diamond drill bit and, a, and an on land drill derrick, it's much easier to do when you get really good continuous core that way. In the oceans, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult to get really good core, and um, and as we said, um, you really need to drill down quite deep into the basaltic basement to go beyond any of the altered top section, and so you know you need to go at least 150 or 200 meters uh, before you get into the place where you get actually materials that can be used for science or can be used for geomicrobiology, um, and yeah, so small seabed drills. Indeed, they're different. They have much smaller diameter cores. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's hard to drill in those environments, and so they're not necessarily that great to do. So I think there is options. The question is, is the quality, right, and the depth that you achieve with it sufficient to answer your question? Okay, yeah, and I was, I was, I was going to, I was going to add one more thing. There's hard rock that's igneous rocks basement mm -hmm. and then there's also hard rocks that are sedimentary rocks yeah. and sedimentary rocks can be harder and even more problematic like chert intervals where you're you're essentially drilling soft than hard than soft than hard so there's a lot of dynamics that go on that our expertise currently on the jr that that other ships won't be able to handle yeah i was also told that um this is going to come up again tomorrow, so uh, I think Becky's going to talk about it tomorrow as well. So we'll get back to this. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Another question is: um, um, Well, it has to do with diversified funding streams, and uh, we've talked about the international ones. And, and this question had to do with um, other agencies, and mentioned at NASA, possibly USGS, or are any of these other. U.S. federal agencies interested in, I know they're interested in the results, but are they, do they ever contribute to the drilling missions um, in any significant way? And I guess that's a question for NSF really than the panel, but if the panel first has any comment on that, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I can speak does. a little bit to this and it may be a little off topic from the question, but regardless. So there is this big um, NSF funded, well, some part of NSF funded um, project called SWACE 2C. And it's a group of scientists that are going back to Antarctica to redrill and look at records and how Antarctica has changed under more than two degrees of warming by looking at analogous warm periods. So um, actually my postdoc supervisor, Molly Patterson, who's now my colleague at Binghamton, is one of the co-leads on this project. So she has leveraged um, ICDP, the International Continental Drilling Program, their funding, so they do have funding for up to, they have up to 1.5 million for a project and that provides the drill, the drill string and for that project. Um, but she's also leveraged money from other places as well, such as NSF to help with these big drilling projects. So I just wanted to plug that because, you know, there are other programs. So if anyone's thinking of doing like a from sea to land, land to sea kind of drilling thing using ICDP, they do have funding. Um, and she's been really instrumental in getting funding from that project um, to also achieve her drilling efforts. Um, so these co-mingling of funds is definitely something to think about and something I think is absolutely doable. Yeah, I can give uh, one other example here. It's actually an expedition that, did, that didn't get uh, scheduled because uh, the JR was um, not living up to the standards of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico um, in, in, <clears throat> in, in hydrocarbon. Yeah, hydrocarbonate um, region, but that was actually an expedition where uh, the PI team were bringing in funding from the Department of Energy (DOE), and um, so that clearly that was potentially, you know, a collaboration like that that was cross-agency. Um, NASA hasn't really been involved that much yet, although in the science framework, we've been starting to work with NASA and other space agencies because they are interested in. Uh, testing out instrumentation in extreme environments, 
and uh, with the JR like vessel, you know, you can drill very deep in extreme environments, whether it's acidity, whether it's temperature, whether it's pressure and kind of stuff, but they can actually test out instruments that would bring, you know, out in space. Um, so they, they, are, they, were, they are interested in that, and we had some uh, initial work with them relative to the framework. Private sector entities have been involved with the JR in the past as well. Um, you know, Mitch mentioned the CPPs, right, which are other countries providing additional funding to help with expeditions. But they also, early on in the program, they had some commercial uh, expeditions, which also helped uh, in that sense, uh, you know, with, with the budgeting uh, of the JR. But that was only, as far as I remember, one time over the last uh, decade. So also, um, there was also part, part of that question had to do with private money and, and then another, another question had to do with that, particularly in reference to ocean drilling relevance to carbon sequestration research. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, carbon, you know, carbon removal has been one of the topics in the, in the 2050 science framework. We, as a community, we so far, haven't really worked towards that question, but we, of course, we recognize it's, it's important and we recognize that marine carbon dioxide removal is a key feature in other funding agencies, so NOAA, DOE, our, our, and, but also NSF, are very interested in marine carbon dioxide removal. And knowledge from scientific ocean drilling, either in our core repositories or in future expeditions, could really help with addressing that and um, has been uh, very um, much involved. There has been a proposal in the system uh, maybe five years ago that was looking at the storage of CO2 in, uh, in the North Sea and to the, to the east of Scandinavia in certain, certain aspects. That was a rather, uh, there was a multiple expedition uh, kind of proposal that in the end didn't make it through uh, to the uh, SEP system. But you know, people are thinking about it, and scientific ocean drilling is is important to contribute to that as well. Can I say something? Um, drilling is complex; it's complicated. My experience is that a lot of other funding agencies appreciate the science with it, but they don't know how to handle funding drilling, and and that's why having a facility or NSF supported thing that knows all the intricacies of how to do all the contracting, insurance, and all that stuff is important. I've found that private foundations are really interested in funding the science after you go and collect the data. Other funding agencies will fund the science afterwards, but getting out there and doing it uh, requires an organization. Um, the other thing about CO2 sequestration, I think that this is another translational benefit of the scientific drilling program, um, is that moving into the future or the now, we need um, job skills and stuff related to drilling into hard rock for geothermal stuff and for CO2 sequestration. I know that my own students, six of the last students that I've had, uh, five of them are now working for geothermal companies because they learn things about drilling and how to interpret data from the experiences and things that we've learned in ocean drilling. So really quick, that follows TIP's mission, right? The NSF TIP initiative, getting these students within these other companies in the technology. Yeah, I think the last question that we have time for is, um, again, we've come, come uh, talked a little bit about this already, but how should NSF support retention of the extensive technological expertise and knowledge gained during prior scientific ocean drilling through, this hi through a hi hiatus? So that future scientific ocean drilling activity is not compromised, and I, I think we've heard some of that, some about something about this. But uh, anybody want to elaborate on the panel on this question? Well, we well I, I, we'll get started on on this. I think you have to first realize where that expertise resides, right? I mean, we talk a lot about the science. Of course, scientists know a lot, but they know about the science. But the drilling operations—that's different. So the current expertise resides where it actually. <clears throat> the owner of the JR, who actually is providing the drillers. And those drillers have made their career, you know, not in oil and gas drilling, but in JR drilling, and by now are just tremendously experienced. And so by not having the JR anymore, that's, that's something that gets lost. 
and those drillers will be re repositioned within that company for other things and and they dis disappear from from us uh, almost immediately it's the same with um, the expertise garnered as the JR a science operator in Texas a and m they have of course uh, what's called drilling superintendent and lots of technical stuff that actually oversee the drilling on board the JR again that's an that's a skill set very specific to the JR very specific to developing all the coring technology over decades and and applying it with the goal right to collect the best possible continuous core in regardless of the kind of sediment or rock they encounter and so I'm actually a little bit pessimistic on this question. I would say it's going to be really, really hard, maybe impossible to retain it. So I think um, I, I would say if we get a new drill ship 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we have to go completely rebuild that expertise. OK, I, I, I can. Can I just ahead, jump sure, in one sure. quick? I just had a thought. I mean, I remember seeing um, uh, the Glomar Challenger parked up in the Bay Area. When it was when it was kind of abandoned, if indeed the JR gets retired, can we buy it? Can we use it as a training facility? Anyway, that's just my last thought. All right, okay. I, I think we've, we've run out of time, and um, it's time for lunch. That's the good news, and the staff is supposedly going to direct us to where the lunch is. Yeah. So the, the lunch is in the same room that the coffee uh, and, uh, and pastries were in. Um, we have sandwiches and salads, and we only have 30 minutes, um, and we need to stay on that schedule. Only 30 minutes? I repeat, only 30 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, so feel free to stay in that room and eat at the tables, or you can... thoughts about what I, what I heard this morning. Um, so my disciplinary background is not in ocean drilling. And so, uh, but still, you know, as an oceanographer, I feel like I have a lot to learn. And the talks this morning, um, it really set the tone very nicely. So I, I really appreciate the effort everyone put into it. It was great to see Mitch Mitch's overview. Um, of course, always great to have NSF here with us listening and Anthony's overview of the 2050 framework as well. Um, and maybe one thing that stood out to me is, um, you know, IODP, the D stands for discovery, right? And I think I would be the first person to argue that just discovery as a purpose for research is a wonderful thing, right? That's really what we ought to be um, advocating for. But in this case, I think what I am hearing is that this community is, is um, very convinced that there is a connection of this work to um, you know, decision-making tools to modern predictions of sea level rise to, you know, other, uh, there's uh, then the very rich uh, conversation in the Zoom chat about some of the ways in which this work really connects to issues that society is, is grappling with right now. So perhaps, though, we really have to make sure we connect those dots and, um, in, and not because that's the only way in which we can argue that this, this program should exist. Discovery is a reason enough. But if it is having those impacts, then we ought to be telling that story. Um, and so that's a challenge that I will pose to our committee. Um, the other thing that I walked away with, that Patrick, I think it was Patrick, somebody said, hey, you know, the general public you trusts that the scientists are doing good work. And and part of me, uh, you know, academia, science, you know, enjoys the social contract with society, right? Um, you know, we give you money, you do good work. But I, I'm feeling like just between us that that social contract is, you know, it's going to, it's starting to be rescinded. And I think it, it's an existential thing for us to to really do a better job making those connections and telling those stories um, because we do have the impact, so we might as well put it in front of people that that impact exists. So um, let's let's keep thinking about those things. Um, lots of information um, also in the chat, which I really appreciate, and we will we certainly will save all of that. 
Um, but with that, I want to launch us into the afternoon session. Um, so here we are really continuing the conversation about the future of scientific ocean drilling. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, two um, existing efforts to think about the future. Um, and then we're going to have a, a lightning session type um, panel discussion. And we timed this perfectly to occur between 2 and 2.45 when the sugar crash <laughs> comes in. Um, but this is going to be so fast paced, you're just going to, you know, there's going to be not a moment to really even um, think about um, sugar crash. So here we go. And with that, um, our first speaker, uh, Larry Krisak, Ohio, St Ohio State University. Take it away, Larry. Thank you, Tuba. Um, can we go ahead and go to my slides, please? It's empty back there. Oh, thank you. All right. Yep. So I'm Larry Krisak. Um, I am the present chair of the Joides Resolution Facility Board. Um, Mitch introduced to you this morning the idea of the facility boards for each of the three platform providers. Um, so I am the chair of the Joides Resolution Facility Board, or I'm going to slip and use the abbreviation of JRFB. So now you know what the JRFB is. Um, I was also the chair of a working group um, formed by the JRFB. Um, to explore um, some ideas that have been um, ruminating out in the community for at least five years um, about uh, the, the potential use of legacy assets going into the future. And so that's what I'm here to report on uh, to, to you about today. Um, so um, ocean drilling legacy asset projects, or what we call LEAPS, um, a new approach to collaborative research in ocean drilling science. Next slide, please. Hey. All right, where? Up in the middle of the page. Thank you. All right, so what I'd like to do is provide a, sort of a 35,000 foot uh, level overview. Um, then we'll talk about some details and then close with some, some thoughts. Um, so what are leaps? Leaps are a new opportunity, a new opportunity um, for a portfolio of standalone research endeavors without new drilling. So emphasizing the legacy as assets portion. Um, how would um, a leap di differ from a conventional sort of multi-investigator project? Well, um, in the, uh, the view of the, the JRFB's working group, each leap would be larger than a conventional single or multi-investigator project and meet certain other characteristics. So it would be um, larger than and perhaps more integrated than um, a, a standard multi-investigator project with uh, the goals of scientific ocean drilling writ large. Um, some of those characteristics include the ones that are listed here. Um, first with objectives that maximize the scientific return on legacy assets. And if you're not very comfortable with what legacy assets are, um, you were introduced to some of them this morning, perhaps without using those terms. Um, we'll do a quick inter intro to those in just a second. So maximizing return on legacy assets of scientific ocean drilling while addressing at least one aspect of the 2050 science framework. Um, that link to the science framework would not be required of, of just a, a standard multi-investigator proposal that would be coming to NSF. Um, the LEAPs would also be developed based on some of the enduring principles of scientific ocean drilling that were outlined in the 2050 science framework. I think Anthony mentioned a few of these in passing, but not in a sort of organized way in his presentation. So these include the bottom-up proposal submission and peer review process that Mitch introduced you to this morning, open access to samples and data, which was discussed and um, in some questions, uh, collaborative and inclusive international approaches, and with the goal of enhancing diversity. Those are all enduring principles of scientific ocean drilling. Um, the, a, a leap would be open to participation by the community, not just the original proponents, but opened up to the broader community in the same way that our um, science parties that sail on the various platforms may begin with a proponent group, but by the time you actually sail, it is a larger, more inclusive group that's doing the actual science, and with outcomes that strengthen the impact of ocean drilling science writ large. Um, one of the desires of the working group as we went through these discussions was to mirror as closely as possible 
the collaborative and focused nature of the shipboard experience for those of you who have been uh, for those of us who have have been fortunate enough to have that experience that includes the intense focus on research the collaboration that takes place on a day-to-day hour by hour minute by minute basis in a shipboard setting um, and the mentoring and professional development that take place in that same setting so what's the, uh, the origin of this idea for these sort of legacy asset projects? Um, the foundation for this concept um, arises from community interest and informal to semi-formal discussions that have been taking place for at least the last five years, often using the term virtual expeditions, but without actually having defined what those are. Um, and you'll see you, if you go back and look at some of the reports, um, like the, the next report in 2019, which was a report of a planning meeting for the U.S. community leading towards the science framework. There was mention of what was called the fourth platform concept, which was basically virtual expeditions. Um, the enabling element, one of the enabling elements in the 2050 science framework mentions big data analytics, which is another way of, of describing what in many people's minds were virtual expeditions. So about 15 months ago, the JRFB um, adopted an action item for a working group to develop to explore this concept and associated implementation issues in order to formalize, try to formalize it um, and point out steps towards actual implementation. All right, some of the folks um, who are here uh, are very familiar with what these assets in, involve, what the legacy assets are. Um, the, for those who aren't, you had a bit of an introduction to this this morning, but trying to lay it out all in one place. Um, the major groups of assets that are out there are core. We have about 450 kilometers of core distributed between the three repositories at College Station, Bremen in Germany, and Kochi in Japan. Um, but as been, has been noted before, um, both in discussions here and also in the chat, the material appropriate for the highest priority science is much less than 450 kilometers. There are designated microbiology samples that have been taken. By inventory, that seems to be about 1,300 samples, but they have been stored frozen, um, which affects the sort of science that they can be used for going forward. Data, um, the average IODP expedition um, accumulates about a million data points. That depends on how much core is, is recovered, but it's a lot of data and the associated metadata that goes with it, um, as well as a large number of core images and other kinds of imagery of the core. Um, there are also for some boreholes, um, the, in, the information that's collected after the borehole is drilled and instruments are lowered into the borehole. That's what we call downhole logging. That's not done on every hole, but that data does exist for some locations. And then we have open and instrumented boreholes. I believe this inventory is a little out of date. Um, so it may be up to perhaps 100 um, boreholes that have re-entry cones on them. Um, that simply means that there's a funnel sitting on the seafloor. You can go find it and then try to stick the straw into the little hole in the funnel. Um, but that doesn't guarantee what the condition of the borehole will be once you get into it. And there are many ways that boreholes can get complicated. Um, so there are these, um, these open holes, at least at the surface. Um, there are about 50 um, with observatories, and Patrick showed you a slide this morning. Um, there were a few dots there. If you take the whole globe, there are only a few dots there. And um, as he, he sort of embedded in his, his discussion, but I don't think pointed out explicitly, very, very few of those are instrumented so that the information is collected real time. I think Patrick mentioned a case where five years after the, the observatory was put into the seafloor, it was revisited with a conventional research vessel and the data were recovered. So you're not getting data every day um, real time from, from the, it's not like an ocean observing system for the most part. All right, with that as a little bit of an, an introduction, let's dive into some details about the JRFB working group's recommendations. Um, based on what I hope you now see as the breadth of the assets that are out there and the possibilities for using that, um, our agreement was that the definition for these activities should be broad and inclusive trying to have a, a big umbrella that lots of different kinds of research activities would fit under. 
We recommended calling these activities, as you've already heard, legacy asset projects, simply because virtual expedition had been used by lots of different people over a number of years to mean different things. And so rather than trying to back everyone up and make them agree on uh, after the fact um, on a definition for virtual expeditions, let's just start from a clean slate. Also, we felt that the, the name legacy asset projects was much more reflective of the broad and inclusive nature um, of the kinds of projects that could be um, proposed. I do wanna point out a couple of things that, that LEAPs are not. First of all, LEAPs do not in any way preclude conventional single PI or multi-PI projects. LEAPs are simply another type of project envisioned to be larger in scope, multidisciplinary, international. Um, they do not preclude single PI or multi-PI projects. Um, based on input from the community, as well as our own discussions, the working group recommends that the LEAPs be reviewed and endorsed um, in the same way that drilling proposals um, have been endorsed, reviewed and endorsed as Mitch mentioned, and I, perhaps also Anthony and Kathy. Um, but the body to do that is a body yet to be determined. Uh, perhaps it would be a, a collaboration between the program or programs that have active, active drilling pro platforms and the partners that are supporting work on le legacy materials. This is a, a, a question still to be addressed, but it was outside the purview um, of our working group. And thirdly, a review and endorsement of a LEAP does not take the place of review by a funding entity. So endorsement as a LEAP um, in some cases might help with review by a funding entity, but it would not take the place of that review. All right, in terms of characteristics of these projects that, that the working group um, suggests should be called LEAPs, um, some of these are a bit of a repeat. They should be a standalone research activity that addresses at least one component of the science framework, have objectives that maximize the return on the legacy assets without new drilling, and hopefully you now have a better idea of what those legacy assets are. They should have a duration level of focus and approaches that are appropriate for addressing the objectives of that particular LEAP as described in a project management plan that would be included in the proposal. For those of us who know, and I hope by now some of you are recognizing, we love the JR. For those of us who know and love the JR, we work in a two month mindset because that's what a, a JR expedition tends to run. But for LEAPs, there's no requirement that things happen in a two month time span. So the duration, the level of focus and the approaches should be what's appropriate for that particular project. So a one size fits one project rather than a one size fits all projects. Um, there should be an opportunity provided for members of the broader community to participate, thereby promoting diverse international and interdisciplinary science parties, but without recommending a prescribed approach to be used by all leaps. Again, this would be whatever works for that particular project as described in its plant management plan. Should be formally reviewed and endorsed. We talked about that already. And the, the, the hanging question about what that body would be. And then be implemented in a way that reflects the community-driven approach of scientific ocean drilling so that the leaps and their outcomes are incorporated in that overall structure um, and history. There was a big concern that leaps not be just one-offs, but that they should actually be incorporated into the broader structure of scientific ocean drilling. So the question often comes up, why would a group of people go through the extra step of being um, evaluated and endorsed as a LEAP? There are um, advantages to the project. There are also advantages to the community as laid out here. This provides an opportunity for focused multidisciplinary integration across legacy assets. So um, what might a LEAP look like? And there were actually some things mentioned this morning that would uh, um, in a few, in a year or so, perhaps, you know, fall pretty readily under the category of a leap. I am a paleoceanography, paleoclimate guy. So the examples that I think of, I'll show that bias. My apologies to my colleagues who will have other great ideas, but these are the sorts of things that easily come to mind to, to people like me. A synthesis of results and new data across the region. So I think there was a mention um, perhaps synthesizing data about deep water circulation history in the Atlantic for the last 40 million years. How has this thing called the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation behaved through times of different climate? And we had not talked about this 
uh, coordinating with the people earlier today. You can see that there are certain threads that we all tend to pick up on. Or secondly, a synthesis of results and new data focused on a shorter interval of time. Many of you know that we talk about these as time slices. So what happens during a particular time slice? One of the ones that's drawn a lot of attention and probably will continue to um, are the warm intervals of the Pliocene. And I think Adrian mentioned something about this, but the US Geological Survey has had syntheses like this going, um, looking at the Pliocene for some time. These have proven to be extremely valuable. They encourage open, uh, a leap will encourage open involvement and participation from the community leading to diverse science parties. It's an opportunity to mentor early career scientists. So those are all advantages to the community. What about advantages to the self? Because lots of us you know, do tend to look at what am I getting out of this? Um, we have heard that at least for some of our partners, uh, programmatic endorsement as a leap um, would open the doors to certain funding sources or other resources like supercomputer time. Enhanced visibility of project outcomes um, within the broader fabric of scientific ocean drilling and enhanced integration of those outcomes. So those are the advantages to the individual. In terms of next steps, we've been encouraged to work towards piloting the process of LEAPs with the existing science evaluation panel during the time that it remains, which is about 16 months at this point, because the SEP will go away with the end of IODP at the end of September 2024. So proposal guidelines are presently being developed with an eye on um, a submission deadline that would allow SEP review of LEAPS pre-proposals in January. It's an ambitious timeline, but it allows us to take advantage of the existing SEP structure to run this pilot. Probably not surprisingly, we would expect that the process would be reviewed and revised based on how this pilot run goes. I will mention that Japan is piloting their version of a legacy asset um, based project. Those are called, this is called the RECORD program. Um, it's very prescriptive in how the work is being approached, um, but it has characteristics uh, very similar to what's been described for LEAPS. And for them, this year's pilot project is a regional synthesis with additional data from cores and samples. To move this forward in the US, um, we need to establish some clear clarity to the path forward, particularly how um, this LEAP evaluation panel would act beyond September 2024 when SEP goes away. Um, and this is just my opinion, but if it's been my experience, if you wanna incentivize people, money is a great way to do it. Um, so as Anthony had mentioned this morning, if there is a pool of funds available within OCE Ocean Drilling, rather than within core marine geology and geophysics, committed to supporting LEAPs. Those proposals would undergo standard NSF review um, and um, award processes, but they would be competing for a designated pot of money. I realize I'm running short of time, but I do want to provide in, uh, a quick reality check on the assets that are available. So um, core, 450 kilometers of core, 90% or more of that is sediment and sedimentary rocks. Less than 10% is igneous and metamorphic rocks. Difficult rock types. And by that mean, I don't mean rocks that misbehave when you tell them to do something. I mean, the lithologies that are difficult to core and recover um, and difficult operational areas like high latitudes, continental shelves in some cases, other settings like hard rock drilling without a sediment cover. Those areas are significantly underrepresented. Uh, microbiology, I'll follow up on all of these in just a second very briefly. Bottom line question, can the science be done with these assets to match the science done with new material and data? The answer is no. I think no one would say that that's possible. Okay. High resolution studies using cores, and we won't go into the details here, but realize to get a, a continuous high temporal resolution record, you have to core that sequence at least twice usually more like three times, sometimes up to six times, so that you can put together pieces that are undisturbed from the various holes. So when you hear 450 kilometers of core, the prime material for high resolution studies is much, much less than that. You also heard about intervals that are relatively thin, relatively deep, um, and of great interest, just so you can see. Um, the core photograph over here on the side um, is a a photograph of a 40 centimeter long interval from this thing called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. 
55-ish million years ago when the world did a natural experiment at, at high CO2. The white that's in there is all foam that's been put in after samples are taken out so that the remaining sediment doesn't slide around. So it's still at the same, the right place in the core. You can see that this is an issue. Mitch showed you that slide of the sampling party with 55,000 samples. One of the four sites that was occupied on that particular expedition was a site that has been occupied twice before. And every time, because it has become a reference standard in paleoceanography, it gets, the whole thing gets to look like this. So they, fortunately, it's an area that's not too far offshore. You know, they pass through fairly regularly. So it's revisited simply to replenish that supply. That is not something that's doable for most of our other core materials. So bottom line, cores are finite resources. Um, the, the intervals of high interest are a small portion or have been poorly recovered. Microbio, um, because these have been frozen, uh, it's my understanding, and the microbio people in the room can clearly provide much better information about this than I can. That's suitable for gene surveys and possible metagenomics, so it can help you understand what bugs are there. But it's not suitable for telling you what those bugs are doing or at what rates. So they do not, they're not suitable for contributing to understanding of global elemental cycles. Data, um, data mining, anybody who's done any of that realizes issues with quality control. Um, and closing thoughts, I think I've touched on most all of this. Um, I hope you see this as an exciting new way to uh, um, have large uh, multidisciplinary projects using legacy assets, promising on several levels, but the science that can be done with LEAPS is not a replacement for science that can be done with new materials and data. The challenge is to, to successfully implementing LEAPS in the US, the nature and composition of any evaluation panel, funding, and then the nature of the legacy assets. Excellent. Thanks. Thank thank you, Larry. Um, there's actually a lot of questions that have been coming oh, in as you're speaking. <laughs> so that's partially why I was getting so impatient because I, I want to make sure we have time for at least a few of them. Uh, and you touched upon this one. Uh, what sort of funding model is envisioned for LEAPS? And you already told us about one potential way of going about it. But there's this question also goes further and says how much funding might go to each of the participating investigators? Like what scale are you all thinking about? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so really um, still an open question. Yes, the, and, and the funding issue, well, we know that some of our international partners have been talking about ways to um, essentially do the seed money for their scientists to participate. So that might mean... Um, you know, grants for each participant of say $50,000 to fund them if it's a repository-based project, to fund them to get to the repository, do the sampling, make measurements if it's an instrumented repository, come back and start to get some work done. Um, that's, that's a ballpark number we've heard from other places. That is actually quite, well, it's a little bit higher, but it's in the same range as the post-cruise support that's given to U.S. scientists who sail today. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, next question. Is there a good estimate for the amount of core material that remains for the most in-demand sites and depth intervals? No. Okay. Um, what, I, what I can tell you is that the, the curators, because uh, I ask them for information about this, um, Nope, sorry, going to back up for just a second so I don't give you the wrong number. Yeah, on this slide, the third bullet point down, during the international phase, more than 1 million samples have been taken across the three repositories, but more than 30% of those have been taken from only 15 sites. So um, that tells you that certain intervals mm -hmm. of great interest are likely to be already heavily sampled. Yeah. Then we get into the question of the archive halves, which to this point have been preserved. Um, some people would argue um, that with the proper review and oversight, these kinds of projects should be given access to archive halves, but that's that that was beyond the purview of our committee. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, okay, uh, what about this one? Would the LEAP model include the ability of additional people to join the program post-proposal? Yes, I, I'm 
I'm sorry. I should yeah, go ahead. No. No. It, no. It, it, so, go for yes, it. yes. And that was a point I was trying to emphasize with uh, the bullet points about open participation. So the recommendations from the working group um, follow sort of a concentric staffing model where there would be a proponent group that would establish a pre-proposal. That pre-proposal would be re reviewed once it's endorsed a workshop or something to inform and invite the broader community to participate. Um, and then you would have the actual project take place. So did that answer the question? I think so. Um, okay, uh, a, a question from my co-chair. What technology is required to re-enter boreholes? Um, well, I think, well, there are other people here who can talk about that much more than I can. It depends on what you wanna do in the borehole, I believe. So in a case like Patrick was talking about, I think um, if you want to recover from an instrument that's there, you may be able to do that with an ROV off of a conventional research vessel. If you want to go back into the borehole and continue to drill, um, then you have to come with a drill ship um, and you have to find the, the cone, which may be buried by sediments that have <laughs> piled up as you were doing your drilling. Um, it, it, it's doable. Um, but then there's there's no guarantee what the condition of the borehole will be. Mm -hmm. um, will LEAPS write uh, site reports and expedition project reports similar to those done by, for IODP yes. expeditions? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, in the interest of time, I wasn't able to talk about all of that, um, but the recommendation is that each LEAP, as part of its program management plan, would identify what their product would be and an expected timeline. Um, and that report would then be, we would hope, archived together with um, other publications from the long history of scientific ocean drilling. That's really the way of seeing that the outcomes get folded into this broader fabric of scientific ocean drilling. Right. Um, okay, I'll read this question by Jim Wright, though I think this, this is a question to you, Larry, but also really more a question to all of us, perhaps. Um, if the worst case scenario comes true and a riserless drilling vessel is 15 to 25 years away, should we consider a setting aside course for X number of years, knowing that technology will improve for better analyses? NASA did this with the Apollo material. So just that, a question. That's a really, the... really good question. And I think it's one that needs to be addressed by the community overall and NS, with NSF's input, given NSF's yeah. point in this. Yeah. Do you want to use the microphone? Yeah. Um, so a lot of this has been addressed in the last 20 years. I mean, originally you could only sample half of the working half. And then the uh, during the ocean drilling program was recognized in some places you needed to open up the entire working half. But in the, uh, the, in the IODP, I believe it was in the first IODP, the policy changed so that in some circumstances, the curators could agree that you could begin to sample the archive half, but a maximum of half of the archive half. So you're preserving, you know, a quarter of it in, in perpetuity. So. Yeah, very good. Thank you for that input. There are more questions, but we're going to make sure that we stay on time. So let's move on. Thank you very much, Larry. Let's thank Larry. <laughs> Okay, next, um, ideas around uh, benefits of overlapping cross-disciplinary ocean and paleo-ocean research priorities. Um, Daniel, take it away. Thank you. Uh, Zoe, are you back there? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Daniel Sigmund. Um, I uh, am here to speak, I think I was asked to speak as someone who works both um, within the broader oceanographic community and uh, with ocean drilling samples. And I wanna thank uh, Jesse Farmer for helping me to um, get the thoughts and the slides together for this. So the things I hope to quickly hit on uh, in the next couple of minutes are why we need the past to gain insight into the future, fundamental question. I'm a little bit orienting some of this towards the Ocean Studies Board as, as opposed to the people in this room, but why we need the past to get insight into the future, why studies of millions of year old material can provide insight into the near-term future, why these are indeed relevant for the near-term future. Um, ocean drilling's implications for other disciplines uh, and the near future. So I'm gonna give you uh, one to two examples, probably very, very quickly. Um, 
then uh, um, uh, make the point uh, that continuous paleoproxy development, which is due to activities and other aspects of uh, the scientific and ocean science community, um, the development of these proxies by multiple disciplines in ensures new findings from continued ocean drilling. That is to say, we do not need to come up with some great new innovation for ocean drilling, um, that we already have innovation in the framework of the, of the proxy development that's going on at sea and in labs today, um, such that really what the most important thing to do is to maintain the availability of, of sediment materials. And here I'm speaking specifically about paleoclimate and paleoceanographic activities, but we can broaden that out. Um, and then finally, I'll speak briefly about, or I'll mention some uh, changes and connections among paleoclimate, marine geology, and deep biosphere studies in ocean drilling. Okay. Um, so actually, before I move from this slide, um, starting with that first question, when we're studying uh, processes that matter for the, on for the, on for the future, for the near-term future. Um, we can study processes uh, in the lab or at sea, gain a process understanding, a mechanistic understanding. Um, we have models which can assimilate information and try to make predictions about the future. Keep in mind that those models are still have great technical limitations and um, are uh, uh, highly uh, uh, contingent on the tuning that is used to have them accurately reproduce modern conditions. Um, and then we have using available data of change over time. And if we're, then we, that breaks down into two categories, um, instrumental data and, and pre-instrumental data. And so here's just a, a beautiful example of data of a of study of the last 2000 years. So here only think about the last 2000 years uh, from the pages 2K group um, where they looked over time at, at uh, climate variability over the last 2,000 years um, at the at the centennial scale and compared that to the instrumental uh, data that's available. Um, now, the point they were trying to make about this is really interesting. My this is just one of many images I might show you, which uh, uh, make the point that what we have in the in the framework of of instrumental data is just so small with regard to change. We have really barely information about change in the in, uh, from instrumental data and adding data year on year as climate change proceeds is no way forward okay so pre-instrumental data are absolutely critical now some of you may be saying this type of resolution would not be available in odp uh, core materials from millions of years ago by and large that's true we're not able to get decadal resolution sometimes we are um, but I'm going to speak to this issue of time scale in just a little bit. Um, so uh, I sometimes hear um, new members of the ocean modeling community saying, what has paleoclimate done for me lately? Um, and uh, I just want to remind everybody that many of the major things that we have worried about that are not actually already occurring um, are due to insights from paleoclimate, paleoceanographic work. A key example is the discovery of Heinrich events. They're uh, tying them to icebergs uh, and, and to reductions in North Atlantic deep water formation in the North Atlantic and their climate consequences. This was, you know, if you wanted to find a precursor to this, it would have been uh, Stommel's uh, bifurcate, you know, two, uh, two stable states for an ocean circulation, but nobody was worried about any DW shutdowns until this kind of information emerged from paleoclimate. Okay, from paleo observations. Um, there is another role that uh, uh, paleoclimate data can take. This is over the last 400,000 years, the reconstruction of methane um, from ice cores, from the Bostock ice core. There's been extraordinarily beautiful work done more recently on methane. Um, but you know, what this record shows is higher methane during interglacials, lower methane during the glacial periods. These data have been really useful in ruling out um, uh, suggestions that have been made. For example, it's been proposed that methane, uh, uh, large methane releases might occur under global warming from uh, uh, permafrost. 
Um, it, we, while the paleoclimate data don't rule out this possibility under global warming, they um, are a strong check against it in the sense that in previous interglacials, which were warmer than today, we didn't see tremendous methane releases. And so it really, we really need to be asking for special conditions for permafrost methane release to be really important under global warming. Similarly, um, geologic carbon releases, methane releases, um, the, uh, as triggers for, for, for deglacial change, they have been ruled out from uh, the methane data. So one way of thinking about this, people often don't recognize the degree to which knowledge of the past is an enduring check on the hypotheses uh, that one has. Knowing what the past is, even though they, people don't notice, allows them to rule out ideas before they start uh, making their way into the broader community. So ruling out cases of cats sleeping with dogs. You can't see that image well enough. Um, okay, so we're looking at a, uh, you know, a next couple of centuries of a warmer world. Um, and paleoclimate is useful, but if you want to access previous warmer worlds, um, we, for the most part, with regard to some brief conditions during a few interglacials, we need to go uh, back before a million years ago. And that means ocean drilling. Okay, we can't access, access this age of sediments uh, without the ocean drilling program. Um, the the uh, more distant past is, in, is important for us, not only um, in the context of it being, having been warmer, but if we look at the climate signals and the CO2 changes um, that uh, are reconstructed for these past times, and this, uh, let's see, relative to the last 800,000 years, um, the signals are larger. Um, and so it's a, a, an easier system from which to derive uh, climate sensitivities to CO2 or albedo, um, just from that sense of the signal strength. But in addition, when you're looking at secular changes, such as they're happening over the last uh, 60 million years, uh, these provide simpler information on climate controls than studying glacial interglacial cycles. Glacial interglacial cycles are a, a wonderful system to study, but they are complicated by in, um, uh, extracting from them climate, sensi climate sensitivities to different factors is complicated by the importance of feedbacks, of multiple interacting feedbacks um, in driving glacial cycles. So these secular changes are some are 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 make make for a simpler framework. Um, while uh, when working on millions of years, one tends to study millions of years. Uh, it's been well shown at this point that rapid processes are recorded in deep time. This is uh, one of the this is the most famous example I would say from the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, an extraordinary event in Earth history that is our only real check on our basic intuition about how CO2 would be absorbed into the Earth system, basically uh, um, uh, 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 giving us uh, some ground to stand on when we think about uh, the coming future. And of course, the time scale of the event recorded here is on the time scale of thousands of years and um, uh, features briefer, more brief, pardon me, than even the dissolution event in the deep sea has been reconstructed from uh, PETM uh, materials. Okay, now I'm going to give you two little vignettes into sort of the connections that one that can derive among the different areas of ocean science with uh, paleoclimate studies. Um, the first I'm going to talk to you about is iron in the ocean. Uh, so over the course of the late 80s, late, late 80s, 1990s, our understanding of ocean biology, ocean chemistry was revolutionized by the recognition that large regions of the ocean, specifically the nutrient rich regions, such as the Southern Ocean down here, um, are limited by iron. This was done by uh, biological and chemical oceanographic work, um, uh, eventually leading to direct additions of iron to the ocean, leading to um, uh, testing of the idea that uh, phytoplankton would be fertilized with iron inputs. But it was a critical question as to what would happen on the large scale with uh, large scale naturally driven iron inputs. And specifically John Marshall, who, uh, John Marshall, pardon me, John Martin, who sat behind 
uh, much of this uh, revolution in iron knew that during ice ages, iron supplies to the um, to to the ocean and and atmosphere were from dust were greater. Um, and he proposed that the lower CO2 concentrations of ice age was due to those dust inputs. Fertilization of phytoplankton put forward uh, what is often known as the iron hypothesis for glacial and interglacial cycles. Okay. Now, um, I've I'm not sure how exactly I'm doing on time here, um, but to take you through some data from an ODP core, um, this uh, ODP site 1090, this is the dust flux uh, reconstructed uh, for the last glacial maximum. Um, the uh, dust flux at this core is shown in black below uh, with higher dust fluxes during the ice ages, he, the, pre, the last ice age here, the previous ice age here. It had been observed previously that productivity was higher during those times of high dust flux, which might be due to iron fertilization or might alternatively be due to frontal migration of, uh, in the ocean. Uh, but then measurements of the nitrogen isotopic composition uh, within uh, foraminifera shells, a new method that developed over the course of the 2000s, um, provided confirmation that in fact, these are changes in nutrient uh, concentration of the surface, more nutrient drawdown associated with the higher dust fluxes when productivity was high. It's very hard to explain these data without iron fertilization. And so it was the geologic record that provided confirmation of this process on the large scale. Now this links into many other uh, questions, both backward in time and forward in time. In terms of backward in time, if you look over the last 4 million years, 4 billion years, pardon me, um, we evolved from a low oxygen system to a high oxygen system. In this low oxygen world, there would have been much higher iron availability. And that means that a lot of the fundamental enzymes in phytoplankton, all organisms evolved at that time. And so when you, when you think about this from this perspective, uh, life has been uh, hooked, has been uh, um, suffered from its own inventions with oxygenic photosynthesis driving that rise in oxygen, that leading to a scarcity in iron when there used to be a lot, and that leading to things like iron limitation in the modern ocean. And from that perspective, the origins of life and atmospheric oxygen billions of years ago has influenced atmospheric CO2 climate and life now, including um, its variations. So this has connections across scales. Um, this, uh, this work on iron fertilization is also a point of comparison for proposals of purposeful iron fertilization. You can compare um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the observations of iron input, nutrient drawdown, and CO2, apparent CO2 drawdown um, with uh, people's discussions of purposeful iron fertilization. I want to stop here for a second and say the Southern Ocean, where uh, this work focused, um, is a really critical region for global, uh, for how climate affects the ocean and how the ocean takes up carbon into the future. And so it'll be, this is a, to me, a huge er area of priority for future um, sediment recovery. And we have very little material from the ocean drilling program from the Southern Ocean. And so I am uh, 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 shocked that uh, there would be a gap uh, that we've been talking about in ocean drilling that would, yeah, you can get the point there. Okay, um, one other example I want to give you here is on uh, oxygen deficient zones. So it's in programmed into a lot of people's minds that oxygen um, is less available under uh, warmer conditions. Um, that has been extended to the oxygen deficient zone. So uh, people have presumed that oxygen deficient zones would glow, grow under global warming. And indeed, there's been uh, uh, there have been a number of studies, high profile studies, that have observed a decline in ocean uh, a, a rise in these oxygen deficient zones over the course of the last century, and assume and 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 presume that this was due to global warming. Um, this has been picked up uh, quite frequently in the uh, the the public press. Um, uh, but when we look back millions of years ago, um, the story seems to be uh, somewhat different than that. Um, shown here is the last 60 million years, uh, uh, time proceeding in this direction. Uh, climate data up here 
Here again, foraminifera bound nitrogen isotope measurements. The green are from the Pacific. It cores near oxygen deficient zones. Their decline in N15, N14 ratio during these two warm periods of the past, uh, the, the early Eocene climate optimum, the mid Miocene climate optimum, uh, indicate that uh, this suboxic process decreased under warm climates. So the oxygen deficient zones shrunk during these time intervals in contrast to these expectations. And indeed, um, ocean models are now, I would say, coming around to this notion that this is actually how the system um, will respond. Um, now, you may say, oops, pardon me. Um, you may say, look, these are million year time scale changes. What do these have to do with what's going to happen in the next couple of decades or centuries? I would have two things I would say about that. One is if you see that little data point right there, that's from what's known as MI2, a uh, uh, thousand years time scale glaciation. So these changes are not inherently million year time scales. Maybe a better way to put this is among the most likely mechanisms for this reduction in uh, the oxygen deficient zones under warming um, is a weakening of the trade winds. And if that's the correct explanation for these changes, this can happen on a time scale of decades, of years. Um, and so just because a change occurs over millions of years does not mean that that change, the response time of that change is, a long, is long, right? Um, the, a lot of the things we can learn from the million year time scale will translate directly to the near future. Okay, sorry, I just spit on the microphone. Um, getting worked up. So uh, this is uh, 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 um, my and Jesse Farmer's effort uh, to um, sort of make a tabulation, we did it over the weekend, of tools, um, uh, paleoceanographic tools, uh, to look at different environmental parameters um, in the past. And uh, the development of these tools is largely uh, come from uh, uh, chemical oceanographers who were also paleoceanographers, sometimes just chemical oceanographers, but also pe people working in um, marine biology, in biological, in biological oceanography, in um, um, uh, marine molecular biology. Um, so there are a lot of new um, uh, tools available due to these other areas of uh, science and ocean science. Um, and we, we look at any one category. So this is for temperature, this is for dissolved oxygen. We have different proxies, some of which were established early on. We've been getting better at using them. Others are only, have only come along more recently. So this is IODP 2003, uh, the uh, Survey of Ocean Sciences 2015 and the Future Survey. New tools are coming online all the time. And so that, again, I just wanna emphasize that point I made at the beginning which is that ongoing proxy development, which does not rely directly on ocean drilling, is nevertheless providing new tools all the time that will mean that we can do more with uh, sediments that are recovered. And in this coming set of decades uh, uh, of global warming, it is critical, in my view, that we have the, sed the sediments available to apply this ever advancing toolbox uh, to understanding what the future um, has to bring. I, I have a few comments that are not very, uh, well, I'm going to stop here. Um, there is something to be said about the growing symbioses among paleoclimate marine geology and geophysics in, in deep biosphere, but I see that I'm already over time. So I'm going to stop. Thank you, Daniel. That was a whirlwind tour of some fantastic examples. Thank you very much for assembling that. Really, really great. Um, I actually don't have any questions right now. It seems like everybody's sort of contemplating all the good info that you've given us. Well, that's a good sign. So, <laughs> so maybe you can take a few more minutes to to talk about this um, oh, this okay. last thought. Okay, so there's always been a strong connection uh, between paleoclimate and marine geology and geophysics. Um, in the sense that, in, well, there are, it goes both directions, but the, the, what I'm often thinking about in this context is marine geological and geophysical processes determine um, ocean basin geometry, continental uh, locations, um, uh, the, the fluxes, um, uh, uh, ocean gateways, um, the fluxes of chemicals between the uh, ocean and the marine lithosphere, uh, 
con uh, mountain building and weathering. Um, and so it's always been a very natural connection um, within ODP um, to connect the marine geology uh, to uh, paleoclimate. The deep biosphere, though, as more and more work proceeds in this area, those connections are going to strengthen. And that's because um, the sedimentary materials are often um, a critical energy source for these deep microbes. Um, the pore waters, um, as well as the, set, as the solid material, uh, speak to, are, are, are um, critical for that deep biosphere. But then the deep biosphere is also going to affect pore water composition um, and help us to understand uh, the sedimentary conditions that are preserving our geologic proxies. Um, and so you can see this uh, proceeding as we look through this last set of IODP expeditions, where there have been more and more connections between the deep biosphere um, and the ongoing uh, marine geological, but also paleo paleoclimate work uh, on those materials. Okay, thanks. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so I will ask a question if, you, if you're okay standing up there for a couple more minutes. Um, you know, you're really good at sort of connecting the, the, the work that IODP is doing with, you know, all kinds of different arenas. Um, the one thing I've been more thinking about more lately has been um, critical minerals, um, you know, and how important it is if we're really going to go to a, you know, electrifier economy. Um, is there a connection there? To, um, is that something you've thought about? Right. Uh, I, I'd like other people to respond to that more. I mean, we've, we've got huge areas of the ocean where the, that are uh, the repositories for these critical minerals. And the, um, these are often the least explored environments from the perspective of paleoclimate, just given their very low sedimentation rates. We do know that there is paleoclimate information in nodules, right? And um, so there uh, should be some deep thinking about trying to connect uh, people's interesting, interest in recovering those nodules with the histories that are preserved um, within them. Um, and there may be, uh, you know, the, with this, with the, especially the rise of um, a cation trace metal isotope measurements, um, we may be able to get a lot more paleoclimate information from those kind of uh, metal rich deposits than we used to. Thank you. Okay, more questions coming in. Um, you've utilized many existing sedimentary archives for your latest work utilizing nitrogen um, and isotopes. Do you see a need for obtaining additional archives to fill key gaps in space and time? Oh, gosh. this uh, I'm depressed. I mean, so... Uh... <laughs> The, you know, a lot of the, um, we're, we have projects ongoing right now where there are discussions about who has the last bit of course fraction from these key cores in the equatorial Pacific, for example, that, have, you know, have been used to study um, the thermocline structure as a function of climate. We're already running out of these best known sites. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, the Southern Ocean, it's very hard place to sample. If I were to ask for any major innovation in deep sea drilling and ocean drilling, it be, would be to m more easily access polar regions. If that if I had one thing on my list, because we have, there have been a, 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 a number of very uh, um, productive ODP sites in the Southern Ocean, for example, but they, they are in number very few, and I'm sure they're extraordinarily depleted. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have, um, okay, and and so there are all these, there, there are these, there, one answer is we're already running out of material in places that we know well, right? Um, I have not done the thinking I should do about a dish beyond that that point about the Southern Ocean, specifically cores from closer to the Antarctic continent. Um, I haven't thought uh, mm -hmm. deeply enough about that. Okay, one more one more last question. Um, what are the most important outstanding ocean climate system questions that can be addressed by scientific ocean drilling and paleoclimate records? You mentioned improved reconstruction of high latitude change. Um, which uh, our, our questionnaire completely agrees with, but what else? Well, let me, you know, the, the reason that the high latitudes matter so much is these are the gateways to the interior, right? And so one of the critical questions is how will heat and anthropogenic CO2 flow into the ocean on what time scale and with what complexities under the, in the coming decades and centuries. Um, 
I think that there are, you know, um, but most of the surface ocean uh, is uh, the, the um, tropical ocean, right? And these places are of extraordinary en energetic uh, importance. And, um, you know, I'm, these are, these are questions that people have already tried to get a lot out of ocean drilling about, like changes in the structure of tropical thermoclines, not only in the Pacific, but also in the Atlantic um, and the Indian. Um, can I have like a week to think about that question? <laughs> you can have even more than that. Let's thank Daniel. Thank you very much. All right, and without a break or further ado, it is time to transition over to our um, our lightning panel. And the way we're going to do that, I'm going to invite the first five folks who are on our list: so Masako, Chijun, Adrian, uh, Chris, and Allison, up front to be seated in that order. And then Zoe, I'm going to ask you to pull up the the slides for this one. Okay, and while you all are doing that, so I'm going to keep time with my iPhone here, very fancy tool. Um, and so if you if you see me standing up, if you see me standing up, that means uh, you are within 15 seconds. If you see me walk towards you, it's really getting close. <laughs> You don't want to be tackled by a five foot one tuba. That's for sure true. Um, but thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we've, uh, we've told our panelists that they have two and a half minutes uh, to tell us about future sci uh, perspectives on scientific ocean drilling. And I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, and so without further ado, I think we can kick it off with Masako. Should I switch it here? Either way, yeah, sit here and talk is fine. Mike, okay. <laughs> All right, I really appreciate Daniel's talk that talked about the connection. So um, as a marine geophysicist, I do care about oceanic crust. So oceanic crust covers 70% of Earth's surface in, and it lies beneath all the oceanographic phenomena. Therefore, discoveries on anything about its origin, nature, behavior, enable us to address a critical science question like, what's the characters of subsea environment and how does it affect the global element cycle and the bi deep biosphere? I think we have been making progress in addressing this very question from reef to ridge to uh, subduction zones. Yet, it is very recent advances in our understanding of, for example, um, how a magmatically lower crust and upper mantle is brought up to the um, seafloor and facilitating link among um, biogeochemical processes within. The observations have been made possible by state-of-art multi-scale, multi-dimensional infrastructure currently available in the U.S. oceanography with which we have been able to collect interdisciplinary data necessary to evaluate um, seafloor and shallow subseafloor processes and also to image deep structures in oceanic crust and then even mantle. And indeed, in these efforts, intact continuous hard rock cores obtained from deep oceanic crust through scientific drilling <laughs> are the only ground truth to um, geophysical data and deep crustal imagery, invalidating our conceptions and models in geodynamics. Among uh, many, many deep crustal system studies, as an example, I would like to hear pose a currently unanswered, um, very fundamental question, plate tectonic mechanisms. How does it start and then continue to be operated? Do we know? I don't think so. A connector between past and present ocean worlds exists within the oldest oceanic crust in the Western Pacific, where today's plate tectonic cycle started mid-ocean ridges. An only combined technology of deep submergence, basin-wide geophysics, and ocean drilling can address this most fundamental question that define the planet Earth. 
It requires to obtain intact core samples and establish observatory within a kilometer or so of the ocean crust at six kilometer water depth. These numbers, one kilometer and six kilometers, should be a key metric of future ocean drilling and other oceanographic infrastructure in the US. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shi Jun. Uh, I'm a paleoclimatologist. I study um, past changes in the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, or the AMOC. As we all know, the AMOC plays a very important role in today's global climate. However, the IPCC report says that the, the AMOC will very likely decline over the 21st century, although they don't think that there will be an abrupt collapse before 2100 which is good. But just a paper published last week argues that a collapse of the AMOC may occur around the mid-century, and that certainly has caused uh, some quite, some major discussion among the scientific community. Um, but uh, really, whether it's 30 years or 100 years or even the day after tomorrow, chances are it will likely happen. And now the question is, how would the global climate respond to a collapsed AMOC? We know that AMOC has collapsed in the past, uh, as shown by this red curve in the upper, uh, upper left corner. On the right, I'm showing the climate modeling results um, that, that's showing um, that these past intervals of collapsed AMOC were associated with um, global scale abrupt changes in both temperature and precipitation. Now, scientific ocean drilling allow us to reconstruct how climate actually changed during those intervals, and that can help us to evaluate the performance of our climate models, and that can help us to uh, provide um, useful implications for the future. But there are also many other things going on at the same time in those intervals that may affect the climate, in addition to a collapsed AMOC, such as changes in solar insulation, CO2 concentrations, sea level, as well as the retreat of ice sheets from different parts of the world into different parts of the ocean. So we really need more high quality paleoclimate reconstructions to help us better characterize um, the complex um, uh, climate dynamics during those intervals to better inform the future. And my research echoes this priority question identified in the last decadal survey uh, regarding the link between oceanic processes and climate. I think it's still a very important question for the next decade, especially given how pressing our climate issues are right now. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Adrian's next. And those of you who are on Slido, I'm hoping to have a few minutes of time uh, for maybe a question or two to these five. So, so do feel free to put questions into Slido. With that, go ahead. So for the first time this year, the IPCC report actually had a section about Western boundary currents. And in it, they state that the multi-decadal variability of the strength and position of these currents and short records from direct observations can obscure the detection of any long-term trends. So subtropical western boundary currents are incredibly important to us today. They transport heat, moisture, and gases from the equatorial regions to high latitudes. They're places of high biodiversity and high productivity in the world oceans. They are paths that are followed by hurricanes, typhoons, and other strong storms because they provide the heat and moisture for these storms. And they have the power to impact local and regional climate and weather dynamics. So it's really important now how um, to continue exploring how they will continue to respond to climate change today and in the coming future, and what will their impact be on climate and biodiversity. So we need to reconstruct these western boundary currents using the deep sea sediment and fossil record. My lab group and I work, oh, well, let me back up. This is a geologic time scale, just the past 66 million years at the bottom till today at the top. And my lab group and I work a um, within one of these analogous warm periods called the mid piacensian warm period, which was about 3.3 to 3 million years ago. What we do is use sediments from Site 1207. This was drilled in 2001 um, along the boundary of the Crocio Current in Extension, the major western boundary current in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. This is a sediment core from that site. So at the top, you can see that red box. This is a limit of a piston core, which is about 90 feet. So 
And when the blue box is the depth of the anal analogous warm period that we study. So this is beyond the depth so that a piston core can reach. Observational data today has indicated that the Kuroshio current has warmed by about one to two degrees over the last century. But using geochemical data from these sediments, my lab group and I have established that the Kuroshio current extension warmed by about eight degrees Celsius across this analogous warm period, and that's analogous to today's warming. We suspect that the current could warm another six to seven degrees Celsius within the next few decades, leading to eight degrees total Celsius total of warming from pre-industrial times. So you've all seen this map earlier today, scientific drilling after 2024, and I've outlined the Western boundary current regions in the red boxes. So all of that blacked out area is where we will not be able to obtain sediment records under these Western boundary currents across these analogous warm periods. We simply cannot do it um, without drilling. So we really need riseless drilling to keep getting at these sedimentary archives, especially those that cross analogous warm periods to continue reconstructing these Western boundary currents and how they will impact society in the coming decades. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next up is Chris. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Lowry. I'm a research associate at the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics. I am a micropaleontologist. My research is focused on kind of two broad questions. Uh, how did ancient marine organisms respond to changes in their environment? And what can those past changes tell us about how modern organisms will respond to ongoing changes in their environment? This directly uh, contributes to several of the priorities defined by the last decadal survey, including what is the role of biodiversity and the resilience of marine ecosystems and how it will be affected by natural anthropogenic changes and how different will marine food webs be by mid-century and in 100 years. So when we think about marine ecosystems or marine food webs, we tend to think about um, ecologically and economically important things like tuna, billfish, squid, uh, krill. Uh, unfortunately, there's not good fossil records of those things. Uh, but fortunately, the biodiversity of planktic foraminifera in the modern ocean is highly correlated with that of tuna, billfish, krill, squid, and other important groups. So we can use the record of microfossils as a proxy for these other groups that we care about. We have an excellent record of the global diversity uh, of marine plankton. Uh, this is a record that goes back here to the uh, the Triassic, um, and this is the response of calcareous nanofossils and planktic foraminifera to a bunch of different climate events through Earth history. Uh, these climate events all have different characteristics. Some of them are warming. Some of them have ocean acidification or deoxygenation or changes in the stratification or whatever. Um, and we can we can compare those events to each other and understand what causes what kind of changes cause what groups to go extinct uh, or to change their range. Uh, or what have you. Um, so we have a, a great record of global diversity. This is like, you know, this this plot on the left is like averaged across the entire earth and it's just, you know, extinction, like the, the, the number of species go up or down. Um, that's great, but there's a lot of ecological changes that happen below the level of extinction that are still really important to understand. And so we can start to better uh, to look at this. Um, this box on the right looks at the, um, it's basically a measure of functional diversity in million year time bins, but also split out by latitude. So average across uh, five degree latitudinal bins through Earth history, back to 66 million years ago, we've got a great record of the neogene. But as you start to get further back in time into some of these analog or partial analog warm uh, periods of the past, uh, we have less good coverage of these deeper time intervals. And, you know, like, for example, here in the, in the early paleogene, we have no records from the tropics we're almost no records from the tropics, and it's still an open question on whether uh, the trops are, tropics were actually habitable during these past warm climates. Uh, and to fill those gaps, we need more drilling. We need to get more records to build this data set out. Uh, and those new records will help us answer um, a lot of important and emerging questions like, were the tropics habitable? Uh, what are the mechanisms or rates of change that cause extinction versus just rain shifts? And related to that, are there tipping points in biodiversity? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, Allison is the last of the set of speakers. And again, if you have questions for them, do put them in Slido. And if you wish, if it's a question specifically to one of the speakers, do put their name down. Otherwise, it's just a general question. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm a marine biogeochemist, um, and my work really looks at the links between climate change and ocean chemistry. So for my group, that really boils down to two questions. One is how will climate change impact the ocean chemistry and how will those changes act as potential feedbacks on the global climate system? So that involves looking at things like how the carbon cycle links to other cycles like oxygen and nutrient cycles and alkalinity. 
And there are many ways that my group can ask these questions using either modern observations or the recent paleo-oceanographic record, which we can obtain through gravity and piston cores. But when we get to some of um, what are the most urgent questions for our community, those questions tend not to be about what the ocean and climate will look like now. It, those questions are about what the uh, oceans will look like in 100 years when we know that they're likely to be much warmer. So as you've already heard, uh, one of our best tools for um, asking questions and studying these processes and feedbacks of warmer climates is to go back further in geologic history, which requires ocean drilling to obtain those records. The other thing that I want to note that my uh, group does is that we study uh, the geochemistry of the sub seafloor environment. Um, we do that to try to understand how deep process or processes uh, deep within sediments can drive changes in global biogeochemical cycles. Um, the way that we do this is by extracting pore or interstitial waters from marine sediments. Um, but I just want to highlight that this is something we have to do as those materials are collected. So as we develop new questions, we can't go to a core repository and pull waters out of those cores. We have to go and collect more material. So just to give an example of what this work can look like, here's an example from um, Expedition 392. So in early 2022, uh, we went out to the Agulhas Plateau, um, and we collected this unexpected but beautiful 100-meter section that showed um, local enhanced basalt weathering into the ocean. Um, and a record like this gives us an opportunity not just to look at what the ocean looked like, looked at like in the past, but also to start to interrogate some of the impacts of proposed climate mitigation techniques, things like ocean alkalinity enhancement, which can evolve uh, things like enhanced basalt weathering to the oceans. Um, so here we're looking at questions that are um, not only relevant to us as an ocean sciences community, but also to um, us as a society as we start to think about some of our uh, potential mechanisms for climate mitigation. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for these perspectives. I really appreciate I mean, it is amazing how much you can cram into two and a half minutes. Well done, you all. Yeah. And I do have a few questions. Um, so let's see. Um, there's a comment here that talks about how it's important to point out that many scientists, if not most, in the ocean drilling community also work in the water column. They're not disconnected groups. And that's really important, I think. Less of a question, more of a comment. Um, OK, as early career scientists, is there anything specific to scientific ocean drilling that you feel has shaped your success thus far? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go with Chris and then Allie. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, one of the, like low key, the best part about scientific ocean drilling is that to get on the ship and to be a part of these expeditions, it's a very low barrier to entry, right? There's no, you don't have to write a proposal. You don't have to be the PI or the PI student or something like that. When they staff the ship, they'd really try hard to balance career stages. So it's not just people that have been doing it their whole careers. It's also postdocs. It's also graduate students. It's yeah. also, you know, people that maybe don't have an opportunity or, or wouldn't have had an opportunity to sail if it was you had to write a proposal yourself. Like, for example, I first went to sea on Expedition 364, which drilled the Chicxulub Impact Crater. Uh, I had never studied the Paleocene before that cruise. I had expertise in Foraminifera, but I'd never actually studied the Paleocene. The other micropaleontologist on that cruise was Jan Schmidt, who helped um, describe or discover the asteroid impact hypothesis for the end Cretaceous mass extinction. So um, it, there's a, there's like a big shift in, in um, uh, expertise there. Uh, but that was a really, really positive thing for me because it's a really good like jumpstart to your career that you get access to new samples. Um, it's all high quality, high quality science because it's, it's all vetted and it's a lot of infrastructure that goes into like getting out there to getting the samples. Um, you get all this material that you would not have access to otherwise. And that's extremely valuable as an early career scientist. Very good point. Thank you, Chris. Allie? Yeah, so I think my, my point is similar, but um, I just want to highlight kind of as Chris has said, for for those of you who maybe haven't thought a lot about our staffing procedures, that they really are unique. Um, and so in addition to my opportunity to sail on 392, I actually have two graduate students who either have sailed or will sail in the next year. Um, those students were given the opportunity to apply for a project independent of me and to go on a ship and to kind of be a much more equal footing with their peers than I think um, exists in many situations. I also just want to highlight that as you look at the affiliations of scientists who've been speaking, I think it's it's worth just reminding 
kind of the the quality of these experiences that aren't focused on a handful of elite universities, but are really being spread. I'm in the Midwest. I'm at a relatively small uh, university by comparison. And so I think that that's also a key to keep in mind is just um, the extent to which IODP provides opportunities, really high quality opportunities kind of across the country. Those are great points. Thank you. Go ahead. And I'll add on. So I want to underscore everything that Chris and Ali have both said, because those are my similar experiences as well. As well. I'm also at a smaller R1 in New York State. Um, also have grad students that are sailing and involved with research and, you know, but as a first generation academic and I, my family didn't come, we didn't come from a lot of money. Um, this being on an IODP expedition really allowed me access to other mentors and people that really would like help define my career. And that was also really important. So there was this paper that came out, I think just last week, Rebecca Barnes is a co-author on it. Um, she's a friend and colleague that I met on Twitter. Um, but it talks about these sticky networks and how like folks that are mentored and have a big group of mentors and advisors actually stay within academia. And I've that's kind of been true for me. And I think it can be true. It's probably true for a lot of other folks out there. Um, but I think there's this really good opportunity for students that come from you know, non-traditional past or may have historically excluded identities in STEM to really be brought into this community and embraced. Um, and of course, we always have room to improve on that front as well. Oh, that's awesome. Jason Sylvan asked the question. I'm so glad he asked the question. These are these are some amazing insights. Anything from uh, Masako and Chijun? Okay, I think um, I completely agree with what you know, three of them enthusiastically presented so far. Um, so anything I can add um, as a, let's say, marine geophysicist who mainly works with basin-wide seismic magnetic gravity, all these signals. And if I did not sail on these um, IODP drilling cruises that core the basement material, I probably, it took me or took the community for a long time or never to understand what's the source of what we are geophysically really imaging. That's why I emphasize that this is the only way to ground truth, deep crystal imagery. And then as a student, as a postdoc early career, I have been so humbled about, wow, we did not know yeah. type Great. of discoveries during the drilling. So thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, unlike the other four speakers, I have never been on an IODP cruise ship before. Um, but 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 I totally agree with what what they have said. Um, I think it it is an amazing experience if I had joined those ships. Um, and uh, I'm jealous. <laughs> so so I think you know if if no we will have a we will have another ship in the future and that will allow me or you know the future generations to get the similar experience to advance their research and build their connections and also although i haven't been on a cruise ship before but uh, those existing data that's generated from those past expeditions are really helpful for my research you know in terms of telling us the climate forcings and responses in the past and you know, sort of like i stand on the shoulders of giants you know yeah. um and these are incredibly helpful for my research so far. Yeah, excellent. Thank you all. Let's thank our panelists one more time. And I want to invite uh, um, to the front, uh, the remaining four, Jason, Jessica, Brandy, and Patrick. Maybe we can have it. There you go. Thank you. Um, and Leanne, let's not clear the questions. Is that okay? Don't clear the questions just yet. Yeah. Oh, too late. Okay. All right. <laughs> I like that. All right. Thank you all, Jason, Jessica, Brandy, Patrick, in that order. So I guess, Jason, we start with you. Push the button. And it's.
Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Complete spaz. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Sylvan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Oceanography uh, at Texas A&M University, uh, where my lab studies the microbial ecology of volcanic rocks that are created at mid-ocean ridges and then reside below sediments in alter parts of the ocean. Uh, the oceanography community in general should care about this work because at any one time, about 2% of the volume of seawater is moving through this volcanic aquifer, um, which means that in general, the entire volume of the ocean cycles through subsea floor basement roughly every 200,000 years. And while moving through basements, uh, the seawater is altered by microorganisms and water rock reactions, having implications for ocean chemistry uh, that connect this deep biosphere to the broader ocean. Next. Or do I press? Oh, I press next. It's me. Um, so this work addresses the 2015 Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences objective about uh, geophysical, chemical, and biological character of the subsea floor environments and how it affects global cycles and understanding of the origins and evolution of life. In my lab, we address a few different uh, questions, but among them are things like how many micro microbes are there in this particular environment? Um, who are those microbes? And if we can isolate new species in the lab to work with. Um, so I provide a few examples here on the left. We see a plot of a uh, number of cells uh, in volcanic seafloor um, on the x-axis versus depth on the y-axis going from seafloor down to 792 meters below seafloor. Uh, this particular data set uh, is kind of unprecedented in terms of its length and allowed us to address questions about the uh, distribution of abundance and kind of where they are, cells below the seafloor, um, that um, are really exciting. Uh, from that same site, um, in the middle, the different colors represent uh, different groups of microorganisms, and this goes actually from the surface on the left to deep 750 meters on the right, um, and shows that those different colors are, there's a lot of, it looks like almost noise, and that shows us that the um, groups of microorganisms uh, are heterogeneously distributed, and um, we did some further work looking into how this relates to the properties of the cores themselves. Uh, and then on the right, uh, we have uh, an image of a bacteria that I isolated from 392 meters below sea floor. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, this was the first kind of described uh, new species of bacteria um, from specifically from subsea floor uh, basement. And growing these organisms in the lab allows us to address hypotheses um, that we can address in the field. Uh, so I'll finish up by saying that all of this types of work requires new scientific ocean drilling. So I've sailed on uh, three expeditions and been uh, associated with the fourth closely. Uh, the map on the right shows uh, places that IODP has sampled the larger dots or where microbiology was a focus. And you can see that's a minority of all the total. And so this is a, a young field and to avoid contamination and also do the types of experiments uh, that let us address rates of processes, we need fresh core and scientific ocean drilling. Excellent, thank you, Jason. Uh, let's see who's next, um, Jessica. I'm waiting for my slides. Just a thing. Oh. oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm Jessica Labonte. I'm a soon to be associate professor at Texas A&M Galveston. Um, so my research focuses on understanding the role and impact and importance of virus host interactions in different aquatic environments. And that includes the water column, but also the sediment. So when we think about viruses, it, some of, most of them will infect a cell, replicate, and that ends up in bursting the cell, releasing the nutrients, which will have a huge impact on the geochemical cycles. Some of them can integrate inside the genome of their host. They will be dormant until they get out and they are a little sloppy. So they often are involved in gene transfer and adaptation of their host. And what we know about viruses in sediment, we know that they are very abundant, 10 to, 10, time, 10 to 100 times more abundant than their microbial host. We know that they are more abundant when there's more total organic carbon, and they are extremely diverse, and they are active at depth up to 300. But I put little stars here, and there's only three papers that use IODP. Everything else is with surface cores. So we don't know much about viruses at depth, and we don't know anything about viruses in basement. So there's 
a lot of questions. We know that they are probably very important in the geochemical cycles, given their importance in the water column. But what is the infection rate? We don't know. And that will tell us how uh, they impact the geochemical cycles. And by knowing the dynamics between viruses and their hosts, we can learn about adaptation. But we have so many more questions to answer. Uh, last summer, I participated in Expedition 393 in the South Atlantic transect, and I'm trying to attempt to answer some of these questions, like what is the infection rate? What is the preferred lifestyles? Do they more do they lice more, or do they are they are more dormant? Um, who are they infecting? We don't even know because we don't know the host for these viruses, and how are they involved in the adaptation of their host? Uh, so, to, but this is the sort of questions that we need to think about before we get the course. So we need fresh cores to determine any types of activity rates. And that's not just true with viruses, it's true with every microbes. We also need deep cores because we need to be able to access the complete geochemical gradients if we want to understand how microbes are like players in the geochemical cycles. But we also need a range of cores from different locations and environments uh, because we the field of microbiology and virology in the subsurface is still very young. So we need to further understand their importance in the elemental cycles and the evolution of life. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Jessica. Brandy is next. Okay. okay. Um, my research focuses uh, broadly on the survivability of microbes in the subsurface, and I divide this into three themes that can be thought of like a game show of survivor, um, and I highlight papers from, uh, from my lab for each of these. Uh, the first is adaptation, which is reflected in, as Jessica said, um, in RNA expression. So briefly, RNA um, that, uh, you know, which I specialize in, uh, tells us that the microbe is active, it's changing its environment, uh, that RNA degrades quickly over time, very quickly, talking, you know, uh, hours and even days, and even with storage, it, uh, it degrades. So that's not something that we could get from even archive samples. Uh, second is dormancy, and uh, this is seen through uh, spores. Uh, this is uh, spores that we isolated uh, from South Pacific gyre uh, sediments. Um, it, uh, this is uh, fungi and uh, one that we uh, characterized. Um, and fungi, like viruses, is very new finding. It's still in its infancy. It's uh, responsible for the breakdown of recalcitrant carbon in the subsurface. And uh, the third uh, mechanism for survival is, you know, basically killing its neighbor uh, through natural products or through antimicrobial production. And uh, my lab has shown uh, that using uh, full length genes from genomes, uh, we can predict the antimicrobial product, the actual uh, natural product that can be produced. Uh, now, this is uh, going back to leaps. This is using big data analytics uh, for discovery, but it, uh, but we can't actually derive the natural product uh, unless we use fresh samples, and that is on the horizon. So, if viruses and fungi are, you know, uh, in its infancy in research, then this is in its fetal stage, uh, and so we're just now um, figuring out what is possible with uh, antimicrobials. And so, uh, you know, I need to want to also reiterate that this is an interdisciplinary program and uh, microbiologists, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, only invited to the party uh, a relatively short time ago, you know, and compared to, you know, all the other disciplines. And, uh, you know, so we need that uh, transdisciplinary science. Uh, otherwise, you know, our concern is that without an organizing body or without a framework, that the science will naturally silo into its subdisciplines. And IODP brings those, you know, uh, you know, encourage those, uh, those uh, to come to the table. Uh, so microbiologists and, you know, geologists are actually creating the whole, you know, new field of something like geomarchobiology, which didn't exist 50 years ago at all. Um, and then I want to kick it over to uh, Patrick in, by saying that, you know, cork uh, observatories, you know, uh, these may be our last window to the subsurface, you know, biologically speaking, if that scientific drilling door is closed. Great. Thank you, Brandy. Patrick, you're next. Great. Uh, thanks. So uh, forgive me, but I want to give another highlight of the power of borehole observatories, um, particularly one we installed 
after the magnitude nine Tohoku earthquake uh, for Japan. During that earthquake, the shallow portion of the fault slipped 50 to 60 meters all the way to the seafloor. Essentially, the seafloor at the, the trench jumped 50 meters to the east. It's created a much bigger earthquake and much bigger tsunami than anyone predicted. Why was that? Was the, the fault there really strong and it built up a lot of elastic energy? Or was it really weak and it essentially just kind of hydroplaned and went along with the ride? Um, essentially, we want to know what the dynamic friction is, a critical part of earthquake physics, but this is something that seismology can't tell us. But one way that we can do it is measuring the frictional heat generated. Just as you rub your hands together, the heat generated is related to how much displacement there is and the average shear resistance. So what if we drill into the fault and try to measure the temperature? So the organization and community of, of scientific ocean drilling um, was such that it enabled us to have a rapid response drilling expedition, 343 JFEST, that set sail just a year after the earthquake. And we drilled across the fault, we sampled it, and we installed a temperature observatory, seven kilometers water depth, another 850 meters below the seafloor. Essentially, not we showed straws measuring pressure. This is just essentially a rope with a lot of super high resolution temperature sensors can measure to an accuracy of a thousandth of a degree Celsius hanging in the well um, here. Um, and we came back nine months later, and this is what we've got. We're looking at the residual or anomalous temperature when you remove the background geotherm as a function of depth and time. At the beginning, it's cold, disturbed by the drilling itself, but then it equilibrates with the formation. And down at the bottom at 820 around the plate boundary fault, we see this anomalous temperature about 0.3 degrees. That we interpret to be the frictional heat signature of the earthquake. When we back out what the friction was, we get a really low friction. Essentially, it had no breaks going on here. We also learned a lot of things about hydrology, which is really important to a lot of things. You can see another signal here of uh, where it says advection, fluid moving through there. And then in aftershocks, starts flowing through other things. We can map where fluids are coming out, dynamic pulses, how hydrology, how fault zones and hydrology are linked together uh, and respond to aftershocks uh, in the subsurface. Really important to understand how fluids trigger earthquakes, ore genesis, and microbiology solute transport. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Let's thank our speakers. All right. I do have a bunch of questions. I know we're not going to get to all of them, but I'll ask you a few of them. Um, though, you know, microbes and viruses, like I'm sensing from you all, you were like, well, wait, we just joined the party. Wait, how can the party end? This is not fair, right? You just, um, are, and you know, also from the previous talks too, I mean, this is a program that's really hitting its stride, right? Um, that is very obvious. Okay. So one question here talks about sort of the importance of new cores versus ability to use existing cores. And um, so I guess from all four of you, I'm looking for like a number like 50, 50, 90, 10 needs to be new, 100%. Um, what do you all are thinking? Let's start with Patrick and work our way backwards. So the oh. question was, how much do we need old core versus new core? Yeah, in your research so far or in the near future as you envision it, what percentage do you think we will require new cores versus can be done with existing? Well, and this might not be what people want to hear, but I think that it's 95% uh, new and 5% old. Essentially, old stuff is good for ancillary science to essentially figure some things about rock properties or some other things to fill in kind of background things. But the new and cutting edge science is is, mm -hmm. is out there. And for better or worse, we've milked those cores and we've milked a lot of the stuff that, that we've acquired so far to get the science that we put out there already. And I just want to reiterate that, that uh, I would agree with that number. Uh, the, you know, 5% uh, that is, you know, you know, those archived cores, you can just get the basic DNA of who is, you know, just who is there. Those are first order questions that uh, we'd like to move well beyond um, and, you know, ask the deeper questions, uh, not only just rates, but, you know, what are these other, you know, uh, domains of life that are in there um, or entities and then also you know what's what's active what is uh what are they actually doing mm -hmm. thank you i'm seeing that's some nodding that's where i was gonna say yeah ditto <laughs> yeah jason ditto yeah uh, yeah well and I, I would add to that um we've seen in a few of the presentations uh photographs uh from the repositories where you see kind of meters high rows of cores 
Um, but the cores that can be used for microbiology in particular resist in like a few freezers. Um, so there's just not a lot of material. So even though there's a few questions that can be addressed and should with the, those repository for microbiology, um, for our discipline in particular, yeah. it's not a lot. Yep, makes sense. And the size of the samples in the freezer is, you're lucky if you get a 10 centimeter hole round, but it's usually less or even a plug, which if like the, most of these samples are low biomass, there's not a lot of microbes in there. So you don't get a lot of even DNA to ask more meaningful question than who is there with simple 16S amplification. Very good points. Thank you. Here's another question about, and, and you, is some of you touched on this, but let's make it a little bit more explicit. Um, uh, the importance of the transdisciplinary nature of IODP. You're nodding. Give us some examples, some thoughts, some anecdotes. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we should start while he's coughing. I'm sorry. You got so excited, you choked on your own. <laughs> so the one of the great things about the uh, going on IODP expedition is that you get to interact with geologists, sedimentologists. I'm a marine microbiologist, so I knew absolutely nothing about rocks until I I went on the ship, and now I can you can fully integrate your data within a much larger frame of other data that would otherwise not be available because I didn't even know what that these data existed before. So just being able to have that access to the, the other data, but also meeting the people on board is you, you build a network of people and it's such an inclusive uh, community that you know, you go on the ship and there's no more seniority versus early career. Everybody is doing there to achieve the objectives of the, of the expedition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see, this is, here is the million dollar question. Um, if you could lead a future IODP, what would you do differently to ensure its sustainability and progress? This is the million dollar question, and, and it's okay to say, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I like to kind of respond to questions like that and saying it's not this or that. And so I think that there are more creative solutions that involve larger parts of the government than just what's in this room. Um, that's, I guess that said, I mean, I, I think having a program that is sustainable is important. So if that means potentially guaranteeing continuity, but with less field work, you know, in particular for some period of time, as we think about what the future will look like, um, I think that that would be an acceptable path forward. That's a good point. Patrick? I was going to say, I think one of the things that for us um, to think about is that we don't want to have to reinvent this, is that the beauty of ocean drilling is that over 50 plus years or whatever, it works. And it's a system that has all this interdisciplinary stuff. When you try to do something like an ICDP proposal, or I'm working on a DOE supported drilling project, you don't get this interdisciplinary stuff. You don't get all this organizational stuff. And so you're trying to invent this stuff. And so it's kind of evolved to something that works. And we're really afraid that that's going to be lost. Yeah, very good points. All right, you all, really insightful. I am so glad you're here and gave us your time. Let's thank our panel one more time. Oh. Uh, that's me. Yep. So um, there were just uh, four of us. And so we had probably... I can hear it. <laughs> I mean, I can hear it. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, we had obviously a number of uh, what we would consider a high priority um, focuses. Ultimately, we settled on uh, these three, uh, the first being uh, polar climate, ice sheet instability, and sea level changes. And so this is about uh, reducing uncertainties in ice sheet and geophysical models which are being used to predict uh, rates and magnitude of uh, sea level rise 
in the future. Uh, there are clearly a number of periods in the past, uh, some fairly recent, the last interglacial, um, stage 11, maybe the early Pliocene in the deeper time, um, possibly the Eocene Oligocene transition that serve as good uh, case studies for uh, testing these models. And so some of this would require uh, additional deep sea drilling. Some of it wouldn't uh, using um, maybe the um, uh, existing cores and so forth. We didn't get into the details of that. The second priority, um, you know, broadly speaking, is about uh, changes in, in ocean mixing slash stratification and how that influences uh, nutrient and uh, carbon cycling. And so we're kind of thinking in terms of um, the response of the uh, ocean atmosphere, ocean in terms of, of, of acting in feedback mode. Um, if you have warming, potentially increased stratification and how that impacts um, um, productivity and the uptake of carbon. So air-sea exchange of carbon. This has some relevance also to thinking about um, um, uh, proposals for ocean uh, carbon sequestration. And so uh, carbon sequestration has to be done ultimately if it's going to be implemented uh, in the context of, of models that we trust and uh, you know, basically a, a uh, unstable or, or, or shifting system. And then third priority, uh, uh, the general uh, topic of large earthquakes and tsunamis, basically um, monitoring current seismogenic zones, um, being able to um, improve predictions specifically of, of large earthquakes, um, where they would occur, and maybe closing the window on uh, prediction of, of timing. Are there any uh, clarifying questions uh, for Jim? We okay. did have other priorities. Um, I could list some of those, but... Um, Specification of the hydrologic cycle, the biosphere, so so, um, but and tipping points. But we had to pick three. Um, well, and then that question of urgency, we would consider all of these to be uh, urgent um, priorities. Uh, we can't wait 10 years to continue working on these problems. We need to, as soon as possible, get back to addressing these issues. Okay. Okay, next slide. Okay, that um that was our group, and um, I'm already seeing overlap, and that's delightful. So the first science priority focuses on the uh, theme of paleoceanography and paleoclimatology, um, with two subcategories. Um, the second one is is I think the first priority from the previous group, looking at uh, sensitivity and dynamics of land ice and sea level change. Um, the first one uh, relates to one of the themes that I heard from um, the first group as well, um, uh, maybe slightly rephrased, uh, but definitely related, thinking about how ocean circulation responds to rapid climate change and then the consequences for ocean environments and marine ecosystems and in particular CO2 changes, um, CO2 uptake. Um, so we see parallels. Our second, um, and this is not in a priority order, but a, a, an additional priority in our top three list um, is bringing in one of the things that was not in the first list um, and thinking about geomicrobiology. And we were thinking about the, the, con the, the, the framing of this in, with an urgency sense. So um, thinking about subsea floor life Ooh, as an unknown natural resource. So that, that might be um, a valuable way to connect it to societal relevant issues um, with um, uh, future technology and mining considerations and what, the, um, what, what would the impacts be on this and what there's so much that we don't know, the unknown unknowns. So origins of life and adaptation 
uh, microbial system interactions, contributions to geochemical cycles. And um, our third priority, I, we have to, we, we really want to um, just defer to the other groups. We did not have any geohazard specialists in our group, but we, even though that was no, no one in our group was that their primary field, we, we did recognize how valuable and important that is. So just putting, putting it up there um, to tag it, but we also had lots of discussions about um, what we're calling a special mention. So the rock <laughs> sediment water interactions with implications for deep carbon cycling. And, and one of the ways that that ties into urgency was, was the connections to carbon sequestration. Thank you. And how many people were in your group, Krista? Uh, one, two, three, <laughs> four, Seven, eight, depending upon the time of the room. If one gave up early, we would spare. No. <laughs> Are there any uh, clarifying questions for uh, Kristen? <laughs> okay, uh, next slide. Room 118. That was Rick, I think. Yeah, folks can also feel free Speak. to put questions in the Slido. Though, Leanne, I think we have to clear the ones from last time. Yeah, that would be our secrets. <laughs> yeah, for uh, you folks in Zoom, this is Rick Murray reporting out for uh, our group. Uh, there are seven people in our group, and uh, you'll immediately notice that we listed four, <laughs> uh, not three. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to be a chemist, so we deal with uncertainty. So three really... <laughs> is three plus or minus one. Um, but I also noticed that everybody else had A's and B's. So I think we're among friends here. Uh, so again, overlap with the other groups, which is good. Um, we tried to use language that um, would speak to a sense of urgency and action. So the first one, discovering novel subsea floor ecosystems and quantifying their integral role in global chemical cycling. So recognizing that there's been a lot of excellent work so far, but that there's still a lot of new discoveries to be made and how to link these new discoveries f throughout the uh, temporal and size and cycling spectrum. Uh, the second one, Progress. second one, assessing the vulnerability of ice sheets. So again, speaking to urgency and the feedbacks on climate, ocean, cryosphere, and ecosystem, using the word feedbacks to really emphasize the bidirectionality, if you will, of the, the first part of that, ice sheets, and the second part, climate, ocean, ecosystems. So cause and effect in both directions. And vulnerability, again, really speaking to, this is an urgent need of societal relevance now. Well, actually, 10 years ago and 10 years from now and certainly now. Uh, third one, prediction and mitigation of climate and geologic hazards um, throughout, the, throughout the spectrum. Um, we added climate um, because some of the hazards are climate-related as sea level rises. And then you end up with, you know, methane stability, but then you also end up with, you know, geologic hazards that are just pure geological hazards, like things blowing up and lots of people dying. Uh, and then the fourth one of resource and energy systems, couldn't figure out exactly how to get ecosystems in here. Um, ocean drilling is a key to probe their dynamics and behavior. A lot of the stickies in here, this had six different stickies from our group of seven, had to deal with hydrologic cycling, um, continental margins, um, and matters like that. But trying to frame it as a larger issue than, quote unquote, just water and energy movement, looking at it as a, a, a potential resource and impact as those resources are identified and uh, exploited. One thing that does not show on this group of three plus or minus one is uh, we did have a discussion about the fundamental role of deep probing of, of salt and mantle. And we wanted to get that into a narrative. It didn't fit into any of these, but it was so fundamental 
we thought it's certainly worth mention at some point, but we didn't know how to put it into here. End of report. Uh, no, no questions have popped up yet on um, the screen, but um, yeah, just to clarify resources, that, that include the, say, essential elements needed for electrification, that type of thing? Is that yes. That in mind? Yes. Okay. Any other uh, clarifying questions for Rick? Okay. Um, Has well, been, uh, Carmen... Carbon dioxide removal will be part of that discussion. Yes. Yes, certainly carbon dioxide, uh, all aspects there, particularly if it's um, uh, buried, but not only if it's buried. Okay, room 118. <clears throat> So, Allison. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Uh, room Sorry. 250. Um, okay. So, going last means that we also had a lot of overlap from what's already been discussed. We actually had a really large breakout group. So, I, I don't know if I should feel popular, like everyone came to mind, but we had about 12 people in our room. So, it was a really great discussion. We identified three high priority areas ground truthing, future climate change, geohazards, and habitability and adaptability of life at the surface and subsurface. And um, we do have some subtopics. And while these are not exhaustive, we noted that some of these subtopics are needed to create a holistic understanding of the Earth system, and many of them are interconnected. So I won't read them all off, but for example, uh, studying the ice sheet would lead to circulation and they're very interconnected in the Venn diagram. So that was um, the reasoning behind some of our subtopics. And we also wanted to point out and discuss that many of these topics require temporally resolved, set, uh, temporally resolved sediment records that can only be accessed by ocean drilling, especially those deeper than 40 meters. Um, 2A and 3C would require um, the use of subsea floor observatories to collect the, the data needed, and 3C requires hard rock uh, drilling to get the needed knowledge. And for most of these cases, piston cores are too shallow to gather the data. We also talked about um, urgent and specific areas where we would want new drilling to occur. Um, specifically new transects that are needed for the cores. And one thing that came up was perhaps tr uh, doing transects in a systematic way. So for example, going from shallow to deep waters or across frontal systems and latitudes and going across the, the spreading center from the access point um, being the origin of life. So that was our discussion. Yeah, there are <clears throat> clarifying questions for Allison. I don't see any on the screen. Okay, so we then just you know, walk, go to the um, yeah virtual group go to the board. virtual groups. Okay, so we're going to go to the virtual groups, and um, the first is room room one. I think a jeep. That's the uh, report out for that. Like you did a lot of work there, Ajit. <laughs> okay, I was really hoping that you were to spend that then. Really, I'll organize that in the second. So we did it on Jambo. It's there on Jambo thing. Um, so the, the very first thing is that there's an enormous amount of overlap. Use the mic. Use the mic. 
there's an enormous amount of overlap because we wanted to make Jim's life a lot easier. So um, you'll notice that there's actually um, not that much different here. The first one is basically to understand a combination of long-term evolution of climate as well as abrupt extreme events. And this basically then falls into a whole bunch of subcategories such as, oh. The online folks say you're too far away. Oh, okay. Um, such as ocean circulation and how extreme events um, change, how extreme events can be distinguished from long-term climate change, uh, basically trying to resolve the two. The second topic was to do with high latitude regions being still undersampled, but very important for understanding past evolution of climate ice system. And this basically uh, goes back to changes in ocean current and changes in ice ocean interactions understanding ice and ocean interactions in past warm climate intervals and uh, establishing rates of past ice retreats at both poles. The third one had to do with uh, earthquake behavior predictability, which is to do with coding at active margins, monitoring slip stress uh, and recurrence rates with observatories and uh, geophysical surveys, uh, downhole logging. So these are basically three high priorities. Um, following the example someone else put there, the special mention in this is that, um, the, and this is basically the framework of how to do this, um, is that um, we, have to need, we need high fidelity, high resolution records that can be used to um, uh, ground truth uh, climate models. And one idea was that these need to be uh, drilled in transects and grids in close proximity. To be able to provide that kind of information. Um, questions for Ajit? Okay, uh, uh, virtual room two, I think is Marsha. Yep, so um, we decided to go with the pros method instead of the bullet method here. <laughs> um, so some of these are overlap, but I think we have one that's a little bit new. So the first one is to look at the ocean atmospheric interactions for climate change. A twist on this is to uh, really focus on the polar regions with the ice retreat in the Arctic and maybe a opportunity for a new ice hardened drilling ship. For that. Um, also, when we talked about this, the resolution of, of the uh, cores was really important. Uh, the next one is a little bit new. So execute a full study of legacy cores to inform future drilling location and preservation techniques, and maybe use new methods of data analytics like machine learning to leverage the big data opportunities in those cores, and then use those results to inform the public and potential sponsors outside of NSF of the power of ocean drilling and uh, to discover uh, impactful science communication techniques to tie science to societal priorities. So that could be a, a w something to look at all in itself. How do you inform the public of the greatness? Uh, and that NASA does a really good job of this. So maybe we can do a good job of it for the ocean too. And then the last one was, uh, people have already talked about carbon, um, but to understand the natural carbon sequestration, so what's going on, how much carbon is in the ocean, and, and historically, how long is it, uh, how, how is it ocean stored carbon, and also potential methods for increasing carbon capture in the ocean by examining the natural carbon cycle historically, and also maybe designing new experiments where you try to capture carbon and, and understand how that happens. Okay, there are questions for uh, Marsha. Uh, if not, then we'll go on to... Um, uh, Virtual room three, which is Brad. Brad Moran. Yep. Um, so our group uh, had two people. Uh, <laughs> plus me, but I don't. Uh, but there were two that were trying to get in, I guess. And in fact, uh, the themes that we're hearing are in this slide uh, to some extent. Uh, <clears throat> in no particular order, but the priority one was deep time records of both the quote, boring back background, which is a term I had not heard before, and high resolution biotic and climate records. Basically that the events um, that we've seen in some of the slide decks uh, today, 
for example, Danny Sigmund. It's one example, you know, those are exciting, but also in the context of the background signals is important. Um, I want to mention that um, Elizabeth Siebert and Carol Cotterville were in the group. So if they want to add to this. <clears throat> and so the second point here is uh, just mentioned by Marsha. In fact, I was waiting for someone not to say this, but greater engagement. Um, here we are in a virtual world. Uh, why can't we engage more over the next decade with our scientists that are actually on shore in real time and with the public, the NOAA OE program right now? Okeanos is over in the Aleutians right now uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but it is a publicly funded agency. And so engagement with those public uh, in scientific and in the sort of cool stuff, if you like, is, import is important, the priority we feel. Third is um, that the geologic record, <clears throat> we've seen examples of this, is a guide for understanding processes and related geohazards. I would bold geohazards was the key point of this, priority three, across all fields of the Earth system. That's it. <clears throat> Any questions for Brad? Okay, uh, virtual room four, which uh, Layla gave us there. Okie doke. Um, so for virtual room uh, four, I'll use the uh, compulsory statement that uh, uh, we came up with a lot of ideas that have been already presented uh, in the room, including boring science. So that's kind of fun to see that pop up in two places. Um, our group had four people in it. So this trend we're seeing in converging ideas is independent of sampling depth. <laughs> I'll just joke. Um, <laughs> Landed it. Um, so um, for our priorities, uh, we we um, identified um, identifying catalysts as drivers, um, or identifying catalyst drivers and indicators for future change was our one of our priorities. Um, A and B. These are just examples to give context to the idea. Um, looking at geohazard phenomena originating in the solid Earth and discovery of. Um, new or future climatic states through um, boundary condition tests and models. Um, for scientific priority two, um, this is this was a pretty long discussion about coverage um, and the type of coverage that would let us um, have new discoveries or the genesis of new fields of inquiry and the reassessment of paradigms we've been holding on to with the idea of we don't know what we don't know. Um, so the examples here are both spatial and temporal gaps, um, opportunistic sampling between transits uh, as, a, as an actual priority, um, but also div diversifying what places are sampled, including those boring places so we can have truly uh, reference materials. And then the last one was enhancing the value of um, existing um, data from existing sites with samples that are relevant to modern inquiry, um, including, um, you know, modern techniques, high resolution analyses, and biological analyses that can't be done from some legacy cores. Uh, questions? I have one on, on three. Does that... Um... So, so is that working with existing cores or are you talking about new cores or? Um... Yes, uh, yes to both. So Yes to both, Mark. Yeah. Okay. okay, virtual room five, which is Mona. All right, uh, we had a small but mighty group. I want to thank uh, Emily, Luan, Hiroko, Sharon, Drew, and Greg for being in the group. Um, the busyness of the slide just demonstrates my lousiness in synthesizing all the ideas. But uh, we discussed uh, two cross-cutting themes that were uh, relevant to all the three major like themes that we discussed. These themes, cross-cutting themes, were we need to integrate uh, expertise across disciplines to support individual, national, and international aspirations 
such as those represented by the Sustainable Development Goals, and integrate education and outreach into scientific and research priorities to mitigate ocean blindness and inspire people from diverse backgrounds. Um, with respect to science priority one, just re-emphasizing something that's been said about geohazards already. Um, so building resilience, how can we improve predictability of natural hazards and build resilience to unforeseeable events that have major impacts? Uh, at what point will there be tipping points in ocean circulation and what are the corresponding projected impacts both locally as well as globally? Mm -hmm. Under habitable worlds, we discussed uh, how can we effectively integrate our understanding of microbial activity to geological processes? What are the limitations to life and adaptations to extreme environments? And what happens when there is massive habitat loss in the oceans? Under, uh, we discussed technological solutions in ocean governance in particular, that probably has not come up. Um, deep sea mining has come up, so we discussed the potential impacts of deep sea mining. We also discussed what will be the impact of technological solutions on environmental fixes, such as marine carbon uh, dioxide removal, what existing technologies should be scaled up. How can we use oceans for energy production in a way that it uh, leverages the natural systems and human communities that depend on them? And lastly, um, what are some most effective governance structures for promoting the health, resilience, and sustainability of our oceans beyond EEZ? Um, and in what ways do different governance systems respond or, and adapt to change? Um, I welcome input by any of our uh, group members. Emily, Luan, Hiroko, Sharon, anything to add? I have, a, I have a question on three. I, you know, certainly it's, um, I, I don't quite see the link to ocean drilling there or, um, well, maybe in a couple of them, but it, it seems like they're very important, but I, I don't. Is, is we were a, discussing, I think some large science priorities, we, we weren't hung up only on the ocean okay. drilling program. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> was, there, was there another question? Did I see a hand? Okay, I, we can go on, I guess, to uh, virtual room six. That's um, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we started off, we had a little bit of a philosophical discussion at the beginning about how specific we would want our priorities to be, depending on the time scale over which they were going to be achieved. But we we kind of focused down onto trying to find three. Um, and we didn't really put them in any order, which is why I had the one AI uh, uh, labeling here. But um, the three that we came up with are similar to what we've seen before. So under what conditions have polar ice sheets retreated or even collapsed in the past? And how can polar records constrain future sea level? Um, the second, uh, how do changes in ocean conditions, warmer temperatures, um, lower pH influence ocean ecosystems. This one really highlighted, I think, this summer with, you know, examples like the 100 degree temperatures off of Florida. And so we thought this would be one that might catch the, the eye of the, the public in a way that would be very easy to um, communicate. And then what is the role of the deep biosphere in regulating biogeochemical cycles and providing information on evolution and extinction? Um, and then I'll just say that we had a couple of other kind of close contenders, which echo some of the things that other people have said, including thinking about the role of the oceans in storing um, carbon and looking at carbon fluxes, um, and then also uh, geohazards. Okay. Um... So now uh, virtual room seven, the other Brad, Brad DeLong. <laughs> the other Brad. Uh, thanks, Jim. So we were a group of six or seven, and we had uh, a good discussion and covered a bunch of things. We tended to focus on kind of the paleo perspective, but then uh, Katarina brought us back to kind of at least draw some attention on to, to hazards. So that's why you'll see 
the the third uh, topic there things we didn't i'm not presenting here we talked a lot about or considered kind of interacting time scales and differing kinds of uh, roles of microbial kind of organisms within the, the system. Some of that's hidden inside these questions, but the first is really trying to link various aspects of freshwater cryosphere tied to then tipping points related to the deep circulation and western boundary currents. So if you're in the Atlantic, this could be an AMOC, but if you're uh, you know, in the Southern Ocean, it could be, uh, you know, formation of, uh, you know, Antarctic bottom water. There could be lots of different kind of connections there, but it was the, the link between drivers through kind of the nonlinear tipping points and then response. The second is, uh, we talked about carbon in several different ways, both in an ecosystem and an organismal sense, but then kind of drew it to this, this question about, uh, phrased as what might the unintended consequences of large scale ocean carbon sequestration be, thinking of carbon sequestration in its most general form, including, you know, alkalinity enhancement, including, you know, artificial upwelling, including, you know, uh, you know, seaweed cultivation, whatever you think of is in carbon sequestration term. And then, needing to link that to understanding how ocean carbon cycle uh, will respond to warming, thinking of the kind of, inter for me at least, and for us, I think interesting, Danny's talk about uh, the shifting perspective on oxygen, which I'm still absorbing and haven't fully uh, come to terms with yet. <laughs> the idea that the paleo record may say something different than we're thinking of in the present uh, space for climate change. And finally, the very specific hazards uh, discussion around a particular kind of earthquake uh, issue from the, the slip to these slow slip uh, events, which are kind of very drawn out uh, uh, tsunami-genic uh, earthquakes uh, in regions like Cascadia, New Zealand, Japan. And there's all sorts, sorts of aspects of that in terms of drilling through to understand how these uh, systems function, but also potentially uh, adding or including uh, early warning capacity to, uh, to that kind of exploration. So I think I'll stop there, thanks. In, uh, virtual room eight, which is uh, Jason. Oh, that's oh, wait. Me. <laughs> it was Jason. Oh. Um, yeah, so um, everything that we have here has actually been covered a few times, but um, we were talking about reconstructing the geologic record um, for, for the ground truthing models, basically, to, for better models to test the models and to be able to better predict future climate change. Um, and then we talked about ground truthing again with in terms of engineered and nature based climate solutions. Um, so understanding the ocean's role in carbon dioxide uptake through biogeochemical cycles, through sediment uptake and um, sequestration in the crust. And then we talked about monitoring the state and properties of the seismogenic zone um, pertaining to geohazard mitigation. I think the um, just in terms of taking a look at what all the, all the groups reported on, it seems that there were at least two general themes, and the, each group went a little bit. Oh, two more. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're down at the bottom. Okay. All right. So we got <laughs> all right. Virtual room nine, I guess. I, I didn't see it on here. That's why I had uh, virtual room nine. Um, I had virtual room nine. This is Leanne. Um, okay. We've said everything that everyone else has already said, the beauty of being at the end. Um, I think we did try to go about it a little bit more broader specs, um, aspects so that they're a bit more um, encompassing of everything what people have been saying. But yeah, climate change, geohazards, and deep biosphere and subsea fluids. <laughs> okay, Tim. All right, I'm I'm uh, virtual room ten and very similar themes again. Uh, focus on paleoclimate um, and the importance of analog for present day changes, uh, geohazards, uh, both as measurements of of the current 
state and behavior, but also as a long-term record of past events. And then um, biogeochemical cycles, So, but not just thinking about the, the deep biosphere, but also thinking about hydrothermal input and how it directly influences geochemical as well as biogeochemical cycles or the ocean chemistry and, and ultimately uh, potentially the atmosphere. Uh, one thing we also discussed was the importance of tools and techniques that may come more into tomorrow, but but recognizing that these are evolving rapidly and, and critical to all of these, there was uh, particularly some discussion of the value of applying eDNA uh, more broadly, um, and then the importance of AI and, and mis machine learning in, in analysis in particular, and then continuing to develop novel and simple downhole uh, tools and measurements. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I guess we could try to. Um, we have some time that we could talk about how to how to put these together, and it seems like there's two, as I mentioned, that that cross all of them, which uh, in some way, uh, climate change, and particularly with respect to um, ice sheets and an effect on circulation, whether it's in the Antarctic or uh, Atlantic. Um, that was one that seemed to be common in some way in all of the groups. And then the other is uh, geohazards, uh, particularly with um, earthquakes and perhaps involving uh, sensors in boreholes. Um, it's also interesting to see that there's other NSF funded groups that are thinking about this, including um, uh, the um, uh, what is it? S uh, Subduction Zone 4D, SC4D group is talking about this. And uh, I think in some way the uh, seafloor part of um, the Ocean Observatory Initiative off Cascadia, I think, is also involved in some way with this. Um, so those are two, and then there was things like there was a wide variety of things that were that people that popped up in the third. Some of them are related, some of them are not. Um, there was a lot on. Um, seemed like several of them had to do with uh, carbon, uh, sex, uh, capture of carbon, um, different aspects of the carbon cycle. Impacts of warming on the carbon on carbon uh, 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 removal. Then there were some some that had uh, something about tipping points, but those could be tied back in, I think, to the climate uh, climate theme. Um, uh, let's see. There was uh, there was the one that was was very different. The technological um, solutions and governance was um, was one. Um, uh, and then there are a couple of them, or more than two, really talk about uh, the need for greater public engagement, um, trying to get the message across better. Um, uh, resources was another uh, theme that, that popped up. And then different aspects of a subsurface biosphere that showed up quite a bit, and ocean ecosystems in general and how they're changed and affected, but that perhaps could be tied in back to the climate change um, theme. So I think two of them really jump out and that are pretty easy, I think, to, to, to write something that would co cover what most of the people, most of the groups said about them. And then the third one is a bit, bit more uh, dispersed, at least, at least the way I saw it, but perhaps um, someone else might have a better. Uh, Subsea for life. No, I, I, yeah. Okay. No, that showed up a lot. You're right. And I, I didn't mention some uh, deep sea. Deep, uh, deeply buried biosphere, which to me was C4 life, but uh, yeah, no, that showed up in, in a lot. So maybe that's the third one. But there was, you know, a number of others that also popped up. Yeah. And, and I wanted to point out that the sub C4 life it, it also engages another hard rock community, which was a good thing to be inclusive. Since I think Hard Rock is um, underrepresented at this meeting, I, I think well maybe in Hazards it's there, but um, no, no, I, I don't, don't so. I don't know. I don't. I, people may have other ideas, but yeah. Yeah. Other comments. Are, are people happy with the idea that that? Uh, uh, a group could take the, two, the first two themes easily 
and deal and write something that would appeal to most, if not all, on hazards and um, and climate change, and then um, and then a, th a third one, uh, well, subsurface life could be one, and uh, could be one or or uh, you know there were some other candidates as well. We got to try to narrow it down a bit, but um, things like two would be pretty easy to to write in a way that most most of the people in the room would be and online would be happy to support, I believe. But if, but if you disagree, then Becky, you might disagree. Well, I just, I'm going to go back to this thing about underselling subsea floor life because um, all day today, we've been hearing about the importance of ocean drilling. Like it's something we can't do without being able to drill either into the crust or into the deep sediment um, and also with poor fluid um, work. And so if if the task, as I understood it, was what important questions do we have remaining or for the future that require ocean drilling, yeah. I think life has to be one of the top okay. three. But I think somebody who actually studies subsea floor life might want to speak instead of me. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, what a surprise. <laughs> Well, this is Steve Daunt, uh, URI. One of the things I do is study subsea floor life. And I, there was some confusion in our group about the phrasing of, what was the word? Yeah, we were, we were um, thinking about what is, you know, what is important, what is, what is a priority, but also what is urgent. Yeah. And, and so the, the thinking about the term urgent, because we know that has such ties to action quickly. Um, we wrestled with that and I'll turn it back to Steve in just a second, but we, I think that was why, um, so for room 114, we really tried to think about, we had the phrase subsea floor life as an unknown natural resource. So trying to, yeah. trying to find a, a crafty way to <laughs> um, in, connect to urgent, but that, that, that's um, a bit of a, a screen right and, and the reason i bring that up is i think that the use of that word urgent may have confused conversation in our group and it did in our group and it may have in other groups you know as as becky said the only way we can study subsea floor life uh through its full range is through scientific ocean drilling yeah and you know it's the largest unknown relatively unknown biome on the planet um we heard a lot about it from other scientists today. I, you know, I don't know that for the current director of NSF, it's urgent to understand the largest unknown biome on the planet. But you know, if you set aside that issue of political urgency, I think it's a really big target for IOD for scientific ocean drilling. Well, I was impressed with something that came up in your group about how it affects uh, ocean chemistry and how it, how it, the uh, water circulating through the, the rocks basically. Uh, affected in their chemistry when chemistry changing by subsurface life ends up affecting overall chemistry of the ocean too. Yeah, I mean, we we know in sediment that it's a primary that the life is a primary driver of of chemical exchange between the ocean and the subsurface. In the basement, it's a more open question. Right. There's a lot of redox activity in the basement. Microbes are almost certainly hitchhiking on it. The only question is to what extent do they drive it? Yeah, I'll say in our in our group, we actually also rolled in ecosystem response into habitability and life questions as our third bullet. So we we did we kind of sliced it slightly differently. I noticed other groups sliced it with the biogeochemical cycle side. So I feel like that is the third one, but the the nuance of how you write that is 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 important. Yeah. yeah. So, um, over here. Something I'd like to to add is one of the strengths that I've seen of of scientific ocean drilling is how it approaches complex problems through a systems um, framework. So, you know, here we're we're necessarily in in this work process trying to identify distinct science priorities. But the reality is these challenges, all of the all of the Earth system challenges, are very interconnected. And so, I think part of our challenge moving forward is to, to be able to identify you know, key areas, but also to um, um, 
really communicate well the interconnected nature of, of probably many priorities. You know, each of these, there are sub areas and they connect to each other. And for the uh, deep biosphere, yeah, th this to me, I, that is not my field. That, that is, to me, this is one of the, the top three priorities and it is part of an interconnected system. So it's also not my field, and I, I agree that just the fact that it's the largest biosphere on Earth, the largest unstudied biosphere on Earth, deserves to make it a priority. Um, if we are concerned about prioritizing things and giving the inter given the interconnected nature of all these different systems, something else that's come up a lot was uh, carbon sequestration yes. and understanding hydrothermal cycling and cycling in general in the oceans and the role of the biosphere in mediating that. If we don't even have a good handle of what the sub seafloor biosphere is, we don't understand how it can modulate carbon sequestration. And so maybe combining those two things into a third urgent priority is the way to go. Okay, I just want to like add on to this, because like Chris said, this is a huge, I agree, like microbiology is not my field, but as a micropaleontologist, it is incredibly important because it can also inform our plankton that we study. We just got over a major pandemic. I'll take that back. We're not over it yet. Even though the CDC says we're out of a pandemic, we're still in a pandemic, right? I've heard about viruses that my colleagues are studying in the subsea floor, all these other types of things. There is some biomedical innovation that could come from that as well. And I think that's incredibly important. And I would rank that as urgent because that has medical implications or biomedical implications. And that, again, thinking back to the panel that we had earlier, that links in with TIP's mission, right? And the NSF TIP mission about innovation, training early career researchers and getting them involved with this research. So I agree. There's a lot of other reasons why bio geo, or sorry, geo, um, microbio is incredibly important in this day and age. Okay, is there someone here? One, two, three. Yeah, so just to follow up, I think on what Chris had said and others have said, I will add to the, the bevy of voices that is not a microbiologist. Um, but one of the things that concerns me a little bit is if we have a list of things that are urgent priorities that are geohazards, climate change, and deep biosphere, we might as well dust off the 2013 science plan and hand it back to NSF. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an aspect of this that is important to think about highlighting the urgent components of this or the urgent elements. And so it may be that the framing of this and the way that Chris articulated it, maybe it's about carbon cycling or and can tie in CO2 sequestration or resources or some other um, pieces, but it still allows us to go after the deep biosphere is a, a way to, to frame this. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir, um, but it hasn't been said, so I, I thought I'd say it. Okay, go ahead. Um, following on to that, and also trying to bring in a, a little bit of the hard rock perspective. I guess one of the ways that we phrased the subsea floor stuff was the subsea floor ecosystem being an integral part of the system. And I do think that's a new framing. From the hard rock side, I think it's going to be really important as we go about this assessment of subsea floor life and exchanges, hydrologic exchanges, to be doing a good job of characterizing what the formation is or is not. And sometimes that's fracturing and deformation, sometimes it's the composition. But I think we're not going to get at the whole picture unless it's an integrated exchange approach um, where the subsea floor biosphere is integral. Go ahead. Okay, so my, my comment is perhaps a good follow up uh, to what you just heard. Um, in our group, the word urgent certainly steered our conversation, and um, I was pleased to see that some of the groups made reference just to the, to the bo quote, boring science. Um, I, I worry that we're forgetting that basic research is still really important, that basic research is what allows applied research to, to happen. In our group, our fourth priority that didn't make it onto the big three was the solid earth, and I have concerns that that community um, has not been has not been very vocal today. And maybe they have been on the chat and I, I didn't see it. But that is something that can only be accomplished through scientific ocean drilling, right? There's no other tool that can drill into the crust. Um, there's no other tool that can get back as, as you've heard, right? So deep in time and to study the whole cycle of plate tectonics.
Oh, yeah, I can't see that, but it, um, okay, sure. Anthony, uh, if you're online, go ahead. I may have missed him. Anthony Coppers, are you online? See him, yeah. Are you muted? <laughs> <clears throat> it looks like he's looking for uh, headphones or something. I may not. Uh... <laughs> Well, in the meantime, if, if it's a problem, is it a problem if you come back with these three themes and you know, they've been given before, but if you highlight the urgent aspects of it, as someone mentioned, does that help with that issue? You know, the, the um, subsea floor life, uh, climate change, and geological hazards has been in IODP science plans in the past. I mean, there's still a lot to look at, obviously, but if you highlight the urgency part of that, so, so is that... Um, um, how does that? Yeah, in other words, can we get around it? Get around the problems of, or the perceived problems of, of saying things that have been in science plans in the past. If you highlight the urgent parts of it, or is it not something to worry about? So we'll go with Steve, and then and then you, and then over here. Yeah, I want to respond to the point that these have been part of past science plans. I think with subsea floor life, we've made a, a really good um, start at understanding what's down there. And, and you know, that's mostly come to fruition actually in the last couple of years. But there's a huge difference between knowing what is somewhere and knowing how it operates and what it does and how it evolves. And, you know, I, I, I think we could make the same argument for paleoclimate. It's been part of scientific ocean drilling since before there was a DSDP, right? And But it's still a primary driver and there's still very, very important things to learn. I was just going to ask, I would love to hear from our NSF folks about this as well and their opinions. Jim, you don't feel obligated. You don't have to answer anything. So. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Speak. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, the question was open-ended enough that either I can answer it however I like, or you could refine it a little bit so I can try and answer a specific aspect. Well, I guess the concern is is if there was, um, and I, is it a concern? I mean, is if geological hazards, climate change, and and sub and the deeply buried biosphere, the subsurface life, were in highlighted in prior IODP science plans, is that really something to worry about? Since since clearly the emphasis on all three is going to be different now than it was ten years ago. Um. No, I mean that's that by itself isn't problematic, and that and I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't put it that way. Um, maybe because it's late in the day and uh, my filter is is worn a little. I'll I'll expand only slightly on the urgent matter. The, Jim, what you're pointing to is sort of refinement if you will of of the topics or let me let me put it slightly different i am choosing to hear you say that you are refining the message a little bit so well maybe maybe more than a little bit but maybe, maybe not refining maybe a told different aspect of it the, yeah i was being i was being broad okay, okay, but okay. but yeah so we're i think we're talking about the same thing okay. is is where i'm getting at um you know, one of the words that comes up that is, uh, I do understand how the word urgent is is challenging. I won't say that it's problematic necessarily, but it it's certainly challenging in the way that we think about we think about the science. Um, when I when you 
when you think about the message, so somebody's asked me, I've been asked, I've been in my current job for uh, one year and two weeks. Um, and I have been asked multiple times in multiple venues, what do I do? I am a messenger. That is what my job is. Um, there are two former division directors in this room. They, I'd be willing to bet they tell you the same thing. That That is our job. So on the list of people I talk to are people that don't understand our priorities the way we do. So part of the decadal survey is to help us message the priorities to groups that quite honestly don't, don't need to understand what we do, but want to understand what they do. And so the, the sort of shortcut is I talk to Hill staffers all the time. You know, I, I talk to more people, uh, for as many people I talk to in the scientific community, I talk to people not in the scientific community. And so those messages, your messages, think about your messages helping me help you. That's, so when we, when I talk about urgency, it has to be urgent to more than everybody in this room. And that's what I mean by that. And Jim, what you've done is presented a, an option for refine. Um, we're talking about the same thing, but refinement of a message in a way that it's easier for me to articulate. And I, I don't mean to make it all about me, but um, for better, for worse, I'm your messenger. <laughs> um, so that is what I'll, I'll stop talking now, <laughs> but, but that's what I need. And the reason we're here listening is we're listening for the messages. Um, so the short answer is, you got it, Jim. <laughs> Not sure what I have, but uh, okay. Let's well, see. Becky has been trying to say something for a right. while. And then after that, I, you... Anthony says he's ready. Oh, all Bluetooth, right. Okay. Yeah, his yeah. his Bluetooth. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. And I, I might have missed um, part of the discussion. But actually, um, I wanted to go back to what Kristen and Damien started to say, right? I had the same impression, right? When we look the priorities that are being brought forward almost look like singular science questions of the style of the you know the current or the pre or even the, the, the science plans before that and i think the one thing that it really stands out to me is that this community has been going through a whole evolution over the decades and how we're doing scientific ocean drilling and with the science framework we're standing at this new spot in that in the timeline where we're actually starting to connect way more disciplines it becomes truly transdisciplinary and we start looking at the earth system from an interconnected point of view and by now having that urgent thing in there and everybody say oh we have to do something now you know we all are falling back to our old habits and start to look go after single questions and just wanted to you know uh, second what damien and Kristen said that's a bit worrying i think we should keep that in our mind that Maybe we should look beyond beyond that and see if we can keep some of that interconnected thinking uh, in our in our you know prioritization here. Okay. <clears throat> you still want to say something, Becky? Or... No. Other other comments on this or questions? Yes. I agree. Kind of a note, I guess. There's urgent, as in needs to be addressed now, and there's poised for really immediate advance. And I think maybe having the second in mind might help us a little bit here. Yeah, that was actually going to be my point, which is there's urgent in terms of time scale. Uh, urgent in terms of time scale, and then there's urgent in terms of like. Uh, potential for like novel and revolutionary and transformative science. And I think that's where if we drop the biosphere, we might really lose out. So, yeah, I just. Any, uh, any last comments? Uh, and then I think... May I? Yeah. So I, I, I said this to there. the committee and I shared this with uh, our group too. I think uh, I, 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 and this is from from a book I read, but it's about the difference between urgent and and vital. 
as urgent is almost always driven by a deadline and vital is something that we cannot live without. Our planet can't live without, we can't live without, it's essential. And I think of this committee's work as focusing on those essential, vital questions, not urgent ones that are driven by a year-long priority, two-year-long priority, but something that is absolutely essential to the well-being of humans and, plan and, and our planet, quite honestly. Any, oh, yes, go ahead, Kristen. I really like the vital and urgent distinctions as well as um, how urgent can can be viewed in multiple ways, um, as was um, also added. I do think urgency has a place in communicating to the broader world about the value of scientific ocean drilling. Um, that, you know, as Jim was describing, that that's something that people can resonate that resonates with them. Um, but the other way that I think urgency plays a role in what we're thinking, and, and I guess my mind is starting to go to tomorrow, is the, J, the JR is, is, is not going to be here anymore. And what has to be prioritized early? Uh, you know, what are the, the most urgent things to try to get done with whatever the infrastructure is in the next five years or 10 years? versus what is still so incredibly important, but it could be if it has to be put into a, a different place in the queue um, for longer term, that, that this ties to infrastructure. You know, what is most urgent right, 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 right now, even if it's vital for also long-term. So I, I do see there's a time frame for action. Thank you. Okay. Uh I think Andrea has her hand up uh, virtually. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I just thought I'd add something that we talked about in our breakout group that really ties into this concern of like, are we repeating things from before, but also this urgency conversation is that we can make arguments about, you know, how studying climate in this way where we can get long-term and abrupt events and so forth can help us to answer some you know, pressing questions. What makes these things urgent is maybe seeing the immediate relevance to us as humans today, right? So how can we use these records to talk about like ocean health, right? Like heat waves and how that affects things. And like, we have these great records and we can take that and focus it on these kind of modern problems that we're living through and are going to get worse in the future. So that ocean health thing is one thing, or, you know, the hot topic right now, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, was, you know, how do um, extremes change in the context of a longer term changing climate, right? Looking at these extreme events in the context of these climate changes. That's something that everyone's talking about today. We have these records and, and we have the capacity to develop more of them to answer these pressing questions. So that maybe helps to put a new spin on, I don't know if urgency is the right word, but making it more immediately relevant to these emerging issues. Uh, Becky, then we'll go to Tuba. Just really quickly, um, I'm going to put on my hat as the chair of the U.S. Advisory Committee to for Scientific Ocean Drilling. Um, the The broader community needs to also sit down and have a discussion and um, about their science priorities about the U.S science priorities. And this is something that NSF has asked us to do and something that um, USAP with the help of USAC. So US is the UN, US Science Support Program. So it is the NSF funded office that supports um, the scientists who participate in scientific ocean drilling. Sorry to use jargon. Um, but has is so USAP will have a workshop for the broader community. And I think you know, we can define priorities here, but the like details in those priorities and what um, and and how we frame it can be fleshed out in a really comprehensive way in a different setting. I just I feel like this room is too small to do it here. And I don't mean the size. Can I can I just step in real quick? Because I come from a place that's earthquake prone, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And my thought is that when I showed those pictures of all of those proposals, 
still coming in for Cascadia, that is one place where we can apply the things that we've learned from Japan and from Hikarangi to Cascadia now to save lives, U.S. lives, potentially in Cascadia. And I don't know the specifics about all of those proposals, but I bet there's a lot of stuff that they're proposing that could be useful to, you know, essentially could save lives. And anyway, I was just going to point that out to me. My, there's no drilling that's going to help me in Southern California, but there's drilling that can help people in Washington and Oregon states. Sure. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, so long day. My head is full. My brain is hurting, but my heart is full too. Um, this is just a really incredibly dedicated, passionate group of folks, both in the room and online. And I really appreciate just how much I was able to learn. I think part of the most fun part of these national academies is that we get to learn, right? And that's great. Um, I will tell you a few things that I heard today that maybe were a little bit surprising to me as, you know, maybe somebody who was not a part of an integral part of this community. One, um, I feel like I heard a, a pretty strong sense, even though we never really said it explicitly, that the scientific ocean drilling community is sort of feeling like they're not being valued in the way that they should be valued um, or that the work isn't being valued in the way it should be valued. And, and correct me if this is completely off the mark, but part of me thinks, um, you know, does that have something to do with, um, you know, maybe we haven't made the case in the right way, right? Because, um, and here's where that's coming from. Well, you, many of you are, are uh, educators, so you teach in the classroom and so what I teach in the class, I explain something and a student looks at me totally bewildered, has no idea what I'm talking about. If I explain that thing the same exact way again, it usually does not help. Um, and so the, over the many years of teaching in the classroom, I have developed three ways of explaining almost everything, right? If the one way didn't work, then I'll do it through a different way. Then I'll, because, you know, people are motivated by different things, right? So, um, so that brings me back to a comment earlier about, you know, are we just going to restate the priorities that some other report had already stated? To me, maybe it's less about whether or not we're going to restate the priorities, and it's more about how we're going to justify those priorities, right? Because I really don't doubt that those previous reports did not really nail the issue. They probably did. But if, di if it didn't resonate, then that means we did not articulate, you know, because everyone makes sense to themselves. Right. This is one piece of advice that I was given that I have I use almost every day. Everyone makes sense to themselves. So if there are decision makers who are not necessarily going in the directions that we wish that they would, they make sense to themselves. So what is it that's driving them and how can we speak to whatever that motivator is? Right. Um, that also, Jim, what you just said, I really appreciated that you said that, that you are a messenger or a communicator, and that the really what we should do is to help you help us. And one way that we can do that is to frame the arguments and the justifications for whatever it is that we feel in our gut is the right priority. Um, and we really have to articulate that. And, and maybe one way to do that is, and, and Daniel, Daniel, you did such a good job today articulating, you know, ways in which this work um, has impact, real boots on the ground impact that that influence, you know, impacts human life. And, and, you know, we just heard about earthquakes and tsunamis in Pacific Northwest. I feel all of that in my gut too. So that's one thought. Um, the other thought I have is we talked a lot about the JR today. Um, and a little bit of that is in here, I'm learning too. I am learning what capabilities the JR had, um, has. Um, so I think one thing that I would love to do in our report is to be very transparent and open about if we are not supporting the JR, exactly what is it that we're leaving on the table, right? Um, I, I would like to have a very clear view of that. I personally don't yet. Uh, many of you might, but I, I would like to be able to communicate that. And um, and I mean this in this context. So in my mind, right, I mean, prioritization science 
uh, priorities. It's really all about, we have a whole bunch of cards at the bottom of a hill. And I've used this analogy a lot at OSU. So those of you who are from OSU have heard me talk about this before, but so we've got 30, 20 cards at the bottom of a hill and they all need to get up the hill. They're all really important, right? But we don't have enough muscle power. We can't get them all up the hill in these 10 years, right? This is a decadal study. So I challenge us to figure out which carts we are going to be taking up the hill. But that also means that we're very cognizant about which carts we're leaving behind. So in that context, the JR, you know, if we're not supporting the JR, we should be very aware and cognizant about what carts we're leaving behind because of that decision. It should be a conscious thing, right? We should all be aware. So that's another thing that I, I really would love to at the end of the day tomorrow, once we talk about new possibilities and potential new technologies, you know, what can we sort of figure out how to cover and, and what is left uncovered? Um, and, and, you know, you, you saw maps and maybe that's one way to communicate that. But um, I feel like there's, there's, there's nuances there that I have not yet um, uh, absorbed enough. Um, so those are my thoughts. I feel like we, we had a lot of raw conversations today, but we also had a lot of creative conversations, right? And I love, I don't know, I've been doing this for years, but why am I always surprised when breakout groups come back and there's total overlap and synergy? And to me, that, that, that makes me happy every time and that there's certainly a lot of that here today. And so that's great to see. Um, so as far as the rest of the day and tomorrow is concerned, it's been a really long day, right? But I think we get to have some food um, and interact with each other a little bit. But then after that, I think right around 6.30, we're going to ask the committee to um, say goodbye to all of our friends and colleagues here and, and convene as a committee. And I know you all are tired and that's going to be really hard to do. Um, but we still will ask you to do so just so we can we can debrief in a closed session and, and sort of get our bearings as to what we want tomorrow to look like. Because again, this is a lot of time invested by a lot of very busy people. So we want to make sure we use everyone's time as effectively as possible. Uh, and then finally, I want to close by thanking those of you who are online. Um, there's still 79 of you. Your dedication is just really remarkable. Um, it just goes to show how much, how important this is for the careers and livelihoods and passions of so many of you. Um, and we hope that you will be able to join us again tomorrow.